Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. All peoples have their separate legends, their superstitions, and their fears. Julius Caesar once said that all Gaul is divided into three parts. But whatever the political alignments, the Gallic people shared their legends in common, and none more persistent and accepted than the belief in the second sight. Usually called a gift, but one wonders if perhaps it is far more the reverse of that. Our mystery drama, The Unearthly Gift, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Betsy Palmer. begin with two definitions of second sight. The unearthly capacity to see things impossible for ordinary people to see, or the ability to foretell events in the future from the shadows they cast before them. A talent bequeathed to a large, raw-boned, and rather plain girl called Ruth Ann Mitchell. She and her grandmother, Bridget Carney, are the only women at a lumber camp high in the Bitterfoot Range, which sprawls across Idaho, Washington, and half of British Columbia. Ruth and Granny cook and keep house for the lumberjacks. And what can I say, Mamsel? And Granny, we feel very bad, especially Big Red. He was up there with Jason. I told him a hundred times to use a double rig, but he never wanted to listen. Where, uh, where is Jason? Oh, he is in the wagon, Miss Ruth. I will have to take him down the mountain to Rockfall and the main office. Well, I want to see him. Ah, no, I think that is not a good thing. He fell five, six hundred feet into that I, ravine. I, I want to see him. Let her, if she wants. Now, you'll hurry back. Mm. Into just, just as soon as I'm sure Jason gets a burial be fitting him. You've, uh, you've got room to take me, Frenchie. Ah, mais oui. If you are sure you must. Uh... It's what I owe him. Not enough, but all I can do. Oh, Granny. If I knew, why couldn't I have stopped it? How can you hold back the hand of God, child? <laughs> This is one bad road. You want me to drive, Benchy? You, a woman. Well, I know it like the back of my hand. My daddy was a straw boss at Greenwood Camps, and from the time I was 11, I, I grew up there. And your father, when did he die? Oh, in the, uh, the big fire. When the south slope burned up. And your mother? She died having me. So you stay on with Granny. She is your only family. Yes. <laughs> All I have to love. And the Jason, too, you lost. Mm. Oh, Jason. Jason was... was kind to me. Uh, why do you stay at the lonely camp like Greenwood with a bunch of roughneck like us? <laughs> where else would I go? To the city, you know, where perhaps you find a nice young man who... Me? <laughs> A plain, awkward country gal who stands head high or higher than most men and knows nothing but to just cook and to do the chores. Uh, Jason did not think you were so, so plain. What did you mean about Jason when you said you, you might have stopped it? Well, I, I, uh, I, I, I had sort of a dream. I mean, hours before you came back to camp. Just, well, just when it might have happened. I, I, I thought, Frenchie, that I, I saw the whole thing just the way it happened. Uh, my family was from Bretagne in France. Uh, we are also like the Irish, what you say, gaily. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there also is Le Vue de l'Ombre. What you say, the, 
the second sight. That is a, a gift you have. I, um, I, I, I don't know, Frenchie. I just don't rightly know. I, I don't suppose I really ever want to know. Pardon me, ma'am. Um, uh, you Miss Mitchell? Yes, I am. I'm Tim Farrell, new jack for Greenwoods. Told me down at the office I'd be riding up the mountain with you. Well, that's right, Mr. Farrell. They're just uh, gassing up the old Jeep. Have you got, uh, got your gear ready? Most of it. Uh, what you see on me? My duffel bag and axe are right there by the pumps. Well, then I guess we're ready to go. <laughs> Except first, I guess I should say howdy. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't used to shaking hands with a lady, but put it there. I'm, uh... How about making it Tim? I ain't used to Mr. Oh, uh, yeah, well, my name's Ruthann. <laughs> All right, Ruthann. Do we travel? Best we do. It's a rough trail, and I, I really prefer going it while, while it's still light. This old Jeep handles real nice. But you were right about the trail. <laughs> Maybe I should have let you drive. Well... I knew you figured I shouldn't. It's kind of nice to be a woman and just to sit down. Besides, uh, you handle the jeep real good. So, hmm? You couldn't be Irish. <laughs> Some <laughs> generations back, mostly. Though I'm just a roving lumberjack. Born in Montana, never been out of seven northwestern states in the good old U.S. of A. Uh -huh. I don't figure you for all of that Irish either. Well, not so much on my father's side. But all the way down in my mother's. Oh, wait till you meet her mother. Granny Bridget. She cooks chow for all you jacks. Good chow? Best you've ever tasted. And I'm <laughs> in love with her already. Now, what do you do? Well, I help her. Well, now, there's something to consider. If Granny comes through as strong as you promise, I may be half in love with you already without knowing. Ah. <laughs> Now, that Tim Farrell you brought back here three weeks ago. Ah, he's a charmer, he is. I think so, too. <laughs> but, um... But what, dear? Well, I, I... I don't know how to talk about it, Granny. You'll see something in his future. I, 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 I don't want to talk about it yet. Yet? It, 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 it just doesn't come clear. I... It's a full moon tonight. I reckon I'm just going to walk myself some more before I uh, go to bed. Is it Tim you're going to meet? It's no one at all but my own thoughts. Or maybe just to be alone and remember Jason. Don't wait up for me, Granny. I'll not close an eye till I know you're back home safe and sound. <laughs> Pretty moon, uh, ain't it, Ruth? I, I, I suppose, Big Red. I kind of hope you figure like I do that it ain't hung up there for nothing. But, uh, don't look to me. I, I, I'm not your woman. Not now or ever could be. You'd still shut me off even with Jason gone? Or with Jason here. So you, you and me have nothing for each other. And don't you make no move to me. Even with Jason not here to stand between us. <laughs> Big as you are, you think you could hold me off if I really had a mind to? Okay, I, I hope I don't have to try. I don't guess you'll have to, Ruth Ann, as long as there are three of us. Who asked you here, Tenderfoot? Put out. If I'm not wanted, Ruth Ann? Let, let's just not make no fuss, all right? I'm on my way back to bed anyways. Good night. Why don't you mind your own business, Farrell? I was about to ask you the same question. I'm warning you. You're new on this crew. Don't ask for any trouble. I don't. Just the same, don't push any on me, brother. And lay off of Ruth Ann. She don't like you no more than I do. Yeah. 
Now she comes down to work. So bad, eh? That's even. No sight more beautiful. No sound nearer the heart. Hey, would you stop stripping your big rat on me? We cut out the next big tumble, huh? Okay. Yeah. Hand me the big kettle. There's a love, Ruth. Uh, Ruth? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, Granny. I, w- I was thinking of Tim Farrell. <laughs> oh. I thought maybe that walk under the moon last night might not be all by yourself. <laughs> did you meet him then? Yeah. Good, I did, too. Big Red was pestering me again, just like before Jason died. You tell him... He, as much as lays a finger on you, and I'll put broken glass in his grip. (laughs) Now, don't you let that blowhard bother you. Well, it's not him that I'm worried about, Granny. It's Tim. Why? I'm I'm trying to fight it. But I see it. There's death. The shadow of death over Tim's shoulder. And, And I'm somehow in the shadow, too. Oh, Granny, why do I have to see it? And, and then still know that I can't stop oh, it. Oh, now, Mavornin. Don't wreck your heart with what can't be changed. I told you before, Granny. I won't sit by if... What is it, Colleen? What are you staring at? I see him now. They've topped a tree. And Tim's stripping it. He's all alone in a... No! No! I've got to stop it. I've got to stop it. Dear Mary in heaven, watch over my lamb, whatever the Lord has marked her for. In silent supplication, an old woman prays for the one person she has left to love. A tortured girl with a terrible and unasked gift. What has that inner eye revealed to Ruth Ann as she races up the lumber trail to try to stop whatever threatens Tim Farrell? At the stand of trees, the lumberjack crew is thinning out. Frenchie and Chuck Turkle are on the big crosscut, finishing the high cut, while Big Red, having finished the notch, is now driving the wedges. Down the mountain, Tim is methodically stripping the branches from the top tree, his back towards them. This is the picture Ruth Ann saw in her mind's eye, sees now in actuality as she struggles breathlessly up the slope. Tim! Ruth Ann. What is it? Run from the tree. I'm not in its path. Look back. Look back. What? Ruth. Ruth. Run to the side. Run to the side. I'm the front line. Oh, I sure would never want one closer than that. You are right, Ruthann. You covered me with your body. Well, you risked your life to try to save me. Well, I can't figure why we're not playing Paul. Oh. That tree was headed straight for where I was standing. What made it turn aside just far enough to miss us? The hand of God. Miss Alden, Tim. Oh, you are down. No, it's, it's all right, Frenchie. I don't know what happened. Wall path was set for 45 degrees off your line. Ah, uh, that, that no good tree. Sure you ain't neither of you hurt. I, uh, oh, took a pretty good lick across the back from one of the branches. Uh, no, no, don't don't move, Tim. No, I, I can't keep lying on you. I know Miss Ruth is right. Charlie has gone for this stretcher crew. Don't move till they are here. Yeah, but I, I can't keep I, lying. I don't on. mind, Tim. I don't want you to move. You listen to a woman when she talk. If there is something and your back is broke, yes. you move. You risk your life. Why take a shot? Well, I was a par 
powerful good bowl of soup, Ruthann. I'm glad you liked it. Here, I'll let me take the tray. How's your back today? Oh, starvel. Now I know that there ain't nothing broke, I feel I'd better be getting back on my feet and... No, sir. You just stay right where you are till the doctor says that you can rise. Ruthann, tell me something. Hmm? I can. Where were you going when you come up the mountain that day? Why do you ask? I don't know. I had the feeling. I mean, I hadn't even yelled timber before you seemed to know that that was a maverick tree and it wouldn't fell right. Well, maybe it was just... just intuition. I, I was born and bred in tree country and around camps, and I, but I, I've got to get back down. Granny needs my help. Ruthann? Yeah. I want to thank you for saving my life. Well, if I had anything to do with it, I'm glad. Maybe someday I can find a way to make up for it. So it's taken you are with our boy Eat upstairs, Tim. Mm. Well, he saved my life. I thought it was t'other way around. I mean... But the branch he took across the shoulders would have... It would have caught me right across my neck, Granny, and snapped it like a chicken. He's a good lad. Are you in love with him? Ah. Oh, Tim's not for me, Granny. Or any man. Oh, now, Makushla. What makes you say the like of that? You know, Granny. I don't want the gift, but I can't escape it. It's... Oh, it's like a lead weight around my neck. Or around my heart. Did my mother have it, Kathleen? Yes, she did. And did she know about about my father? Not before she married him, or she would never have married him. It never comes till we're well out of our teens. But Granny, did she know that that he was to die so young? She knew. And about herself, she knew that too. And knowing that I would kill her in childbirth, she she still went ahead and had me. Now, there's always the chance the good Lord will change his mind. Look at you and Tim. Only he hasn't. What? Granny, I wish I could see it clearer. I stopped it once, but I, I, I don't know if I ever could again. Tim wears the shadow of violent death like like a collar. And and somehow I'm the one who's hanging it there. Oh, Granny. Granny, I I don't know what to do. Hey, Tim. Hi, Jack. How's it going? <laughs> well, I reckon I'm about ready to come back and pull my weight. I'm getting tired of just Chopping firewood. Yeah, it's putting you back in shape, though. I hope. You sure are one lucky tree, Jack. When that big old tree kicked around and started to fall out of line, you was dead at its tracks. And then we seen Ruthann throw up her hands and fight dad if we both couldn't swear on a stack of Bibles, that old tree didn't just veer off to the left, so she just missed you. I guess the wind caught her. It must have been... Though I don't rightly remember any wind that day. Chuck, I want to ask you if you remember something else about that day. Well, sure, ask you away. You and Frenchy were making the saw cut. But Big Red cut the notch and he was setting the wedges. Right? Oh, yeah. And that tree was lined up to fall due south? Yes, sir, Tim. That was the line. And you know I was working away on the east. Forty-five degrees pretty near out of the fall line. Well, yes, you were for sure, Tim. Then how come she turned so out of line? Well, now, sometimes you'll get a tree that has a real tough core or twister on you. You or Frenchie ever had that happen to you before? Well, no. Not as you'd say, but I'm here to tell about the red. Well, you... You'd have to ask him. Doesn't he go around bragging he can fell a tree on a dime and he ain't never missed? Well, I have heard him say to Andrew. Yeah. 
Well, maybe I just will go ask him. Look here, Tim. You better watch your step. You get him riled up. Big Red is bad medicine. Hold it just a minute before you go inside, Chuck. Oh, hi, Big Red. It was you and Tim Farrell getting your heads so close together over up there by the woodpile. Oh, we was, we was just, uh, Channing. <laughs> I seen he was asking you a powerful lot of questions. I'd like to know them questions. And your answers. Oh, oh, Big Red, you, you, you don't like to break my arm. I might just do that if you don't lose my Well, I, I don't want to make no trouble. Any trouble I'll handle. You talk. Don't leave nothing else. I want every word. Now, don't take on so, girl. You're in love with a boy. It's that, isn't it? Yes, Granny. I am in love with Tim. But that's only a little part of it. Now, don't be too sure. Is he in love with you? Oh, Granny, how could he be? I'm a plane. He won't go through that go-round again. Granny, I'm trapped. First of all, I have the vision that all I bring Tim is danger. And second, well, if I want him to love me, how can I be sure that I'm not using the power to make him? I bought you some fresh wood for the stove. Hey, hey um, uh, did I, uh, <laughs> did I break in on something? Sure not at all, Tim. How are you feeling now? Oh, I guess I'm about back to where I was, thanks to Ruth Ann. <laughs> You'll excuse me, Granny Bridget and Ruth Ann. But I got a little business here, can't we? You get yourself out of my kitchen, Red Pilly, and all your riffraff with you. Not till something gets straightened out. Well, speak up and go. I'm talking to you, Farrell. And this time you ain't hiding behind any skirts. Chuck Turkle here tells me you're bad-mouthing me. Trying to say I dropped a tree across your back. I hadn't faced you with it yet. I wanted to get some more proof. But so long as you fetch the issue, that's what I have in mind. Glad you leave it on the table. Now, Ed, why you do this? Why you try to... Oh, Frenchy. I'll handle this. Mr. Farrell, I'm calling you out. Pick your weapon. Knives, axes, PV poles, or just bare hands. You and me's got a claim to settle. A claim? Well, let's just call it a plane falling out. Don't pay him any heed. You kid. keep out of this, Ruth Ann. Indeed I won't. You're all like a bunch of children, except that you're playing with lies. Ruth Ann... And... Maybe I want to be caught out. I'll stand no nonsense like this in my kitchen. Near under 50 years I've served this camp. And I've never tolerated brawling in my kitchen. So you'll all take yourselves out of here before I... Hey, uh, Granny. I'm out of here. No, back you old kids. Give us some air. Oh. Ruth, Ruth Ann, is it, is it her heart? I, 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 I don't know. I've never seen Granny sick before. Frenchy, we wish you to go bring the wagon. We're taking her to town and the nearest doctor. Now you speak words. I bring the wagon to the door. <sighs> Granny, it's uh, it's nothing. It's uh, it's just a little, it's a little fainting spell. Oh, Tom, <laughs> maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm getting too old for so much excitement. Where's uh, where's where's Ruth? Oh, I'm right here beside oh. you. Put your arms around me, Makushla. All right, now the rest of you stand back. Don't crowd. Move, 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 move. I'm still crowding you, Farrell. Not now, Big Red. There's a time for everything. Yours and mine will come. Name it. When I take Ruth Ann and Granny Carney down the mountain and make sure Granny has proper care, I'll be back. With Ruth Ann? That's up to her. If I had my if way... you're coming back, Tim, I'm coming too. Why? There are 45 lumberjacks that still got to be fed till other arrangements are made. Granny will insist on that, and then... Uh, then what? Whatever's got to be unwound among us, it's going to take the three of us to do it. <laughs> 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 
How much does Ruth's second sight now see of the future? How much can she affect it? And how? Is the shadow of what's to come going to engulf her? Or can it be dispersed and blown away? Is the unearthly gift something that can prevail against earthly circumstance? Rock Falls boasts a livery stable, three assorted garages, a choice of hotels, no hospital but a small clinic with four beds and a first-rate, if overburdened, general practitioner. It couldn't have mattered less. The most efficient and highly staffed hospital would not have saved Bridget's tired heart. Like a stout old watch, the bearings were worn, the mainspring slackened. Are you there? Who then? I'm here, Granny. I'm, uh, I'm going away, you know. Oh, no. Yes, I, I can see it in your eyes, my morning. You know. Promise me something. What? You won't go back to that camp. Granny, who's to cook for all the men? Then find another. There ought to be something better in life for you. I I don't know what it should be. You're telling me that you and Tim... Granny, Granny, me and Tim are a dream of yours. Because you want only the, the best for me. But even if it could be, you know what lies between us. The gift. Or by another name. Curse. Where is he now? He's gone back to camp. And you let him go. How could I stop him? And I... I was needed here no longer. Now go and follow him. And leave you here. My time is used up. Come close. Granny... I'm never very far away from you. Soon. Soon you will be. Let me say this while I can. Some of us are the lucky ones. I was. How? I had the gift as well. Little I wanted it. It was clearer than yours. So I knew just exactly what to expect. I knew your grandfather, like your mother's poor husband, would have gone from me early. Granny, forgive me, child. I was just looking down the long corridor of time that I've left behind. Where was I? It doesn't matter, Granny. Oh, yes, just yes. Yes, yes, twas this. About the gift. It came to me late and left me early. I can wish you only the same. The earlier, the better. You mean suddenly the second sight stopped? It it wasn't there. That's what I mean. If I still had it, wouldn't I be able to read better for what you're to do? How can you know if it's gone? It's like love. When love comes, you can't mistake it if it's for real. And when the gift goes, you'll know it. Just as sure. I love you, Ruth Ann. My love shall make you free. Granny? Oh, Granny. What will I ever do without you? Come, Sammy. By the old logging hole, this contest is to the finish. The selection of both contestants, there is no weapon but the human arm. First, I ask each if they must fight. Big Red, 
No man's going to make the kind of charges Tim Farrell's been making about me behind my back. And Tim, Red Pelly rules this camp and all of you by fear. It's time someone challenged him. I'm doing that. So you will come on set the bed. Now you're both ready. Let's get on with it. Tim. You heard the man. Let's get it over with. Thank you. What's going on? Uh, Miss Holmes, where you come from? The doctor drove me back. Stop it. Stop it. No, no, no. He's a lot of custom. You, me, no one can stop it till one man is out cold. He's too big and strong for Tim. It's what I try to save is Ruth, but your Tim Field, he must fight. Oh, if you won't stop it, I will. Oh. Because I will it. Like this. Okay, Tenderfoot. Now I'm going to stop the living hell out of you. I'm not asking no mercy. Come on, Just try to stop me. Just what? Here's one last go. Fire lock. <clears throat> what the... Are, 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 are you going to get up? I... I can't. He, you quit? I... Give up. <laughs> Well, just just what? take it easy. What? You're all right. Uh, Ruth? Yes? Boy, it seems like... seems like I've been here before. Now that Granny's gone and... and you're okay, I... I'm going away. Well, if that's what you want, you, you've got your own life to live. My own life. I ain't got the right to say it, but I... I was sort of hoping that we, we'd be sharing it. But I got nothing to offer a woman yet. We're just not for each other, Tim. Don't you know? I'm a shadow over you. That it's through me that you're risking your life. It appears to me it's through you it keeps getting saved. Twice. The legend is the third time round fate has to take its course. There's another crook here now and I'm not needed. Forget me, Tim. Please, just forget me. Look, oh, uh, sorry, Miss Excuse Miss Rosie. Hey, how you feel, Chomp? Huh? <laughs> I feel like I got run over by a bulldozer. Yeah, Little man. Something else won't, huh? In the inside. Why did you make Miss Ruth cry? It's kind of the other way around, Frenchie. I guess I took a wrong notion. I wanted to marry that girl. But she does not want to marry you. That's right. Did she say why? I don't know. She got some kind of crazy notion. She's a hex for me. Ah, uh, if she say that, then it is one big sham. She must be bad medicine for you. She knows. How? She has le don, the gift. She can read the future. Oh, come on. It is true. How do you think that big tree missed you that day? And how you make Big Red cry, Uncle. Well, heck with superstition, that's no real problem. What is a problem is that a man needs money to marry. And what do I have to offer? What? Big Red. Yeah, I was just dragging what was left of me in here to say you whipped me fair and square and the best man won. You say you're leaving? I'll be on my way by tonight. Frenchie. What was that I heard him saying about he wanted to get hold of some money? Uh, the poor devil. He wanted to get married, but he has no stake. Yet. So he wants money real bad, huh? Hey, hey Big Red. What are you doing so far from camp? Oh, just stealing me a little breather, Chuck, and having a stroll. Heps in your axe in your hand. <laughs> This here axe ain't mine. Belongs to Tim Farrell. <laughs> what you doing with it? I got a use for it. Well, I wouldn't figure him to lend you anything of his. He didn't. He might get sore and take a notion to whoop up on you again when he finds out. <laughs> uh, he's uh, too busy packing up to leave camp. Leave? Yeah. Him and Ruth Ann. As soon as you get back with the jeep. 
Reckon they think they're going to get spliced. Well, how about that? Give me a lift back to camp. Oh, well, sure, sure. Hop in. Got to pay money? Yes, right behind us in the sack. All done up in them neat little envelopes, huh? Just like you, you. It'd be a lot of money to steal. And there sure wouldn't be much doubt if a fella got caught quick enough just where it came from. Huh? What you talking about? Just keep on driving, Chuck. Only you take the road to the flume at the fork. I got some plans for you. What? What are you doing with my gear, Rat? Well, why, uh, I was just going to carry it out to the Jeep for you. I'll handle it myself. What's the Jeep doing outside there? Where's Chuck? I reckon he took the payroll over to the straw boss. You drawing yours? No. And we'll ride over there and pick it up before I drive you and Ruth Ann down to town. She's coming with us? As if you didn't know. There's something funny going on. This isn't the way to the straw bosses, huh? Look out and back here. What? Hey. Oh. It sure ain't, Mr. Loverboy. The road you're going this time, I'm sure you ain't coming back. I wonder why Chuck's so late getting back. I'd like to get down the mountain before dark. He should have been here at least one hour ago. I suppose Tim is going to leave with us. Oh, we have not much transport, Miss Ruth. Why don't you take a chance and stay with him? You don't understand, Frenchie. I do, but sometimes... Le bon Dieu is kind. And I think that Grandmère Brigitte would have wanted... Wait. Wait a minute, Frenchie. What is it? Oh. I see it now. I see it. Red. He has the payroll in Tim's duffel. He has Tim knocked out and tied up by the fork on the way down the mountain. And... Chuck is trussed up just below the big room where it spills into the catch basin. He'll drive Tim unconscious into the ravine and send Chuck to die, ground up in the logs in the catch basin. It'll look as if Tim killed him for the hero. Sacrabia, he must die. Frenchy, go get the rest of the jacks and, and save Tim, Frenchy. I'll go get Chuck free. <laughs> You, you, you crazy Red Like a fox, Chuck Ain't no woman gonna make a sucker out of Red Pelly She turned me down for chasing Well, I took care of him Climb Climb? Up to the sluice? Why? I'm sorry, Chuck But I gotta set this up Just right well, What are you gonna do with Tim? Tim's axe I'm gonna bury it right in your skull, Chuck So nobody has any doubts as to who Oh, can... no, no, you're not, Red Who's that? How'd you get up here? <laughs> Many's the time as a kid when the logs weren't running I've shooted down the flume From the camp right to this station Oh, I I knew I had to move fast to stop you You can't, it's too late I've burned all my bridges behind me Now, worst of all It's got to be you, too No, but you can't touch me, Red I have the gift. The gift? I turned the tree aside to save Tim. And I held you back from stomping him. All with the help of God. And now, I'm going to stop you again. Run, Chuck. Run. No, but, but you... no, he can't touch me. I'm sorry it has to be this way, Ruth Ann. From the beginning, when you first come, you were all I wanted. But you turned me down. What? What are you doing? I'm going to open a sluice gate. There's 600,000 board feet of logs already on the way down. And we're going with the first that comes. If I can't have you, no one else can. Hey, you hear me? I hear you. You touch Ruth and I'll kill you. Ain't none of the three of us going to stay alive. Come on up. You put down that axe, Not till I take your foot. Oh, Ruth, damn it. Damn it, Ruth, you. I've got a squeeze. Damn you, I'll switch your skull. Watch him. He has your axe. Hang on, hey. Ruth. I've got a peaty pole. All right, Red. You want to give up? Oh, they won't do it. We have two men. Get over the platform, Frenchie. We need Ruth. Hey, damn it. Oh, yes. Let go of the PVT. Ah! He's got you with him. A log's carried him right.
right down the flume and over and into the cash basin. He was ground to pieces. I'm sure glad you're safe, Annie. Are you still going? Well, Red is dead, but nothing between us has changed. One big thing has. What? When I thought I had the power to stop Red, I found I didn't, Tim. I just had to rely on myself and hang on to the axe that he was trying to swing down on you. Are, are you are you telling me? Mm-hmm. The gift's gone. I don't have to be afraid anymore. It's a new life. It sure is. I. What? What did you call me back then? Annie. That's a new name for a new life. And the one that's going to be my wife's. Come on, Annie Farrell. Kiss me. If you like the name. <laughs> Anything you want to give me is just exactly what I like. <laughs> Think of all the gifts you personally may have lost in your time and how much you mourn them. Then think of the dread, oppressive gift that Ruth Ann lost and celebrate it with her. Sometimes I do have stories to tell you that end with that fond, childish phrase, and so they lived happily ever after. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about it, But of all the creatures in the animal kingdom, only man, and man alone, will murder his mate simply because she no longer pleases him. True, certain of our friends in fur, fin, or feather will indulge in desertion or even divorce. But murder? For that, you must have the highest degree of culture and civilization. For that, you have to be human. I... I must know what I can do, Dr. Turk to keep myself from killing my wife. Why do you want to kill her? I don't want to kill her. Well, then, what makes you think you're going to? I've I've been told I'm going to do it. I hope. I've been told unmistakably and in no uncertain terms, and that's what scares me. But who told you? Pluto. Who's Pluto? A cat. A cat told you? Yes. My wife's cat. Our mystery drama, The Black Cat, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Can you really tell the future by reading my palm, Madame Xanadu? Have faith, and let me have your left hand. Ah, yes, I see very clearly. What do you see, Madame Xanadu? Tell me what you see. You will meet a tall, good-looking man. I will? Yes, a tall, good-looking man who will make you very happy. Oh! He is from the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service? Yes. And he has many, many free publications for you, ranging from business expenses and child care to sick pay and retirement income. 
One of those publications may solve your tax problem and make you very happy. Oh, for heaven's sake. Here, what do you see in my other palm? It says here you can get any of those three publications at your IRS district office. You know, when tax time rolls around, I need help. That's why I was really glad to hear about CIT's income tax service. It's beautiful. For just a $5 minimum charge, they take care of all the headaches connected with taxes. CIT's tax service is fast, computerized, and accurate. And they'll figure out your biggest tax savings under the law. Not only that, if you need cash, you can check out a CIT Uniloan at the same time. CIT's income tax service. Why not go see them today? Cause whenever you need money, come in on the telephone. Ask the man at CIT for a union CIT makes money happen. It takes care of your taxes, too. Consider the act of murder. Popular opinion has it the majority of killers are ruthless, cold-blooded, devoid of pity. But the facts tell a different tale. Statistics reveal most murderers are neither brutal nor savage. The record shows you don't have to be a devil or a demon or even a criminal. Experience teaches a killer could be any one of us. Given the time, the place, the provocation, it could be you. It could be I. And it could even be Philip Sterling. Oh, Sylvia says you want to see me, Mr. Fenris. Mm, that's right, Phil. Well? I have a simple statement to make. A brief 13-word announcement. I had no idea you measured out your words. Ah, oh, they should add up to 13. It happens to be an unlucky statement as far as you're concerned. I suppose you end the suspense, Mr. Fenris. What is this historic pronouncement, hmm? If you marry my daughter, I will cut her off without a cent. Uh, yes, it, uh, it does add up to 13 words. And you'd better believe me. Well, then I have no choice. I'll break the engagement. I certainly can't marry Sylvia if she has no money. Why, you unprincipled scoundrel, oh, Mr. You... Fenris, while I may be a scoundrel, I do have principles. You admit you want to marry Sylvia for her money? What other reason could I possibly have? Well, of all the un... Uh, don't sputter at me, <sighs> Mr. Fenris. After all, it's your fault. What, my fault? Without question. Had you been a better father, more loving, more attentive, you would have raised a more attractive daughter. Well, I'll have you thrown out of here. Consider Sylvia calmly, objectively. She's immature. She's naive. She's hopelessly romantic. She's careless. Uh, that's my word. Others would say sloppy about her weight, about her appearance. It's your fault. Your fault. All of it. How have you know I gave my daughter everything? You gave her only what money could buy. And in addition to everything else, she has that, that damn black cat, that Pluto. And she pretends she can talk with it. But, uh, but she's, she's kind. She's gentle. Of course. Otherwise, she'd be unbearable. Why am I even discussing this? Get out of here. Face the facts. You're 75 years old. 70. How much longer can you live? 10, 15 years? With Sylvia. She'll still be under 40. And the money, all of it hers to squander as she sees fit. And you know she'll be the natural target of every sharpshooting fortune hunter. I told you to get out. You say that one more time and I will. I'll be practical, Mr. Fenris. I'm the best hope you've got. Because all I want to do with her money... Uh, your money, is enjoy it. I'm not burning to build empires. I only want to live comfortably. And on your money, I can. And, uh, well, I even happen to like Sylvia. Just enough to put up with her. I... I think you must be the devil himself. <laughs> well, better the devil you know than the devil you might get. Oh, it's ironic, isn't it? <laughs> Two minutes ago, you were scared stiff I'd marry Sylvia. Now you're absolutely petrified I won't. Daddy, oh, please, Pluto and I simply couldn't wait any longer. Daddy, you do approve of Phil. You do, don't you? Uh, Sylvia, I have a four-word statement to make. Bless you, my children. <laughs> Oh, 
pay. Who, who set that thing? Good morning, Phil, darling. I did. You did? What for? We have to be up and about. Oh. At a quarter to six in the morning? Well, I intend to make your breakfast. I never eat breakfast. Uh, well, you should. You should. Gets the day off to a glorious start. Well, it's not as if I'll be swinging a pick and shovel. Well, <laughs> maybe you should. Oh, Pluto's up. Would you get out of bed, Phil, darling, and let him in? Yes, dear. Oh, isn't he just the sweetest thing in the world? Yes, he sure is. Now, what were we talking about? Uh, picks and shovels and hearty breakfasts. A combination guaranteed to make me ill. Phil, you don't know a thing about the construction business. I never claimed I did. I was honest with your father. But then why did you accept a job with a plush office and a secretary? Because I honestly intend to learn the business. Then that's why you should walk into Daddy's office and say, Sir... The only way to learn this business is from the ground up. Well, uh, I... Well, you know I'm right. And besides, Pluto thinks it's a splendid idea. Pluto thinks... Oh, of course he does, don't you, Pluto? Matter of fact, Pluto and I discussed it last night. Uh, Sylvia... Why can't you believe Pluto and I talk together? Because to talk means to exchange words, and Pluto cannot... Oh, no, no, dear. To talk together means to exchange thoughts. And that's what we do, Pluto and I. How? Well, you look Pluto in the eye, and then you beam your thoughts at him, and he just beams his thoughts back at you. That's talking, that's communicating, isn't it? Um, well, well... I looked into Pluto's eyes, and he looked into mine, and he just beamed that idea about the way you could learn Dad's business right into my head. So, don't you see... You have Pluto to thank for it. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Pluto. All my life, I hated work. Put in an August day on a road-building crew under a relentless sun that beats down. The heat shimmers off that concrete at about 115 degrees. And you will know what punishment is. massage will ease those aches. No, no, nothing. Nothing will ever relieve these pains. Pluto says you'll get used to it. Yeah, well, you just tell Pluto for me that I will never get used to but it. you will. Let Pluto tell you himself. Will you tell him, Pluto, dear? Oh, come on, Sylvia. You say that you won't get used to that kind of work. You just beam that thought into Pluto's eyes. Sylvia, my, my back hurts. I'm in no he mood for... will give you inspiration and courage. You just look into Pluto's eyes. Come on, Pluto. Yep, up on the bed, Jim. That's it. Now, look into Phil's eyes. Don't you feel Pluto's thoughts coming into your mind? I don't know what color a cat's eye is supposed to be. But suddenly, I was staring into a kaleidoscope of brilliant hues. Flaming reds, freezing greens, burning yellows, icy blues. All of them shifting, twisting, trying to form into shapes. And there was this terribly taut feeling of tension, as if the entire kaleidoscope were trying to, to dissolve into a scene. And finally, the way a bubble bursts, all the colors blended into that... That one icy blue, that icy blue became two of the coldest, frostiest eyes I'd ever seen in my life. The eyes of a sharp-faced man in a black robe, and he was talking to me. Philip Frederick Sterling, have you anything to say before the sentence of this court is passed upon you? I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. I couldn't kill anyone. I'm not made that way. You must believe me. I'm not a killer. You shall be in prison at the state penitentiary. No, no. you can't do it. I'm innocent. Until the third day of April. No, no, no. I shall be... What did you do? What did you do to Pluto? Huh? Uh, 
I didn't do anything to Pluto. He... He saw something in your eyes. Oh, what could he have seen? The future. The future? Yes. He saw the future and it frightened him. Oh, he's terrified. And so are you. Me? What are you talking about? I, I'm not... Why are you shaking all over? Who's... You are. Phil. What did you see in Pluto's eyes? Nothing. But Phil... I said I saw nothing. <laughs> I could say that to her, Doctor, but not to myself, because I, well, I had seen something. A courtroom, a judge, a jury, a defendant, and, of course, that defendant was me. Go on, Miss Sterling. I wasn't imagining this, Doctor. I looked into the eyes of that cat, and, and I saw... Uh, yes, you saw that you were being convicted of murder and sentenced by a judge. Uh, you don't think I'm crazy? Well, crazy has many connotations. Whether or not you're crazy, as you put it, is irrelevant here. Uh, but why should I see such a scene? I think you know why. Oh, I don't. I say you do. Uh, please, Doctor, tell me why. It's... It's because you want to kill your wife. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Uh, it's true. Well, why would I want to kill my wife? Why did you marry her? For her money. So far, you haven't been able to spend one cent of her money. Oh, I'm willing to wait. And work on a road gang? What do you suggest? If I were you, I would leave her. Why? You made a bad bargain. You thought you'd fall in soft. It isn't happening. You're beginning to resent her. Already the thought of murder is rattling around in your subconscious. Now look, the old man is worth millions. She gets all of it. Oh no, I, I can't walk out on that. Well, then reconcile yourself to the road gang. I have to, I will. Oh, darling, reach down and pat Pluto's head. Huh? He's forgiven you. For what? For scaring him the other day. Oh, <laughs> poor Pluto. Come here, boy. Now you see how he likes you? Well, I like him, too. <laughs> we're, we're pals, aren't we, Pluto? Uh, do you think you could talk to each other again? Well, sure. <laughs> how are things, Pluto, baby? No, no, I mean really talk. Look into his eyes. Oh, that. Look into them, Phil. Maybe Pluto has something to tell you. Well, okay. Talk to Phil, Pluto. Talk to him. Once again, I looked into Pluto's eyes. Deep into his eyes. Once again, the colors surged and swirled. Reds, greens, blues, yellows, boiling, burning. And suddenly, suddenly, all the roiling motion stopped, as if it were frozen, and the icy blue predominated. And once again, I was staring into those two icy blue eyes, the eyes that belonged to the sharp-faced man in the jet-black robe. said, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. He might have added, I am the ruler of my mind. It's an interesting project Phil Sterling has set up for himself. Talk out the bad, talk in the good. Drive murder out of his brain and coax love into his heart. If such a thing can be done, it will happen when I return shortly with Act Two.
Occasional acid indigestion and heartburn can be more than just acid alone. Often there's trapped gas, too. That's what we call gasid indigestion. Digel is made for gasid indigestion because Digel is different. It does more. Digel reduces excess acid while its patented cymethicone gets rid of trapped gas fast. Use only as directed. Digel for gasid indigestion. No plain antacid can do what Digel can. Of all the leading laxatives, only one, Phenomint, is a gentle chewing gum laxative. And for a very good reason, it's pleasant to take. Phenomint goes into your system gradually, little by little. And after Phenomint has entered your system, it begins to work gently, predictably, to relieve occasional irregularity. Phenomint, the gentle chewing gum laxative. Like all medicines, take only as directed. As they say, you can see the entire universe in a single drop of water. Why is it unreasonable to suppose that Philip Sterling can see the future in the eyes of a cat? Phil is not only convinced he can see his future, he is also certain he can change it. For the better, naturally. Sylvia, call Pluto in here. Oh, darling, he's very frightened. I'll call him in. Hmm? Well, I'm not sure that I should. I need him. You what? Uh, Sylvia, you're the one who insisted on having the word obey in the marriage ceremony. Call Pluto in here. Pluto. Pluto. It's all right, baby. Yes. Here, Pluto. Uh, up on Phil's lap. Uh, uh, that's it. Yes. I, uh... I want to look into his eyes. Oh, I don't think it's wise. Well, I, I have my reasons. All right. Pluto, Phil wants to talk to you. Pluto, talk to Phil. Once again, I looked into Pluto's eyes, and I saw nothing, absolutely nothing at all. What do you say to that, Dr. Myers? Murder? If it was ever in there, I, I drove it out of my mind. I drove all thoughts of murder out of my mind. Oh, look. Pluto's smiling. Of course. And you. You're smiling, too. <laughs> I'm smiling because I love you. Oh, Phil. What's got into you lately? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Keep to your left. Keep to your left. Come on, come on, there's plenty of room. Come on, keep moving. Oh, my God, it can't be, but it is. Gwen, look. It's Phil. Phil, baby, is this for real? Phil, darling. Oh, wait till the gang hears about this. Oh, hi, Gwenny, Bruce. Uh, Phil, darling. Phil. Phil, darling, I never knew you had such muscles. What happened, Phil? Did your father-in-law lose all his money? Uh, look, you're holding up traffic. Is this what uh -huh. man has to do? I'll explain it some other time. Get moving. Get moving, or I'll catch it from my foreman. Everything go all right today? Hmm? Oh, uh, sure. You haven't said a word all during dinner. Well, I'm... I'm just tired. Well, I know you're not used to hard work, but... But you'll see. You'll find it so rewarding. Oh, sure. I... I have a surprise for you. Won't you ask me what it is? Okay. It's Dad's wedding gift. You know what he wants to give us? A house. A house. A house of our very own. He wants to give us 
the house on Rogers Cove. Uh, the big one? Yep, the big one with the boat landing, the tennis court. Oh, well, that is a gift. Uh, <laughs> I turned it down. You what? I turned it down. Uh, but, but, Sylvia, why? Because we can't afford it. We can't afford it? Not on your salary. You don't know how hard I had to work to restrain my father. Uh, from, from doing what? Well, he wants to give us everything right away. Now, think of that, what it would do to you. It would absolutely rob you of your initiative. Uh, Sylvia, Sylvia, we shouldn't insult your father by, uh... All in good time, darling. Our first home should be a, a modest ranch house, or, or would you prefer a split level? I, uh... In a development with other young couples like ourselves. Uh, but, darling... Now, Phil, I had a long talk about it with Pluto. With Pluto? He'll show you the wisdom of it. Pluto, go to Phil. Uh, no, wait a minute. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia, I, I, I must tell you, I love you. <laughs> of course you do. I love you. My only desire is to, to protect you, to, to keep you from harm. Now, 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 no. Pluto. Phil wants to talk with you. <laughs> Once again, the whirl of almost blinding colors. But this time, this time, something was different. In the struggle among the blues, the yellows, the greens, and the reds. The bright, crimson reds. They were winning out. Everything was red. Flowing red. Blood red. Red blood on a pale white face. Blood on... on Sylvia's face. Phil! Phil, please! Don't hit me! Oh, Phil, please! I told you! I warned you! No! Please! Phil, no! You ruined my life! All my friends laugh at me! I love you, Phil! Oh, oh, oh please don't hit me again! Get up! I'm not through. Oh. Get up! Sylvia! Phil, honestly, you have the most violent conversations with Pluto. Oh, oh, no, Pluto, everything's all right. Phil, what were you and Pluto talking about? Uh, nothing, nothing at all. Where are you going? Out. Oh, I'll come with you. No. Oh. Uh, Sylvia, can't you understand? Sometimes a man just wants to be by himself, oh, that's all. of course, darling, I understand. We understand, don't we, Pluto? Yes. You want to go back to the party? Mm-hmm. Maybe later. It's much cozier here. Mm-hmm. I must say... It does make the heart grow fonder. Oh, I missed you, Gwenny. Oh. Phil, how do you stand it? Oh, I have fantastic powers of endurance. <laughs> that is, I hope I do. You know, what with her talking to that cat and everything else, maybe you could get her committed to you, you know, an asylum. After all, she is crazy. Oh, no, 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 no. Only poor people are crazy. Rich people are eccentric. Phil, I'm worried about you. Sure, don't be. I will be fabulously wealthy one day. Is that all there is to it? That's all there ever was for me. I don't like what it's doing to you. Oh, come on, Gwen. What's it doing to me? Well, you're not the same. You were always so happy-go-lucky. Well, that might have been just a pose. No, there's something new inside of you. Really? What? It's a kind of violence. Violence? I'm allergic to violence. You think so? You know what I always say. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Violence? Why, I can't even... Don't protest so much, Phil. It shows. How? When we ran into you on the road, Bruce and I, we started to kid you. You turned livid. Hmm. I don't remember. You were trembling with rage. That's your imagination. You tried to hide it. Well, maybe you're right. There are times when I could just... When you could just what? Kill her. 
You know, it it, uh, it scares me. I never felt that way before about anybody. If I stay with her, I, I know that I'll kill her. And then... Then, what good is the money? Aha! That's delicious. Have another helping, Dad. <laughs> you know, Phil, she used to break the heart of every chef I'd hire. <laughs> These fellas all had international reputations, but she'd just walk into the kitchen and... Whip up a little dish and put them all to shame. But Daddy, <laughs> the preparation of food is a personal, intimate thing. Yeah. Oh, we shouldn't hire strangers to do it. Don't you agree, Phil? I've never seen Phil so quiet. That's right. Darling, both you and Pluto haven't said a word all evening. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, um, I don't know about Pluto, but I, um... I am preparing a statement. Oh, that sounds serious. It's a very important statement. Now, that's a coincidence. I, too, have a statement. May I? Of course. Phil, you've absolutely exceeded all my expectations. You've been an excellent husband to Sylvia. You've been conscientious on the job. And so, therefore, I have a seven-word statement. Hmm. Odd that it should add up to seven because it's a lucky statement, and well, here it is. I have included you in my will. Oh, Daddy, Daddy. Oh, that's wonderful. Isn't it wonderful, Pluto? Mm, I know now, Phil, that you'll succeed in the business. One day, they'll all be yours. Oh, Phil, did you hear that? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I heard it. Well, now that Daddy has made his statement, what was yours? What was mine? I was ready to say four simple words. I want a divorce. However, at that moment, it seemed like a stupid thing to do. I happened to glance at Pluto. He was looking up at me. His eyes were wide, and I could see the colors swirling again. But this time... The yellows, the bright flaming yellows, overwhelmed the others. And then the yellow turned softer and began to gleam like gold, solid gold. Oh, what a fool I would be to throw away a chance to own one of the largest construction companies in America. I looked at Sylvia. I would simply have to love her, that's all. Love her so earnestly, so devotedly that I wouldn't have the inclination to kill her. Huh. The problem was solved. Aren't you going to make your statement, Phil? Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, as it turns out, I, I really don't have one. <laughs> playing a dangerous game. All your instincts tell you to get out. But suddenly, the stakes are raised to dizzying heights. What do you do? Phil Sterling has decided to stand pat. But how strong is his hand? Losers and winners in this game of life and death will be determined when I return shortly with Act Three. And now another tale of the ball and chain. Presents the good, the bad, and the heavy. Why is that cowboy wearing a ball and chain? Because carrying around extra pounds can be just like carrying around a ball and chain. How symbolic. Well, it is, senor. Give me the special K breakfast. Here you go. For a special K, it's the main corn, juice, and coffee. Ah. Say, don't I know you from some place? You probably don't recognize me with my ball and chain. I used to be ten pounds lighter, but I'm getting back that way by exercising and eating smarter than every meal. Start with this here special K breakfast. What's so special? It's less than 200 40 calories, 99% fat-free, and delicious. It's going to help me get rid of this year. Ball and chain. I bet your horse will be glad to get out. Another ball and chain. Fight the dust. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. That's right. Good night. When you put out good money, 
for a homeowner's policy. You're buying the service that that agent's going to give you the first time that you have a claim. State Farm agent Gabe Franco, Fort Collins, Colorado, talks about homeowner's insurance. State Farm has always been synonymous with good service. But the amazing thing is that you get that kind of service without a big price. State Farm has a reputation for low rates. Nowadays, when a guy has a budget to watch, that's more important than ever. You have to make sure that you get the best deal for your dollar. And so you see, you get the kind of service you need for a homeowner's policy and some real financial advantages, too, and that's hard to beat. State Farm Fire and Casualty is number one in homeowner's insurance because of low rates and outstanding service. Good reasons to see your nearby State Farm agent now. should love be a random subjective thing, completely beyond our conscious control. Why can't we say she is the logical person for me to love? Phil Sterling is determined to love his wife, because if he can't, he knows he will have to kill her. Oh, darling, let's quit for the night. Oh, I can mix a batch of cement and start on the wall if you want me to. You work hard all day. Then you come home at night, and I make you work in the basement. <laughs> oh, well, I don't mind. Come on upstairs, wash up. No, i just as soon keep working and finish this. Oh, but not tonight, Phil. I asked the Conways over for coffee. The Conways? Well, they really are such lovely people. Well, he's a bore. Phil? And she's such an idiot. Phil, we... You have to be friendly with your neighbors. Why? Oh, darling, don't lose touch with ordinary people. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, that's what friends are for. I, I just have nobody else to talk to. On the job, at home, the neighbors. I think I'm about ready to flip. Well, Phil, you could always leave. I can't. <laughs> you know, you hear people say, I wouldn't do this or that for a million dollars. But it's academic. <laughs> nobody ever offered them the million. With me. When with me, the money is there. It's, um... It's not quite there. It's mine. I just have to wait it out. I am in the will. I am in it for 50%. Ben, you know how much that is? Mm -hmm. Besides, he's very old. How much longer can he live? Oh, Phil, you always were a genius when it came to figuring things. I wish I knew how to figure this. Well, you know you can't stay. And you don't have the nerve to leave. That isn't true. Been getting any readings from Pluto lately? Cut it out, Gwen. I bet you're afraid to look. <laughs> Phil, you haven't eaten a thing. I'm, uh, I I'm not hungry. Oh, darling, something's troubling you. Talk to Pluto, you'll feel better. I don't want to talk to Pluto. Oh, he's such a comfort. Talk to Phil, Pluto. Yes. Sylvia. Sylvia. I love you. Well, I love you, and Pluto loves you, too. Tell him you love him, Pluto. Well, I know something will cheer you up. Daddy's got the results from his physical today, and he's in the best shape of his life. He is? And you deserve all the credit. Because <laughs> he doesn't have to worry about me anymore. <laughs> the doctor said Daddy will probably live forever. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, I can tell you, you're not feeling... I'm fine. You're out of sorts. Come on, let Pluto comfort you. Keep that cat away from me. Pluto is not that cat. Meow. Oh, now you see, you've hurt his feelings. Oh, for crying out now loud. tell him you're sorry. Phil wants to apologize, Pluto. Tell him you forgive him. Good. Once again, I was staring into Pluto's eyes. And into that boiling maelstrom of colors, all I could see now was brown, and it was the brown of the cement in the basement, and on this brown cement was a sharp and pointed mason's trowel, and suddenly the trowel was in my hand. No, you killed Pluto! That's right! Get out of my way! Oh, no, no! She's 
driving me crazy. I have to kill him. Phil, what's wrong? You're trembling. It, it is, it's nothing. It can't be nothing. I'm going out. Again? Where? For a walk. Where do you always go on these walks? Nowhere. I just walk. Now stop nagging. I don't know what I would do without you, Gwen. Good old Gwen. Comfy as a pair of old shoes. Ready as a candlestick. Reliable, dependable. There when you need me. Well, it's true. Well, congratulate me. I'm getting married. Married? Why? Why? Has it occurred to you I might want a life of my own? Bruce asked me to marry him. Oh, Bruce. He may not be much, but he's all mine. And at least he asked. Me. Gwen, Gwen, listen, in just a couple of years, I, I'll really be rich. And I hope you'll be very happy. I'll make it up to you. As they say in the movies, I guess this is goodbye. But, Gwen, if I can't see you... No, Philip. All or nothing. That's what I want. And to be fair, it's what Sylvia wants. Choose between us. Who gets all and who gets nothing. Mm. Maybe I would miss Gwen. But not for long. Gwen comes back. She always comes back. My problem, Sylvia. Oh, I have to calm down. Keep your temper. Concentrate on loving Sylvia. Loving Sylvia. <laughs> Yes, dear. Pluto and I have a question to ask you. Oh, what is it? Who is Gwen? What did you say? I think you heard me. He heard me, didn't he, Pluto? Meow. Who is Gwen? Well, Gwen is a girl I used to know. When did you last see her? Now, look, what is I'd this? like an answer. Sylvia, who told you about Gwen? Who do you think? Pluto. What does Pluto know? Everything. You're in love with her, aren't you? No. Don't lie to me. I am telling you the truth. You can lie to me, but you can't lie to Pluto. Sylvia. Sylvia. Now listen to me. I am telling you the truth. I love you. Oh, tell that to Pluto. I dare you to tell that to Pluto. Pluto. Pluto, that mangy cat. Hey, where are you going? Home. You're home now. No, I'm going home to my father. I never want to see you again. That damn cat, I'll kill him. Pluto, please don't. Run, Pluto! Run! Oh, that, that stupid cat. Look, he ran down to the basement, Sylvia. He can't get away now. I've got you cornered, you stupid cat. Dodge him! Pluto, dodge him! You can't get away. You won't get away. Phil, you're mad. Put down that towel. Stand still. Stand still, you stupid beast. You've got nowhere to go. Here. Here, Pluto. Here. Come to me. Come, come. I'll protect you. Sylvia. Let go of that cat. You give me Pluto. No! I won't have any peace. I won't have any sanity until I kill him. No, Phil, no, no! Let go of him. No! I, 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 Sylvia. No. Sylvia! Assumed a new role 
And I played it to perfection. The worried husband. What could have happened to her, Phil? I don't know. Oh, I'm scared. How could she just disappear? You two weren't quarreling, were you? What? Sylvia and I? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. The lovebirds. Oh, well, I'll tell you what I'm scared of. Uh, you know, she has all kinds of, well, weird ideas. And, well, what with that cat? Who knows? Maybe she just wandered off. Well, we'll find it. You have to be brave, son. Oh. Oh, I just couldn't get along without her. Dad. My only worry was the will. But I was still in it. So that worry was unnecessary. And actually, I was in it bigger and better than before. <laughs> you know, maybe I should have killed her sooner. Yes? Mr. Sterling? Oh, I'm Mr. Sterling. We're police officers. Oh? May we come in? Uh, I'm Lieutenant Haley. Sergeant Miller? Yes. Detective sir. Krause. Oh, well... Oh, well, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Your wife has been reported missing. Yes, that's right. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, well, my father-in-law and I wrote out a deposition. He's Frank J. Fenris, a very influential man. So I've heard. Your wife disappeared last Tuesday night. Oh, yes. Mr. and Mrs. Conway, your next-door neighbors, report they heard sounds of arguing. Did they? Mrs. Conway characterized it as a fight. Oh, well, Mrs. Conway is a fool. But did you have a fight with your wife? Certainly. Uh, don't you ever fight with your wife, Lieutenant? Do you have any idea where your wife might be now? Lieutenant, do you suspect me of doing away with Sylvia? No, sir. Well, I don't like the tone of your voice. And I don't like the look on your face either. I'm sorry. Yeah, just that cynical know-it-all cop look. Yes. You figure that I killed her. Hmm? Mr. Sterling, I'm sorry if we seem to irritate you, but our job requires that we ask questions. <laughs> so what did I do, Lieutenant? Kill her and uh, hide her body? Nobody said that, sir. Then why are you here? To search the house. Now, I know my rights. For that, you need a warrant. We have a warrant. Oh. Well, go ahead, Jim. Otto, look around. <laughs> Well, Lieutenant, any corpses in the closets? Will you show us to the basement? Uh, the basement? Yes. You have one? Well, of course we do. Uh, just follow me. Jim? Anything? Otto? Mr. Sterling, I, I'm sorry we put you to so much trouble. Something's the matter, Mr. Sterling? Mr. Sterling. Huh? No, I'm... Uh, I'm all right. I, I... Uh, are you ill? You look so pale. Uh, I know this must be a difficult time for you, Mr. Sterling. Yeah, yes, it, it, it is. I, uh, well, I... we're through here. Are you sure you're all right? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I'm just... I'm just fine. Well... Goodbye, sir. Oh, goodbye. Goodbye. You know, it's funny. I hear a cat. He must be right in this room. But I don't see him. A, a cat? A cat? W w what cat? You mean, you don't hear that cat? Why, he's... He's... He's behind that wall. He has to be behind that wall. Pluto. Oh, no. It, it can't be Pluto. He's dead. He's dead. Otto, Jim, get some tools. We're going to break down that wall. He's dead. I killed him. Why isn't he dead? Why? The answer is simple. And it's also the moral of our story, which is, a man is ill-advised to fool with a cat. Why? Because a man only has one life, while a cat has nine. And at this point in time, 
Philip Frederick Sterling has no lives at all, while Pluto still has eight. I'll be back shortly. Young I may be, but still I'm a man. Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can to find me a place where I can be me. Get ready for life to be free and see. Where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? I said it's a school, but what lies ahead? Don't want to get trapped, want to feel free instead. All over the world, there's so much to do. the new lady. You'll get your chance at success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000. That's 800-841-8000. Or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. I know where I'm going from here. doing on this show is bringing back some of the best of the good old days. And a good old expression used to be the cat's meow. Mom and dad use it all the time, even though they didn't exactly know what it meant. Well, after this tale, we know. Our cast included Norman Rose, Marion Seldes, Robert Dryden, Joe DeSantis, and Evie Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Three times on different expeditions we have excavated with no success. This time we have managed to isolate the Mastaba itself. In spite of every kind of miserable luck. Cave-ins, men injured, crews deserting... But at last, within the next few days, I'm convinced the entrance will be found. Oh, how exciting. How wonderful for you. And Hasiba. I hope she isn't a disappointment. Was she really so beautiful, do you think? Incredibly. Her face shamed the shining sun and the day was lit up by the light of her countenance. You know, you sound as though you'd actually seen her. I have. You have? Oh, yes, yes, my dear. For every description fits you. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. To the fear you can hear. For the four centuries before Christ, a remarkable combination of priests and monarchs established one of the most astonishing cultures in the world. The rulers were the pharaohs of Egypt, and they left an enduring series of monuments behind them. The Sphinx, the pyramids, the temples of Karnak and Luxor, and most strange of all, their mummified remains, embalmed by a process lost to modern science. This is the story of one such mummy, and the eternal curse she left to be visited on any violator of her tomb.
mystery drama, The Pharaoh's Curse, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Kim Hunter. years ago, belongs to another world. Certainly in the Middle East, almost midway through the period of the great archaeological excavations that make Egypt a mecca for tourists from all over the world. And in that era, no singer and entertainer reigned more supreme than Diane Elliott, the toast of two continents already, and now in the process of conquering a third with an engagement at Shepherd's, world-famous hotel in Cairo. You going to sing again, Miss Elliot? Uh, no, really. Five encores is enough. Uh, never enough with you. Asking for anyone is already too much. Uh, of course, you must be tired. I uh, know, but I don't want the audience to be. If you'll excuse me. Uh, would you excuse me first? Hmm? There is an old friend of mine here tonight who would very much like to meet you. Could I presume to ask if you would join him as he asked for a drink at his table? Well, who, who is this friend of yours? Sir Geoffrey Lunscombe. The famous archaeologist? He's still alive? I, I mean, well, he, he He's must He's quite be. old, but most active. Uh, uh, would you ask him to give me ten minutes and then come back to my dressing room? Just a moment. Uh, come in. Uh, Miss Elias. Sir Geoffrey? Guilty as charged. Oh, dear. Did I sound forbidding or something? No, not at all. It's just that I feel I'm intruding. Oh, not at all. I, I hope you'll excuse me, though. I, I've started changing because tonight's the end of my engagement here, and I have to start packing. Well, then you'll be leaving Cairo. Well, no, no. Not for a few days. I hope at least a week. I've wangled a little gap between engagements because I want to do some sightseeing. Uh, good, good, excellent. It makes it so much easier for me to ask what I want to ask. It's amazing. What? You, my dear. With your robe pulled tightly around you and your hair swept back so severely from your face. Yes, yes. Absolutely amazing. Uh, well, I, uh... Let me uh, tell you why I'm here. Have you ever heard of the Princess Hasiba? No. Well, it's not too surprising. She was, you understand, a little before your time. Approximately 4,000 years. Hasiba, the gazelle-footed trailer of perfumed musk... Hasiba, the doe-eyed, radiant perfection of the three worlds. Mm, I thought you were an archaeologist, not a poet. Oh, well, not I, my dear. That's uh, Totmes the fifth, her husband, the pharaoh. And he was right. She was, until then, at least the most exquisite woman who ever lived. And when she died, at 19, the pharaoh was so crazed with grief that he stripped himself of all his wealth and turned it into jewels with which he filled her burial casket to the brim. She was buried with all the honors of a pharaoh and the door to her mistaba sealed forever with an undying curse. The, uh, mistaba? The, uh, the burial chamber. And the curse? This chamber holds the jewels of my kingdom... Jewels beyond number and one beyond all price. Who breaks this seal forever seals his doom. He will walk no more among the living nor find his way among the dead. Hmm. You almost make me believe that. Well, I, I almost believe it myself. Perhaps it's why I've taken the liberty of coming to you. I don't understand. Oh, why should you? Let me explain. Fifteen years ago, I discovered the small pyramid that covers the burial chamber. Three times on different expeditions we have excavated with no success. This time we have managed to isolate the mastaba itself. 
in spite of every kind of miserable luck. Cave-ins, men injured, crews deserting. But at last, within the next few days, I'm convinced the entrance will be found. Oh, how exciting. How wonderful for you. And Hasiba. I hope she isn't a disappointment. Was she really so beautiful, do you think? Incredibly. Her face shamed the shining sun and the day was lit up by the light of her countenance. You know, you sound as though you'd actually seen her. I have. You have? Oh, yes, yes, my dear. For every description fits you. (laughs) Well, Sir Geoffrey, I'll I'll have to admit that's about the prettiest compliment I've ever been paid. And the truth. Now, look, look. Uh, What is it? An ivory miniature of Hasiba, hand-carved. How beautiful. Exquisite. Isn't it? Perhaps now you can see, Miss Elliot, why I can easily believe in reincarnation. It's why I asked to meet you. I've devoted the last best part of my life to unearthing this tomb. But I've come to be afraid of a curse and to believe profoundly in the power of good omens and luck. I need that luck. But I think I found it. I know you are my luck. Well... How can I help you? Come as my guest to the diggings for a few days. Open the chamber for me. I think your touch will ensure success. Out of so many, that's the greatest compliment of all. How can I refuse? Uh, uh, Just a moment... Oh, driver, good. Come in. Uh, now, all I'm taking are these two bags, and... You are not the driver I engaged this morning. No, Miss Elliot. Then why? Allow me my credentials. Inspector Hasid of the Cairo Police. Police? If you doubt me, call Ahmed. He will vouch for me. Hmm. Now, uh, may I ask a few questions? Well, of course. You had never met Sir Geoffrey Lonscombe before the night before last. Oh, uh, that's correct. But you are planning to visit the diggings? Yes. Why? Well, <laughs> because he invited me to. Just as a guest? Of course. For a few days, correct? Well... Now, let's not make anything out of that, Inspector. He is about to open the tomb of some ancient Egyptian queen, and I am intrigued. I've never had the opportunity to meet a 4,000-year-old princess who's supposed to look like me. Now, what's wrong with that, and why should it interest the police? This thing is difficult. First of all, let me warn you that there may be possible danger in your visit to the diggings. What danger? I do not know exactly. But if you are to go, will you let me go with you as your driver, incognito? Why? Partially to protect you. And partially what else? That is what I want to find out. Do you have any knowledge of firearms, Miss Elliot? As a matter of fact, I do. I used to do a lot of hunting with my father. And small arms? We had a pistol range. I'm a pretty good shot. Could you handle this if you had to? Uh, For protection only, I mean. Uh, Webley, isn't it? Six clip? It would fit a woman's handbag. Okay. Okay, but I'm not interested in running around playing with guns. Last night, at the diggings, there was a fatal accident... Not, not Sir Jeffrey. No, 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 no. One of the new digging crew. Now, for everyone's safety, I need an opportunity to investigate that accident quietly without publicity. You could offer me that chance. And put my own neck on the line? No. There's little risk for you. But, of course, I cannot tell you there is absolutely none. 
Well, what is it you think's going on out there? I am not sure. 4,000 years ago, if we are to believe the papyri, the written records, Totmes buried with his wife uncounted millions of dollars in jewels. But neither she nor the jewels have been exhumed yet. We are told. And yet, a man is dead. Where was this man found? Near one of the many statues that ring the pyramid. Far from the tomb itself. Well, so what has that to do with... Uh, murdered? Not by any human agency, apparently. The man was crushed, as if broken in the arms of a... something beyond the natural power of things. However, the, the police are less interested in the man himself than what was clutched in his hand. What? I have been selected to investigate this matter quietly and anonymously. Uh, will you let me go with you? You're you're kind of daring me, aren't you? Pardon? You don't want me to refuse. I don't think you are in any real danger, Miss Elliot. And I need a cover. Okay. Let's go adventure. Just tell me one thing first. What is there for the police to investigate? What was it the man had clutched in his hand? A diamond of great beauty and great price. What kind of diamond? Now, there's just the whole point, Miss Elliot. A very special kind. For no diamond has been cut like this in the last 4,000 years. <laughs> tomb sealed fast for 4,000 years, where a princess lies in a coffin filled to the brim with precious stones of incalculable value. Could this diamond be from a tomb as yet uncovered, or was it some random discovery? And if it were, what inhuman agency, with a power beyond all human scope, mangled and destroyed the unfortunate man who found the strangely cut diamond? I'll return in a few moments with Act Two. Southwest from Cairo, riding across the hot white desert sands in the jeep driven by Inspector Hasid, a tool scarf bound across her mouth and nose against the stinging sand, Diana Elliott wonders what whim drove her to this strange adventure. And then, to herself, honestly, she admits what it is. She is tired of the never-relaxing discipline of her life, the touring, the center of applause, the sense of being trapped. Suddenly, she is a free soul, off on an uncharted adventure, ready for anything that comes her way, as long as it is new and different. Miss Elliot. Oh, you know me? Yes. And you more than live up to what I've heard. Can I give you a hand down? Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's uh, more than a hand. Both. Mm. Brother, the old boy was right. About what? You. And our 4,000-year-old lady. Uh, perhaps. But I'm not 4,000 years old yet. And I can stand by myself, Mr. Irving, John Irving. I'm Sir Jeff's assistant. He asked me to look out for you. Oh, great. Could we start by having you let go of my waist <laughs> so I can breathe? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Where's Sir Jeffrey? Oh, he had to go into Cairo with the English mail and in connection with an accident we had here. Oh, yes, I know about that. You do? Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I read about it in the... Cairo newspaper. Oh. Well, let's get your bags and get you settled. Do not worry, I say. I will take care of them. Oh, fine, driver. Uh, Miss Elliot's go into the big tent with the canopy. Uh, you can bunk down with the crew over there. Any one of the three tents near the diggings. Very good, I say. You want to go freshen up, Miss Elliot? Oh, no, no. Everything is too new and strange and exciting. I want to explore. Okay. You want to walk over and have a closer look at the pyramid? I love it. If I'm not keeping you... No, you're not. I, I've been designated as the official 
reception committee for the afternoon. Uh, tell me, have you found the tomb yet? Uh, not quite, but we're close. Uh, we started to uncover what appears to be the entrance to the outer chamber this morning. The diggers are working on clearing that now. It's hard to believe. Yeah. And we're almost there. Fifteen years ago, this entire pyramid was buried in sand. Sir Jeff uncovered it on the two former expeditions. Oh, what a tremendous job. What are these statues that stand along the bottom row of stones? Those are various Egyptian gods. Let's see, starting at that end. Um, Toth, the recorder. Horus, god of truth. Mot, goddess of justice. And Osiris, the king father himself. Uh, two, three, four, five. Uh, hey, you, you missed one. This one in the middle. Well, I'm sorry, so I did. Mm, I can't blame you. He's so ugly. That brutal, snarling face. What does he represent? That's Anubis, the jackal-faced god. Officially supposed, coincidentally enough, to be the greeter of the dead. I don't think I'd care to be greeted by that, dead or alive. What do you mean, coincidentally? Well, this is where... where an accident happened. You mean where the man was killed? You heard about that? Who told you, Sir Jeff? No, it was, um... my driver. Oh, Bad news travels fast in this country. In any country. Ooh, what a cruel, bestial face he has. What does greeter of the dead mean? He weighed the hearts of the dead before welcoming them to the great halls of Osiris, the judge and the sentencer. Mm. <laughs> oh, he's not quite as bad as he looks. Do tell. I, uh, I think I'll have that hand down now. Oh, here you are. Watch it. Quick, behind the statue. Let me shield you. You all right, Diane? I'm all right, Mr. Irving. <laughs> well, couldn't we make it? John, I called you Diane. So you did. It just slipped out. Did it scare you? <laughs> If you mean the explosion, of course it did. It's dynamite. What was the dynamite for, John? That's just what Sir Jeff's going to want to know. He's going to be hopping mad when he gets back. Damn that Sargon. Who is, who is Sargon? Our esteemed Egyptian colleague and so-called archaeologist who's been gumming up this expedition ever since it started. Gumming it up? Yeah, he resents all outsiders who come here on what he considers his territory. Well, you can't blame him, I suppose. It's his country. But just the same, the guy's pretty hard to take. For some reason, he wants that tomb to remain sealed. With that dynamite he set off, maybe he's just gotten his wish. Now, come on. I'll see you back to your tent so I can go find out just what damage has been done. Hi, dear Miss Elliot. I'm sorry I was responsible for making dinner so late. Oh, it was worth waiting for, Sir Jeffrey. This Arabian coffee is delicious. Uh, what was all the trouble with Sargon this afternoon? Well, this morning he wanted to dynamite the entrance open. I said we should wait till you got back. I knew you wouldn't go for it. My God, if we had a cave-in, the whole tomb would have been reburied. To say nothing of the possible damage to inscriptions inside. So... Well, he got so red-necked about it, I told him he could set the charges in case. Oh, that was foolish. I know, sir. But I never thought he'd be pig-headed enough to set them off on his own hook. That is it, I. Oh, Sargon, Sargon, my dear fellow. Come in, come in. Join us in uh, coffee. I do not break bread among my enemies. What with the infidel? Now, wait no, a minute. No, now, now, Sargon. I know you, you're upset, but there's no need to be rude. I don't believe you've uh, met our guest. Miss Diane Elias, Ali Atman Ben Sargon, one of our most noted Egyptologists. How do you do? Your servant, Anaisa. Now, uh, <clears throat> about this thing this afternoon. Mr. Irving said the orders came from you. Why, you. Uh, John. If he denies that, he lies. You think I'm going to sit still Just for sit that? Sit down, time? sir. I will not have this bickering in front of a guest. It can be settled later. 
In the meantime, fortunately, there's been no damage of consequence, and the way into the tomb has been opened. No harm has been done. A great deal of harm has been done. The crew has deserted. What? That is what I came to tell you. They have taken all our transport and left. I tried to stop them, I but... I bet you did. Now, look, sir, just, Jeff, I... Just, just, just a moment, Sean. Oh, why, Sargon? Perhaps they are wiser than we. A small hole was blown through to the inside, and out of it, they say, comes swirling a fearsome efreet that grew ten times taller than a man and verged a cold, freezing breath from his mouth that carried death in the air. They ran in terror from the ancient curse. They knew the stench of evil in the air. Well, that's, that's preposterous. As an archaeologist, you know the fetid odor of death is always present when a tomb is opened. Bunch of simple-minded nitwits. Perhaps. Except that as a simple-minded Egyptian, I agree with them. Oh, you intend to leave On the to... contrary, I intend to stay. I was referring to the stench of evil. And not from the graves of my ancestors, which I shall remain to protect. Why, that son of a... You're going to let him get away with that? Uh, John, I'm sure it was a misunderstanding. Now bear with me, please. Tomorrow may be the end of a long, long dream. Now let me go and pacify poor Sargon. You intend to open the tomb tomorrow? Well, the main breach has been made. I'm hopeful it can be managed. Well, then we must have the press here. I'll go into Cairo tonight. The men have taken the trucks. Well, they're still Diane's Jeep. Uh, if I may borrow it? Well, it's not really mine. It's my driver's. Well, whatever you decide tomorrow will be an exciting day. I shall hope, Miss Elliot, to introduce you at last to your long dead image. Now, this must come to pass, for I still believe in you as my good luck. John, you'll see Miss Elliot to her tent? Of course, sir. Till tomorrow, then. Good night, sir. I'd still like to have it out myself with that surly... Look, let Sir Jeff handle it, John. I want to drink in this strange night. The atmosphere or the general excitement? Both. Everything. The air, the place, the, the time... That enormous red moon. What makes it like that? Sand suspended in the air filters the spectrum. <laughs> Such a lot of sand. It's a whole lot of moon. So quiet. Mm. The air is heavy. Sleepy? No. Don't go in. Stay with me. <laughs> Uh, that might uh, be really dangerous. <laughs> Why don't we grab the jeep and go into Cairo? We can't use the jeep. Why not? It belongs to... to an inspector of police. Look, please don't say I said anything, but he's here investigating the accident. Sub Rosa. You won't tell anyone. Well, sure, if you ask me not to. But I still don't see why we well, can't... Uh, then ask Inspector Hasid if you can borrow the jeep. But I won't go with you. I'm too tired and... and too excited looking forward to tomorrow. But funny how heavy the air seems. I can imagine why those men felt a dark weight. Almost like death in the air. I'll be glad to see you tomorrow. Good night, John. Good night, Diane. Diane? Diane? What is it? Are you dressed? Can I come into your tent? Uh, yes. I was just starting to go to bed. What is it? Look, I, I don't want to alarm you, but the men were right. There is death in the air tonight. Well, what now? Oh, it's nothing to do with the legend. Totally atmospheric. A Samoom is on its way. We must race it back to Cairo. But, but the tomb... The tomb can wait. As it has waited for centuries. Oh, but there won't be room in the jeep for all of us. Only you and I are going. And the others. 
Sir Jeff and Sargon won't leave the tomb. Inspector Hasid won't leave Sargon and remains to protect Sir Jeff. What does that mean? Sargon is not to be trusted. Sir Jeff and the inspector know that. But if we have to run for safety, what about them? Well, they'll be safe in the excavation. It, it's like a, a tornado cellar. That's just what this blow will be like anyways. So why can't we hole up with them? We could, if you think you can spare the time. What's that mean? A simoom. It could blow itself out in six or seven hours or six or seven days. Now, can you spare the time? Oh, of course not. I'm due in Paris in three days. Give me five minutes and I'll get my suitcases ready and we'll be on our way. to bring Diane Elliott and John Irving back within its range. And if the 4,000 year sleep of the delectable Hasiba is to be disturbed at last, on whom will the curse fall for disturbing it? On the men who planned and made it possible? Or on another woman who dared to challenge her beauty? I'll return shortly with Act Three. In the outer chamber, shielded from the wild gust and the roar of the simoon raging outside, Sir Geoffrey and Sargon have isolated and almost cleared the door to the mastaba itself. They are engaged now in cleaning up the debris the explosion earlier in the day had caused. That does it. The door... The door is free. Fifteen years... And the moment is here at last. I am about to enter the tomb of Hasiba. My countrymen have waited 4,000. Come, come, Sargon, let for God's sake not in this minute. What is it? There's someone coming. They did, are a reason. But it'll be silly. It's from the outside. Why, it's Miss Elliot. <laughs> The bad penny and companion turning up again. Well, what happened? Couldn't make it, sir. We just beat that old twister back here to safety. Turned around on us. Just the two of you? Yes. What happened to your driver? We understood he stayed with you. We have not seen him. We thought he stayed with you. Oh, he probably took off with the rest of the crew. Are you all right, Miss Elliot? Oh, yes. I... Well, then let's forget the elements, the momentary inconveniences and everything but the incredible, the marvelous, the unbelievable moment that lies ahead of us. We're about to enter the tomb of Hasiba. But the storm... The storm will blow itself out. We are lighting candles to illuminate centuries of the past. Come, John, Sargon, help me... Push open the door. I do not care to see the tomb opened. I am not surprised. Inspector Hasid. Yes, Miss Elliot. Inspector? Yes, Ali Osman ben Sargan. Inspector Hasid, with a very sore head where someone knocked me out, to deny me the sight of the tomb and its contents. By all means, let us open the door. I am not asking but commanding with this gun. Let's go, Sargon. There it is. Beyond 
that black aperture lies Hasiba, wrapped in her blanket of jewels. Who shall be first to enter? The right is mine. The right is Sir Jeffrey's. Don't make me use my gun. This is a moment I dread as much as I desire. Who knows what lies in that dark cave? The tomb may have been rifled centuries ago. Its artifacts destroyed the very catafalque itself. Vandalized. The curse was never idle. And then suddenly I am too old and afraid to enter. Diane? I... I brought you here as my luck. Will you risk it and enter first? If you wish me to. I wish it with all my heart. John, take the torch and light her in. Yes, sir. Careful, Diane. Easy. What is there to fear? Who knows? The dead resent intruders. And I only hope that... Oh! What is it? Some stone beneath my feet. Look out, Anne. What happened, John? The door to the tomb swung shut. Well, can we open it? No. The counterweights locked it somehow. Hold With up me? the torch. Why? There's an inscription inside the door. What does it say? It... But it would take time to decipher it. Don't worry, I can guess. He who breaks this seal forever seals his doom. He will walk no more among the living or find his way among the dead. It's just what I was afraid of. Hopeless. The door can't be budged. What happened? The stone you stepped on. Designed to trip the counterbalancing rocks and lock them. To get the door open now, they'll have to blast. So that was Tothmy's ancient curse. That's pretty effective. Look, hold up the torch, John. Is that better? Yes. It's not a very large chamber. No. In the center there, is that... Yeah. That's the catafalque. Hasiba. Can we look? Why not? Poor little princess. Poor little rich girl. So young. Can we... Can we open the sarcophagus? I don't know. Somewhere there should be... Oh, let's see. Ah, Here. It's too heavy. As far as I dare slide it. Such a big coffin for such a little girl. But... Oh, but she is lovely. The face is only a death mask. Where are the jewels, John? The jewels that filled the casket to the brim. That's right. Evidently, old Tothmus regretted his generous impulse and sneaked in later and pinched his fabulous fortune. How? I... I don't know. What's the matter with the torch? Oh, I'm afraid it's going out. Well, can't we light it again? No. Lack of oxygen. We've got to get out of here. Haven't you any idea how? The catafalque itself. Let's have a look. But how? Where? It's just a simple box. Except here, at the foot of it. Carved in bar relief. Oh, wait. Let me hold the torch close. Yeah, that's better. <gasps> what is it? That face. The god you showed me outside the pyramid. With the jackal face. What's his name? Anubis. Greeter of the dead. But he has another name. The opener of the ways. Diane, maybe this is it. Press it. Try it. Yes. Opener of the ways. Oh. Smell that, Diane. Oh. Fresh air. Look at the torch light up. And there are steps beneath. We're free. I wonder, John. I wonder. Ah. 
I can see it clearly now, Diane. Sargon, he's been plundering the tomb. That was the reason for all the delays he caused. He had to have time to get rid of the jewels. And now, unless we escape somehow, he's safe. Inspector Hussaid won't let him go. We might as well have all the cards on the table. When I stumbled into you entering the chamber, it was because Sargon pushed the inspector against me and grabbed the gun. You can be sure Sir Jeffrey and Hasid are both dead by now. And Sargon is on his way to freedom with the jewels. Well, then it's up to us to stop him. How? What's the matter? A blank wall. This looks like the end of the road. It does at that. How... How do we get out of this? That's all up to you, John. What does that mean? It's not very difficult to figure out. You know just where to put your hand to move this rock. Don't you, John? I? Why should I? Because you've been here so often before. You know? I think so. And what I don't know, I can guess. You found this secret entrance some time ago. And you stole the jewels, didn't you? You've been the one that's been delaying things while you tried to figure out some way to get away with them. My jeep with me as cover was the perfect way out if it hadn't been for the sandstorm. All right. I admit it. Which leaves you with two choices. Which are? Stay here or come with me. Diane, I am more than a little in love with you. And I promise you, there's a fortune packed in your jeep that could make us able to live like Totmus and his queen Hasiba. In your luggage, it could easily be smuggled out of the country. Half of it, all of it's yours, if you share it with me. And if I don't? I'll have to take my chances alone. Which includes, unfortunately, leaving you shut in here where you can't blow the whistle on me. Two choices, hmm? What else? This. What? Gun? Where did you get that? From the inspector. And don't think I don't know how to use it. Are you ready to open the door now? Suppose... Suppose I just refused. The torch is beginning to burn low again. That means we're running out of oxygen, doesn't it? Okay. You win. Here, catch it. What? I hope I didn't hurt you. I had to get the gun. What are you going to do? Oh, nothing violent. That really isn't my nature. Just leave you here. With any luck, they'll break through in time and find you. Goodbye, Diane. You can't. No. Now, please don't move. I'll leave you the torch when I go. Simone is still rangy. You'll never get through it. I'll have to take my chances. It's all I have left. I move back. I'm sorry. Sorry for everything except the jewels. If you could only see them. Well, here goes. Uh, you must rest, my dear. There's time later. No, I, I, I want to finish telling you. He was leaving, and, uh, and he had started the door of, of, or the statue base that closed the secret entrance. And then, then suddenly the wind was too strong, and he, he fell back and got caught in all those tons of stone. Just like the other man. Who... I would spare little pity on him, Miss Elliot. The other man was my brother. Asaib Irving thought he had killed me just as successfully. But I don't understand. Why did he start to come back? His return was involuntary. What do you mean, Mr. Sargon? He underestimated the enduring power of an ancient curse. He was returned to his fate. So the curse was a real one after all. 
He will walk no more among the living, nor find his way among the dead. But, thanks to you, Miss Elliot, the ancient gods are satisfied, and the lady of whom you are a reincarnation will also be reborn. Hasiba, the gazelle-footed, trailer of perfumed musk. Hasiba, the doe-eyed, radiant perfection of the three worlds. Why shouldn't she be reborn? I'm in favor of it. What man wouldn't be? I'll be back shortly. And we'll return... It was Nathaniel Hawthorne, one of our American greats, who said it. A grave, wherever found, preaches a short and pithy sermon to the soul. Let my comment on this tale be as brief. Let the dead past bury its past, nor pause too much to think on today. The future is what leads us on. If we march to any banners, let it be to those... Our cast included Kim Hunter, George Petrie, Arnold Moss, Dan Ocko, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, and you're welcome in my world where things are even stranger than they seem, and reality falls before truth. We've all heard that one picture is worth a thousand words, but is this really true? A quick example. Would your sweetheart rather hear you say, I love you, or look at your picture? But pictures have their place, as millions of camera fans all over the world will tell you. Listen as we hear about a strange and dangerous camera which brought tragedy to those who owned it. No! No, please don't hit me again. I told you I don't know it. No, no, there's no sense in you hitting me and hitting me. I don't know the combination. Please! I don't care about the camera. I really don't. I would tell you if I could, but Johnny changed the combination on the safe because he knows how I felt about it. (laughs) Our mystery drama, Die, You're on Magic Camera, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Nick Pryor and Terry Keene. How do you feel when your host or hostess pulls out the old family album for a quiet evening looking over family snapshots? Some people find this enjoyable. Johnny Carlin loved picture taking. At the time our story opens, Johnny had attained a cherished ambition. He was a proud owner of a brand new Volecta S60, a magnificent camera, and the very last word in self-developing photography. To add to his happiness, he was taking the very first picture on the Volecta of his beautiful and bubbly girl, Lisa Kane. Uh, move to your left, Lisa. If you can sort of lean against the pillar of the bank there. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Hold it. Good. I can't wait to see it. Neither can I. What happens now? You just push this button and wait for the picture to develop. Seems like a miracle. It's a brilliant piece of scientific work. Someday I'll explain how it works. Now, we open this back, and here's your picture. But, well, how strange. It, it, is that the picture you took? It it sure isn't. Wait a minute. I, I can't figure out what happened. Look how clear the inside of the bank is. Is that a hold-up going on? Well, yeah, it looks like it. 
She hasn't been a holdup. Look, everything's normal. Yeah, I I can see it is, but the the camera doesn't lie. There are three guys with guns and people lying on the floor. This is crazy. <laughs> I don't know what I did about breakfast before I met you, Lisa. You had coffee and Danish and some greasy spoons. <laughs> Remind me to chalk up another reason for us to get married. It'll be more convenient for me to have you in my kitchen than for me to come over to your place every morning. <laughs> I'll remind you. Hey. Hey, Lisa, look at this. Intercoastal Trust held up by three bandits who escaped with $30,000 in cash and negotiable securities. Johnny, isn't that the... That's the bank where we stood when I took that picture. What does it mean? Hand me my camera. Here. It beats me that this is a perfectly ordinary Valecta. Well, could, could, could it have been just a freak thing? Some kind of a, a crazy mix-up? You tell me how this camera could take a picture of a holdup in a bank that hadn't happened yet. Can you explain that? No. Why don't we just forget about it? Because there's a reward for information leading to the capture of the robbers. You think the picture we have shows the actual robbers? Well, it's worth a try. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm calling about the intercoastal bank robbery yesterday. Uh, I think I have something that'll help. Thank you for calling. What do you have? Well, I, I, I can't tell it over the phone. Why not? Because it's a photograph. A photograph? Yeah, I, I was taking a picture of my girl outside the intercoastal bank yesterday, and, and uh, somehow I, I got a picture of the holdup. Where are you now? My office is 1 Central Park South. I'll be there in an hour. The name is uh, Carlin Communications. I'm John Carlin. See you in an hour, Mr. Carlin, and thanks. You didn't say anything about the reward. There's time for that when I get him in the office. You expect anyone? No. Uh, you'll forgive me, but the door was open. What, that... That's impossible. I always double lock that door. We're all forgetful at times. You're John Carlin. Who are you? My card. Valecta Camera Corporation, Nicholas Scarlett, sales representative. Yes, Mr. Scarlett? I'll come straight to the point, Mr. Carlin. Our records show that you purchased a Volecta S60 on the 27th of this month. Correct? That's right. Well, it was our mistake. No question about it. A very grave error. That model was sold to you by some stupid clerk. <laughs> it is an experimental camera that should not be on the market. So, since it was our error, we are going to give you your choice of any two Volecta cameras you wish, including our motion picture line, when you return the experimental model. Fair? What kind of experiments were you doing with this model? Not my department, Johnny. I'm just here to get the camera back. Well, suppose I want to keep the camera. Why would you want to do that? Suppose I did. Bad move, Johnny. I wouldn't advise it. You mean there's a chance that the Valecta people might try to grab it sometime? Rip me off? Oh, never. You paid for the camera. It's yours unless you return it voluntarily. That's the rule of the company, and that's the way it works. Now, what do you say? Do we have a deal? I'd like to think it over. Oh, sure thing, sure thing. But believe me, Johnny, this camera wasn't meant for you. And whatever you're thinking, it won't work out. When did you take this shot, Mr. Carlin? Well, I don't remember the exact time, Inspector, but it must have been during the robbery. Hmm. Well, when else could it have been? I don't know. But maybe you can explain how it is that the faces of the hold-up men are so sharp and clear. Well, the Valecta S60 is a marvelous camera. Yeah, it must be, since the bank camera shows that the men were wearing stocking masks. 
Johnny, I don't know what you're trying to prove, but I've got to get out of this hotel lobby. You can't figure it out. It just doesn't make sense. Every single one of these pictures came out just the way I took them. Well, why shouldn't they? Well, how do you explain that picture in front of the bank? I told you, it, it was a freak. That's all. Come on, let's get out of here. Well, maybe you're right. There's a phone over there. You sit in this chair while I call Scarlett and tell him I'm ready to make the deal. Okay, but make it fast. One minute. Mr. Scarlett, please. Who? Mr. Nicholas Scarlett, sales representative. Oh, I'm sorry, but we have no Mr. Scarlett here. No, you must have. I have his card right here. It says Nicholas Scarlett. I'm Bole- sorry, sir. There's no Mr. Scarlett working for us. Is it all set? Can we go now? Valetta never heard of Nicholas Scarlett. He doesn't work for them. What? Well, that's impossible. He offered you. He's a phony. He just wants the camera. I've got to figure this thing out from every angle. Johnny, I'm tired and I'm hungry. I just want to get out of this hotel. Okay. On our way out, I just want to take one more shot. Johnny, that's an empty passenger elevator. I can see that. Okay, there. Now let's go. We'll look at what comes out in the restaurant. I never would have believed a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich could taste this good. Look, Lisa, look at this shot. What, the empty elevator? It isn't empty on this picture. Look. Johnny. What? Johnny, I'm frightened. Lisa, you've got to help me find the girl in the picture. Johnny, I want you to throw that camera in the river. And just forget about what's going to happen to that girl in the picture with the knife at her throat. How do we know it hasn't happened already? Honey, I've been through that with you. The first picture showed a robbery that was going to happen, and it did. Now we have a girl and a man in a hotel elevator, and the guy has a knife at her throat. We might be able to stop that from happening. Oh, we don't even know who she is. She's, she's, she's probably a guest at the hotel. One of the desk clerks should recognize her picture if you show it to her. This picture? I can't show them that. No, of course not. But I can crop it so that the man with the knife Johnny, is out. Johnny, it's no use. I don't want to go around asking about a girl I don't know. I don't want anything to do with that camera. I just want you to get rid of it. Lisa, do you want to throw away a million dollars? Johnny, you sound like a stranger. I don't even know you. Why do you talk about a million dollars? What's this picture got to do Don't with... do you see the possibilities that exist with this camera? I can predict when a crime will occur. I can also show the face of the criminal. Now, will you think of what a private detective agency could do with something like that? But how would you explain it? I don't have to explain anything. I don't know. I just have a bad feeling about the whole thing. She's right, John. Uh, Listen to what she's saying. Mr. Scarlett... Where did you come from? Well, I have here the two cameras that the Velector Company promised you in return for the experimental model. You don't work for Velector. I checked. They never heard of you. That's of no importance. No? Well, what is? That you return the camera to me. The way I figure it is, you just want that camera for yourself. I don't buy that story about the camera being an experimental model. Oh, really? No. Uh, then... What do you think it is? Well, it... Ah, yes? Well, what difference does it make? It's mine. (laughs) Unfortunately. Look, I've had about enough of you, Mr. Scarlett. Now, we have work to do, and if you'll excuse me... Uh, You'll find what you're interested in in this newspaper on page three. Unknown assailant stabs girl in hotel elevator. Johnny, that's... That's tomorrow's paper. Oh, just an early edition. It will be on the streets in two hours. At any rate, you're too late to help Miss Stearns. Uh, But to ease your conscience, she wasn't seriously injured and should be out of the hospital in a day or two. What hospital? It doesn't say here. And how do you know so much? Oh, you know, it's always embarrassing when we're forced into this position, especially in this atomic computer age, but I see there's no help for it. Now, through an error... 
a piece of equipment used by my organization, has come into your possession. I don't think it's necessary to explain that this shouldn't be in the hands of any mortal. Hold it. Hold it right there. You said mortal. Are you trying to tell me that you're not a human being? Johnny, be careful. Ah, come off it, Lisa. Now look, Scarlett, if you're the devil and you want my camera, you'd have no problem in getting it. You wouldn't be here asking for a swap, practically begging me to give it to you. Ordinarily, you'd be right. But there are unalterable rules which govern my organization, and one of them is that when a mortal makes a legitimate purchase from us, we're bound to a bargain. We can only ask that he return his purchase of his own free will. Now that I've revealed this much to you, I suggest that you take the... Uh Uh-uh. No deal, Nick. Or whatever your name is. You made a bargain. And you're stuck. May I make one correction? It is not I, Johnny, who is stuck. But you, who are doomed. I don't suppose there's one of us who hasn't thought of what they'd say or ask if they really had a conversation with the devil. You know, I like to believe that most of us have at one time or another, but that we somehow either didn't recognize him or didn't believe him. When a man looks back on his life, It's easy for him to pick out the mistakes he made. Where, if he had done things differently, his life would have been better. However, man is always the victim of his desires. And in today's world, the desire for wealth can blind. Johnny Carlin had become the owner of a strange camera. A camera which seemed to be able to take pictures of the future. And Johnny Carlin had visions of untold wealth. He had also been warned, but greed has its own way of muffling warnings. I hate all of this. I wish you'd give it up, Johnny. I can't stand all this lying and maneuvering with people who are calling for help. Who's lying? We can deliver. Lisa, all we have to do is tell them that we have to take a picture. That's all. But there have been dozens of calls from people who have been ripped off or mugged and want us to find the criminal. Simple. We tell them we can't help them. This is the Carlin Crime Prevention Agency. We can forestall a crime. We can't solve it. You don't have to do anything except tell them the truth. All right? Now, what have we got today? You must be kidding. Here, look. Here's just a few of the latest messages. Uh Uh-huh. Banks? Hey, these are good. Banks will be regular customers when we get set up properly. Uh, Nothing, nothing. Hey. Andrea Scudder. (laughs) <laughs> what do you know? You know her? Well, the same way you do. Heiress to the Scudder Millions, beauty, playgirl, athlete, and all-around hellraiser. She said she wanted to talk to you about a personal problem. Uh-huh. Andrea Scudder. That's money. Call her and make the appointment. Mr. Carlin, I'm being blackmailed. I don't know by whom. Can you find out? Well, I can try, Miss Scudder. If I don't succeed, there'll be no fee. And if you do, there'll be no publicity. I don't want my name spread all over the front pages. You have my word. Fine. The job is worth $50,000. Is that satisfactory? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's okay. Uh, uh, I'd like a little more information. Such as? Well, what happens when and if I deliver the name of the blackmailer to you? You get my check, my thanks, and my farewell. I'll take it from there. Uh, not satisfactory. What? Uh, Look at it from my point of view, Miss Scudder. You ask me to get you a name and then walk away? Now, obviously, you, uh, you have some plans for this blackmailer. Probably for getting rid of him. That is none of your business. Uh, Granted, but if you intend to, uh, uh... Hire someone to take care of your problem with him, then that can't be done very quietly, and I might get involved. Mr. Carlin, let's put it this way I am not a killer, 
Nor do I intend to become one. This blackmailer must be someone in my circle of friends. You'll have to take my word for that because of the information that he holds over my head. Uh, Miss Scott, excuse me. You keep saying he. Why? Because it's a man's voice disguised that talks to me over the telephone. But the blackmailer could conceivably be a woman. It's possible. But it would still be one of my group. Okay. Now, the only request that I make of you is that you allow me to take your picture. My picture? Just a snapshot. Well, I don't see what that uh, Well, that's, that's the way I work. I, uh, I get strong impressions from a picture. Uh, uh, emanations. Call it whatever you want. It works. <laughs> All right. How do you want me to pose? I don't have my camera with me. Uh, you see, I wasn't sure that I would take your case. Could you come to my office tomorrow at your convenience? <laughs> Full face, if you please. Whatever you say. Thank you. Uh, th that's it? That's it. Thank you for coming to the office. Well, what happens now? Well, I'll study the picture and hopefully get some vibrations which will enable me to name the blackmailer. How long do you think it will take? Not long. I may be in touch with you this afternoon. <sighs> All my instinct tells me that this was a waste of time. But if it doesn't work, it'll cost me nothing. Exactly, Miss Scudder. See you later. I hope. You will, Miss Scudder. You certainly will. Lisa? Yes? She's gone. Come on. We'll see what the picture looks like. I don't know what you expect to come out of this. <laughs> what is it? She said she wouldn't. She said she wasn't a killer. Who's the man? I've never seen him before. But from the looks of this picture, she's pumping a few bullets into the blackmailer. Are you sure you know what you're going to tell her? I'm not going to tell her anything. Hand me the scissors. Here. Yeah. All right. There. Now, all we have is a picture of the blackmailer. I'll take this up to her and say, here's the man who's been blackmailing you. Give me a check for $50,000, please. Johnny, she looked a lot older in this picture. Well, he isn't too young either. I want you to promise me something. When and if you get the million, you'll forget about the camera and throw it away. Lisa, Johnny, that... please, promise. Okay. If that will make you happy, okay. Come in, Mr. Carlin. I must say, you work fast. The uh, picture did the trick. Yes. And you have a name. No. But I have his picture. His picture? Here it is. You can probably put a name to it. This is your idea of a joke, Mr. Carlin. I am not amused. But I, I, I don't understand. Something must Get have out. gone... Get no, Now, wait I a minute. I meant what I said, Mr. And Carlin. And I've got something to say to you, Miss Scudder. You ask my help in locating a blackmailer. Now, I came up with this picture, and it's obviously upset you. I, I, I don't know who the man in the picture the is, The man in I... the picture is Tracy Kingsford, my fiancé. Your fiancé? Exactly. And I know he isn't the blackmailer because he could and will have half of everything I have when we marry next month. But... Now, I don't know what your purpose was in showing me this picture. Or even how you got it, but... This picture of Tracy. He... He isn't this old. Where did you get this? Well, m m m maybe it isn't... It isn't your fiancé. Don't be ridiculous. Where did you get it? Well, I'm, I'm afraid that's confidential. But... I want to know why you thought Tracy was the black man. Sir, I told you. I made I will pay for the information. What is your price? If... If I decide to tell you, it won't cost you a penny. But I... I I'll have to think it over. <laughs> What are you going to do, Johnny? I honestly don't know. I, I've learned one thing, though, about this camera. Yes, so have I. 
It's best to use it with places or, or institutions like banks or jewelry stores rather than with people. It's wrong for you to have it and even worse for you to try to use it. Now, Lisa, it can't do me any harm. If I learn to use it properly, I, I won't get into anything like the Scudder situation. You still haven't decided what to do about that. Yeah. Yeah, I have. I'm, I'm just going to forget it. Forget it? How do you forget something like that? A very good uh, question, Miss Kane. You're, you're after the camera again, aren't you, Scarlett? Of course. I should think by this time you'd be convinced that it isn't for mortals. Uh, right. You have to say that, huh? Well... That doesn't make it a lie. But it makes it suspect. I can take whatever you say with a grain of salt. Well, let's get back to Miss Scudder. You know that she's going to kill her husband. And you're going to let her. Can you live with that knowledge? Well, can, can, can I stop her? You can try. Okay. Tell me how. You can tell her the truth. Ah, that would be interesting. Tell me, Miss Kane. Suppose someone came in here and told you that you were going to kill Johnny after you're married. Would you believe him? What? W would you? <laughs> no. Johnny, you could, you could put the picture back together and, and show her the picture. Show her shooting him. Yeah, but she'll ask me how I got the picture. You're getting to be good at lying. You'll tell her you have this gift of... Uh, <laughs> prophecy? Yes. That somehow when you, you take pictures of people, it shows the future somehow. That you've only recently discovered the gift. You could tell her that. Oh, interesting. Look, we don't need you here. You don't know how wrong you are. Why don't you just give up? I'm not going to give you the camera. Oh, that's final. You can bank on it. All right, all right. Then I'll ask you for a favor. And I give you my word. You won't regret it. Yeah. Well, what is it? Permit me to take one picture. What for? As a favor. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No deal. Once you get your hands on the camera... Johnny, I give you my solemn promise that I will take only one picture and immediately return the camera to you. But well, why should I believe you? Because I've already told you that I can only get the camera from you if you give it to me. I cannot trick you. Johnny, please, let him. Well, all right. So long as it's clearly understood that you're only taking one picture. Understood. All right. Lisa, get the camera. Right away. Uh, wait a minute. What picture are you going to take? Uh, uh, uh That wasn't part of our bargain. The only right you have, Johnny, is to keep the camera and destroy yourself. That right has been granted to you. Here's the camera, Mr. Scarlett. Thank you. Uh, no, no, wait a minute. Not so fast. I told him... Thank you. And here's your camera, Johnny. Well, what about the picture? You just snapped something at random. Oh, the picture, Johnny. The picture is mine. I hope that I will not have to show it to you. I told you, I don't know. Oh, please, there's no sense in your hitting me. I don't know the combination. <laughs> I don't care about the camera. I don't. I would tell you if I could, but he changed the combination to the safe because he knows how I feel. <laughs> Inspector? Uh, you know a girl named Lisa Kane? <laughs> well, of course. She's my fiance, and uh, she also works with me. Well, forgive me, but uh, I've been through this before. I've got the kind of news that can't be broken gently. What is it? Something happened to Lisa? She was beaten up badly. She's in the emergency clinic at City Hospital, and she's asking for you. <laughs> his blooming lyre and regaled Grecian nobles with the stories of Greek gods and men which have become part of our Western heritage. Man has sought to pierce the veil of the future. And ever since those days, from Cassandra on, man has consistently ignored the words of prophecy, no matter from where they came. 
Now, Johnny Carlin has been given more than a warning. Whether he heeds it or not, we'll find out. Black magic from a black box. A seemingly ordinary camera purchased by Johnny Carlin has turned out to be anything but ordinary. In fact, it has the capability of depicting future crimes which will be committed by or against the people photographed. The camera has brought Johnny a lot of money, a lot of notoriety, and a lot of trouble. Lisa Kane, his fiancée, is in the emergency clinic of City Hospital because she has been brutally beaten. You got here fast, Carlin. Where is she, Inspector? One of the rooms down the hall. She's been asking for you. All right, let's go. Any idea why she was picked on? No, wasn't it an ordinary mugging? Hardly. She was attacked in your office. Nothing was taken from her purse. Johnny... Johnny, I want... I want Johnny. I'm here, Lisa. I'm right here. Oh, Johnny. Johnny, they wanted the camera. They knew it. They knew it was in the safe. Now, don't try to talk oh, now. Please, let me. I, w- I want to tell you. Did you see their faces, Miss Kane? Yes. You think you could recognize them if I showed you some pictures? In- Inspector, look, I don't think she's in any Johnny, shape. Johnny, get rid of the camera. Get rid of the Is this camera. the same camera that took the pictures that nabbed the men who robbed the Intercoastal hey, Bank? Inspector, look, you can tell she's in pain. Doctors uh, say she's going to be all right. Now, what about the camera? Well, th- 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 this isn't the time or the place. This is the time. You want to find another place? It's okay with me. Oh, that's good coffee. Another cup, Inspector? We got the coffee. Give me some facts. Look, I've told you everything I could. Uh-uh. The camera. Now, what's with the camera? It's it's one of the new Velectas. You've seen them. Sure, they all take pictures of masked stick-up guys and show their faces, right? Look, Inspector, I can't explain how that happened. I'm going to but... level with you, Carlin, and then you better level with me. Look, Inspector, are you threatening me? I didn't press you about it before because you did me a favor. I got a lot of brownie points for bringing in those bank robbers. But now the heat's on me again. New commissioner is throwing his weight around. And I'm looking for something that'll help me score with him. Well, I'm afraid you're looking in the wrong direction. Well, let me see the camera. I've told you. I know what you told me. And I know you haven't leveled with me. Two guys don't beat up a girl looking for a combination to a safe that holds nothing but a camera. Unless they want that particular camera awfully bad. Inspector, that's pure speculation. Now, they, they, they may have thought there was a lot of cash in the safe. The girl says all they wanted was the camera. Inspector, she's like you. She's got a thing about it. Well, I sure have. Take a guy named Johnny Carlin in the communications business. He buys a camera, and all of a sudden he's in the crime prevention business and doing very well. How come, Carlin? I discovered I had a special talent. Yeah, I checked with some of your satisfied clients. They tell me you use ESP. Yeah, that's right. And the camera. Yeah, that's right again. But I don't buy it. Well, I'm not trying to sell it to you. Yes, you are, Carlin. You're trying to sell me a phony story. Now, I want that camera you use for your ESP bit. It seems to me that you're a lot more interested in the camera than you are in getting the guys who beat up Lisa. I haven't heard you screaming at me to find them. If I thought that would do any good, you'd hear me on the moon. Meaning? Meaning that I think we'll get those guys one way or another. You think you have a way? Maybe. Something to do with a camera. You have your methods, I have mine. If I come across anything, and I expect to, I'll let you know, Inspector. Hello, Mr. Seven left. Three right. And all the way past zero to the right to four and then eleven to the left. Scarlet. You stole it. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, when are you going to start believing me? I told you, it's against the rules. What are you doing here? I came to help. Well, I don't want your help. You're not interested in finding the man who beat up Lisa? Well, I don't need you. Of course. You have the camera. May I remind you that it only works in the future, not in the past. 
the crime on Lisa has already been committed. And that's all you came here for? And to give you this snapshot. Remember the one I took in this office when you lent me the camera? Let me see it. Here it is. These are the guys. <laughs> here they are. It's a perfect picture. Excuse me. Where are you going? I'm going to show it to Inspector Barrett. He'll be able to pick up these hoods in no time. Of course. And what do you tell him when he asks you where you got this picture? He'll be more determined than ever to get his hands on the camera. Well, then, why did you snap it? Wait a minute. You knew it was going to happen. Why didn't you warn her? Which question do you want answered? The, 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 both of them. Neither of them. Look, I don't know. I just want to do something. Johnny, give me the camera. All right. Look, I'll make a deal with you. That's what I'm here for. Which two cameras of the Valecta line do you want? Yeah, you're pretty sharp, all right. I'll give you the camera for one million dollars. Sorry, Johnny. I can't make that deal. Why not? Because it's against the rules. I... I had to get a special concession even to be able to offer you two cameras. Believe me, Johnny. A mortal cannot profit by a mistake like the one that was made with your camera. So get out while you can. And let me have the camera. You know, you sound like a broken record. Well, haven't you had enough? Can't you understand now why this camera can bring only tragedy? Well, which question do you want answered? Oh, it's interesting that I find it much more difficult to do a good deed than an evil one. I'd like to know what makes you think you can pick out these mugs, Carlin. You've never even seen them. Yeah? Well, what have you got to lose, Inspector? Time. I could be showing these mug shots to your girl. She's the one who saw them. You looking for someone you know? I'm just looking for a couple of faces. I think... Wait a minute. Yep. Here you are. Here are your men. Joe Horn and Spence Vogel. Are you sure? I'm positive. How do you know? What happened since I saw you at the hospital? Will you stop asking questions and pick these guys up? What if you're wrong? I look like some kind of... I'm not wrong. Hey, I've got good news, Lisa. The doctor says you'll be able to go home in a couple of days. That's nice. Well, honey, you don't seem very happy. Johnny, what have you done about the camera? Isn't it great? They've caught the two guys who hurt you. So you've still got the camera. Look, Lisa. Hello. It's for you, Inspector Barrett. Barrett? How did he know I was here? Thank you. Hello? Carlin, I want you to meet me in your office as soon as possible. Well, why? What's up? I'll tell you when you get there. Be there. What did he want? Well, he, he, he wants me to meet him in my office as soon as possible. Johnny, please don't go. Oh, Lisa, why not? I just got here. Look, if I go now, I can finish with Barrett and get back and spend an hour or so with you before I get thrown out. <laughs> Inspector, I never really thanked you for getting those two guys. That's what I came about. <laughs> what, to get thanked? In a way. I want that camera. Hey, Inspector, look, you must be losing your marbles. I told you... Now, listen one... to me, Carlin, and listen good. I put 16 years of my life into the police force, and they've just transferred me to Staten Island. Me. Inspector Barrett sent the... Well, you get the idea. Now, I'm not sitting still for this transfer. i got to have your little camera. Inspector, what good do you think the camera's going to do you? Oh, come off it, Carlin. I'm a cop. I've done every kind of police work from pounding a beat to undercover surveillance. And never have I heard of a guy who could predict crimes and name the criminals. And you can't either, Carl. Oh, well, wait a minute. I never said I could. You can't. But you got some kind of new fangled device on that trick camera of yours, and I want it. It's going to make a big difference to my career. Look, Inspector, I'm sorry about the transfer, but, but it's upset you. Now, you're dreaming. You don't believe for a minute that I've got a gadget on a camera... That can look into the future? That's just what I believe. It's the only thing that makes sense. All right. Now, suppose I prove it to you. How? 
I'll show you the camera. Fine. You look at the camera, and if you know anything about cameras, you'll see that it's a perfectly ordinary Velecta S60 with no extra gadgets on it. That's why you keep it in a safe. Here, Inspector. Look for yourself. You see? A plain Velecta. No gimmicks. Nothing. What did you leave in the safe? Nothing. Take a look. I will. All right. Now you're satisfied? No. I think I'll take a picture. Now, Inspector, you're being childish. What's your beef? I'll just... Now, now give me the camera. Back off, Colin. No, no. I, come on. I said give Let me the, go, the camera. Colin, come on. I, I want you. I want you, Colin. Now, get up. On your feet. Colin. Colin. Good Lord. He's dead. Inspector. Inspector Barrett. Uh, hold up a second. Who are you? Uh, Nick Scarland. I'm a friend of Johnny's. Oh? He asked me to pick up his camera. I, uh, I see you're carrying it. I'll check with him. Oh, really? That won't be necessary. Look, I've never seen you before in my life. I know that this camera means a lot to Johnny. You don't expect me to hand it over to some stranger simply because you know Johnny and you ask for it. Inspector, you're in a better position than most people to know what happens to people who try to hang on to this camera. You'd be well advised to hand it over. You're the smoothest con man I ever met. Now get lost before I take you in for a loitering. Now, come in. Sit down. Make it fast, Barrett. What do you got? Commissioner... This camera is the greatest crime prevention device that's ever been invented. What? Oh, Barrett. Please, Commissioner, listen. You must know that I came up with the guys who stuck up the Intercoastal Bank and those mugs who beat up that girl in the office of the Carlin Detective Agency. I know that. I did it with this camera. Now, look, I'll prove it to you, Commissioner. I'm going to pull a picture out right now. Here. I'm going to pull it out lay it on your desk. Uh, that's not going to prove anything. Here, you, you just look at it. And then tell me what you think of this camera. Well, convinced? Yeah, yeah, you've convinced me, Barrett. Francie, you and Sergeant White come on in here. I want to put Inspector Barrett under arrest. Uh, arrest? Well, well, what's the charge? Murder one. According to this picture, you've killed this man in his office. What? Well, take a look. Picture's clear as a bell. That's you standing over what looks like a very dead man. I don't know how you got past my secretary. Ah, uh, my card, Commissioner. Uh, Nick Scarlett. Interpol? Yes, that's right. You see, Commissioner, we've been after that camera that Barrett handed you for the past two months. <laughs> now, look, Mr. Scarlett, you're not going to tell me that Interpol... Was... Uh, the camera was used to smuggle heroin. Oh, yes. Very clever arrangement behind the shutters. Very clever. I'll give you a receipt and take it along, if you don't mind. No, no, not at all. Just as long as you leave me the picture that Barrett took when he was killing Johnny Carlin. Oh, Commissioner... That will be my pleasure. I often wonder where that camera is today. Sometimes I think that it may be used by St. Peter when an applicant stands at his gate demanding admission to heaven. Perhaps St. Peter pulls out a picture which would effectively silence a sinner who hadn't been caught by the law here on earth. Would you love to know the future? To be able to see exactly what's going to happen to you tomorrow, next week, next year? I hear a chorus of no's. It would be unbearable to know the exact date you're going to die or be mugged or be involved in a fatal accident. I agree. But I leave you with this. Why do so many people consult 
fortune tellers. Our cast included Nick Pryor, Terry Keene, Joan Lovejoy, Joseph Julian, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams. Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents. Marshall, bidding you welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of mystery. This is a tale of young love. The love of a charming young man for a charming young girl. It is also the story of a mother's love for her child. As you can see, this story is positively dripping with love. But don't be dismayed, because love like a door, has two sides. And when the other side is hatred, it can drip with venom and gore. You're a liar, Mr. Snowden. Don't you think I know what you are? You're wrong, Mrs. Daniels. I love your daughter. Why? Because I do, that's all. You can't explain something like that. Listen to me, young man. Even her own father couldn't bear to look at Bonnie's face. That's why he left her so much money, because he felt guilty for what he felt for his own poor, homely daughter. Mrs. Daniels, listen to me. You're a liar. A liar. And a thief. Our mystery drama, The Locked Room, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Jack Grimes and Corrine Orr. It is sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Oh, somebody's been drinking my sugar-free diet 7-Up, and it's all good. Well, actually, I saved a little. Oh, a bear. Hiya, Goldie. What's brewing? That's Miss Goldilocks to you. Oh, come on, kid. You mean you don't remember me? The cottage, the three chairs, the <gasps> porridge? Baby bear. In the fur. Been a long time, Goldie. But baby bear. Just call me BB. You drank all the sugar-free diet 7-Up, and I have to conduct another diet drink taste test today. Oh, well, yeah. I saw the sign on the door, a professional taste tester. Huh? But how can I conduct my taste test now? Why bother? I try those other diet drinks, too. You'll notice there's still plenty of them around. Why not ask me? Well, okay, B.B. Tell me, why did you drink all the sugar-free diet 7-Up? I like the taste. Light, fresh, natural, sugar-free diet 7-Up is definitely unbearably delicious. Mm hmm I don't know, but it's always something, isn't it? You just about get over paying for the holidays and... Uh, April 15th is staring you in the face again. Well, Don was griping about doing our taxes. What else is new? And I remembered hearing that CIT has an income tax service. So I said, uh, look, honey, unless you enjoy torturing yourself, uh, why don't you let CIT do our taxes? Well, I guess I caught him at a weak moment. Because uh, that's just what he did. You know, he came home all smiles, said they were fast, computerized, uh, had a $5 minimum charge... 
and saved him a lot of time and aggravation. And if he needed extra cash, he, he could have applied for a unit loan right there at CIT. Don said the CIT man was so nice, it was almost a pleasure doing the taxes. <laughs> almost. CIT makes money happen. We really do. And they make doing taxes almost a pleasure. that winds its way into the hilly regions upstate. The hour is late, and the sleek white sports car whose hood ornament faces north is the only vehicle for miles around. Even the sound of its purring engine doesn't seem to disturb the quiet of the countryside. But inside the car, the sound level is something very different. <laughs> Davy, please, turn that down before I go deaf. Oh, what's the matter? Don't you like music? Yeah, that's why I'm trying to save my hearing. Okay, okay. Yeah, is that any better? Much. How much longer is this going to take? You said it was only 30 miles or so to the house, and we must have driven 50. We have not. You're not watching the mileage. Listen, there are so many gadgets on this dashboard, I wouldn't even know where the speedometer is. But you do like the car, don't you? Like it? Hey, Bonnie, do you know what I've been used to driving all my life? Second-hand pickup trucks. That's about all uh, our folks could afford. I hated this car at first when Mother gave it to me. I mean, she must have thought it was whatever young girl wanted on her 17th birthday. But the truth is, I was scared to think of it. Well, why should you be? I don't know. Just what? It always felt like it was running away with me. Ah, oh, but now you're running away with it and me. Oh, I don't think that way. I don't feel we're running away, baby. Oh, of course not, Kip. Not it was just a figure of speech. Baby, look! Hmm? We're almost there. Oh, there's the old red barn I told you about. Hey, great. Uh, do I make a right here? Yeah, a sharp right. And then straight up the hill until you come to the side. Is it still there? It was the last time you were here, anyway. About ten years? <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, that's right. I was only eight when we left. Oh. Davy, there it is. You can see the chimneys. Oh, wow. Yeah, how many chimneys does the house have? <laughs> it seems like hundreds. It was a fireplace in every room except the bathroom. Wait till you see it, Davy. Oh, just wait. Well, there it is. What do you think? Now, that's what I call a real funky old house. How big is that place? It has four floors, and I guess about a... Oh, 30 or 40 rooms. I never counted them. All those rooms and nobody living in them? I know. It does seem like a terrible waste, doesn't it? Oh, Bonnie, you're speaking to one room, Davy Snowden, remember? The only place I lived in my whole life with more than one room was the farmhouse. Yeah, well, that had three. Oh, I wish you wouldn't keep talking about that. I mean, you know, how poor you were. <laughs> okay, kitten. Rich little girls get to feeling guilty when they hear stuff like that. Uh, look, let's not uh, sit out in the car all night, huh? Let's go look at that old haunted house. It is not a haunted house. Uh, you sure you got the key now? Yeah, right here in my purse. Uh, and, and the lights are working? I told you, we rent the place every summer. We have to keep the electricity turned on. Well, let's go then. light switch right near the door. Yeah, here it is. There. Look at the size of this place. I know. It's a terrible old barn of a place. That's what my father called it. When he died, well, Mother just thought it was foolish, the two of us living here all by ourselves. Looks kind of run down. I'm afraid it is. But the foundation is still solid. Uh, plenty of furniture. Hey, uh, come on, show me the rest of the house, huh? What would you like to see first? Well, upstairs. That's where the bedrooms are, right? Yes. Well, that's the first thing we have to do. Decide which bedroom we want. Oh, Davy. Do you love me, Bonnie? Oh, you know I do. Say it. I love you. Say, I love you, Davy. I love you, Davy. Well, in that case, let's pick out the bedroom. How many choices do we have? At least ten. 
Oh, it might take us all night. Come on. <laughs> Take a look at that one. It's too yet gloomy. That was my mother's room. You mean your folks had their own room? That's right. Well, maybe that's how they do things when you're rich. But me, I'm just a country boy. Now, let's see about this door. Hey, uh, this one's stuck. No, it's locked. It's always been locked. Well, what for? I don't know. Well, what's behind it? A, another bedroom? Honestly, I don't have the faintest idea. It's been locked ever since I can remember. Daddy once told me never to go near this room. I want you to remember my mother talking about it, sort of nervously. Oh, that sounds very mysterious. Yeah, what do you say we break it in, huh? Oh, Davey, no, we can't do that. Well, gee, aren't you curious? Maybe it's full of hanging women, like in Bluebeard's castle. Or maybe that's where the family jewels are hidden. Oh, let's leave it alone, Davey. I was always scared of that door. Yeah, but what's it locked for? Seems to me when a door is locked, that means there's something pretty interesting behind it. Stands to reason, right? Well, I'm sure it's just some old storeroom or something. Bonnie, listen, there could be something valuable in there, something worth money. And since the house is yours, I mean, this is your house, isn't it? Your father left it to you, didn't he? Yes. Well, if there's anything valuable in there, it belongs to you. Oh, Davy, all those promises not to talk about money. I'm not talking about your mother's money. I'm talking about what's yours, rightfully yours. But... The house isn't really mine. Not yet. Not until I'm 21, and that's almost four years from now. Now, don't be technical. Oh, Davy. Okay. Oh, okay, if that's how you feel about it. we got plenty of time, anyway. Davy, remember what you said about the fire? Uh, it's getting late, Bonnie. Uh, don't you think we should be in bed? Couldn't we have a fire first, please? Sure. Anything you say. We want this night to be perfect, don't we? Yeah, I guess I am a little like that. Boastful about my poor childhood. As if it's a badge of honor or something. Uh-huh. Uh, we didn't light fires because they were cozy and romantic, only because they made us warm. They're not very warm at that. Mm. Locked rooms. Yeah, that's really something. A locked room. The only room in our place that had a lock on it was the outhouse. And even that didn't work. Hey, you asleep? Hey, kitten, wake up. It's time to go to bed. Come on, Bonnie, wake up. Hey, what's that? Pete's sake, there's a car outside. Hey, Bonnie, wake up. There's somebody coming up. What? We got company. Oh, no. Well, who is it? Oh, Davy, it can't be. Yes. That's your car outside. You can see it through the window. You mean it's a neighbor or something? No. It's my mother. Oh, wow. Oh, I have to let her in. She knows I'm here. She's on my car outside. Oh. I'm surprised you two aren't in bed already. That was the general idea, wasn't it? Mother, please, let me explain. I suppose you're David Snowden. Uh, yes, I am, Mrs. Daniels. I see we have no trouble recognizing each other. Bonnie, fix your clothes. They're a mess. I, I was just lying on the rug in front of the fireplace. Yes, I've, um, I've heard all about you, Mr. Snowden. Thank goodness I had the sense to think of this place when Bonnie didn't show up at home. You have it all wrong, Mother. Davy, tell her. Mrs. Daniels. Never mind. Please. I understand everything. I was afraid something like this might happen as soon as Bonnie started mentioning you in her letters from school. Uh, Bonnie, get your things. We're going home. Mrs. Daniels, listen to me. Sorry to break up your party, young man. We're married, Mrs. Daniels. What did you say? Bonnie and I were married this afternoon. I've got the license right here. It's uh, true, Mother. We, we were married in Elkton. That, that can't be. You're underage. Not in Elkton, Mother. Eighteen is old enough. I... Davy and I are married, so you can't tell us what to do. For the love of heaven. I, uh... I think I have to sit down. Oh, well, here, Mrs. Daniels. I'll just get the sheet off this chair Mother, here. please try to understand. I... I understand, Bonnie. I... I went through a dozen Davies when I was your age. Oh, Bonnie. Oh... Oh, my poor Bonnie. Well, now, you, you don't have to feel sorry for her, Mrs. Daniels. Don't I? 
No, be- because I love her. I suppose you have no money. Mother! Be quiet. No, Mrs. Daniels. My family were farm people. My father's dead, my mother's alive, but I don't even know where. But you don't have to worry about that, Mrs. Daniels. I didn't marry your daughter because of money. Didn't you? No, I didn't. Bonnie and I talked about it. I almost didn't marry her because of that, because of what people like you would say. You're a liar, Mr. Snowden. Don't you think I know what you are? You're wrong, Mrs. Daniels. I love your daughter. Why? Because I do, that's all. You can't explain something like that. Listen to me, young man. Even her own father couldn't bear to look at Bonnie's face. That's why he left her so much money, because he felt guilty at what he felt for his own poor, homely daughter. Oh, Mother, don't please. Mrs. Daniels, listen to me. You're a liar. A liar. And a thief. Stop it. Stop it. You've got a smooth tongue, Mr. Snowden. A, A handsome face and a smooth tongue. And I'm sure you've convinced my daughter that you're utterly sincere. <laughs> but it's only her heart you want to steal, not her fortune. I love Bonnie. That's all there is to it. We're married and there's nothing you can do about it. You're quite wrong. There's everything in the world I can do about it. I intend to have this marriage annulled immediately. You can't do that. You have no idea how much money can do, young man. Bonnie, I'm, um, I'm going home now and I want you to come with me. No, no, I Don't won't. Don't make it any worse than it is now. I won't go with you. You, uh, see how it is, Mrs. Daniels? Yes. I see how it is. Very well, Bonnie. But you'll regret this. Mark my word. Mother, I can't live without Davy. If you make us separate, I'll never forgive you. You will, darling. Strangely enough. I'll kill myself. Do you hear, Mother? I'll kill myself if you do this. Now, don't talk nonsense. You think your heart will break. (laughs) But it won't. A heart doesn't break. It withers. That's what I don't want you to find out. (sighs) Goodbye, Bonnie. I mean it! I'll kill myself! Oh, Davy. <laughs> As Shakespeare informed us, the course of true love never did go smooth. And perhaps the same applies to the course of untrue love. But let's not judge the sincerity of young Davy Snowden just yet. Let's wait and see what happens next to the newlyweds when we return shortly with Act Two. And now, another story of the ball and chain as Kellogg's Special K presents The Library. Welcome to the public library. May I help you, sir? Uh, Yes, I'd like to check out... Uh, I'd like to check out Famous Laundromats of the World by Audrey Schnorbart. Sir, excuse me, but isn't that ball and chain you're wearing just like the ones they use in the Kellogg Special K commercial? Uh, this ball and chain? Shh. Yes, that one. How are you going to get rid of it? Well, you know, lots of good exercises, and by eating smart at every meal, starting with the Special K breakfast. Don't you have to watch your calories? Yes, and the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories. Less than 240 calories? Right. A one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's really tasty, and it's going to help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'd say it's (laughs) long overdue, get it? (laughs) Your happy ending could begin with the Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. You're probably well aware of the advantages of a well-tuned car in helping you obtain better gas mileage. A well-tuned car can run more efficiently, more economically. If all cars were properly tuned and operating efficiently, we could save millions of gallons of gas. To help you evaluate your car's efficiency, your participating GM dealer has two new energy checks available. One is an economy checkup that includes an engine diagnosis along with several other inspections to see if your car is up to specs. The other is an economy tune-up to help give you a smooth running engine that performs efficiently. Making the most out of the gasoline around is one of our country's basic challenges. It's important to you and to us at General Motors. That's why we're inviting everyone to come in now for a GM energy check at a Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, or Cadillac dealer. Get together with him and get more of a run for your money.
Now let's return to the locked room. The door we're looking at right now isn't the door to the old Daniels mansion upstate. This door is reached by walking up several long flights of stairs before you can read the faded numerals 4G. Are we there, Davy? Yeah, honey, here we are. Hey, you're wounded pretty bad. No, I'm all right. I warned you that I'm not very strong. And I warned you that a fourth floor walk up is no fun. We don't have anywhere else to go, Davy. Yeah, I know that, all right. Well, brace yourself. Here's the uh, Snowden residence. I uh, suppose I should carry you over the threshold. Well, come on in, come on in. Don't just stare at it. It's uh, not at all bad, Davy. Really. Oh, you don't have to say that. Don't, don't say anything except I love you. That's always nice to hear. You know that I love you, Davy. Then close the door and show me. Oh, Davy. Uh, Davy, I, I'm so worried. Yeah, yeah, I knew that my room would affect you that way. I don't care about the room. Anywhere is all right if I'm with you. We'll get along, and then I'll have the money my father left me. Yeah, yeah, and three years, if you survive that long. I'm sure my mother will change her mind about us. I'm sure of it. As soon as she gets to know you... Oh, Bonnie, couldn't you tell? It was hate at first sight. She took one look at me, and it was hate kill. Davy, do you think she can really do what she said? Get her marriage annulled? I don't know. It was a legal marriage. I mean, you didn't need parental consent in that state. But she's so smart about such things. She's been my father's company since he died. She has all these lawyers on her payroll. Stop worrying about it, Bonnie. But what if she could do it? I couldn't stand that, Davy. Stop worrying, I said. You got one thing going for you, Kitten, and that makes all the difference in the world. Your mother loves you. She wouldn't hurt you for anything. Davy, tell me the truth. Do, do you think I'm homely? I think you're beautiful. Oh, I know that isn't true, but I'm not really repulsive, am I? <laughs> Are you kidding? Come here. Oh, Davy. Uh... It's true about my father. I know that. He was so disappointed that I wasn't pretty. He must have needed glasses. <laughs> Who's that? Nobody even knows I'm here. Hmm. Hello? Is this Mr. Davis Snowden? Uh, yeah, that's right. Who, who, who's this? My name is Hedinger, Mr. Snowden. I'm an attorney, Hedinger and Doles. Uh, we're on Vanderbilt Street. Yeah, so? One of my clients is Mrs. Harriet Daniels. I'm uh, sure the name is familiar to you. Uh, yes, I've heard of her. I was wondering if we couldn't get together to discuss a certain matter uh, regarding her daughter, Bonnie. Uh, you mean my wife, Bonnie? Who is that, Davy? Yes, that's right. I wonder if it would be convenient for you to come to my office uh, sometime this afternoon. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Hedinger, but Mrs. Snowden and myself are a little busy at the moment. Well, um, what about tomorrow, then? Would that be possible? Is it my mother's lawyer? Yeah, one of them anyway. I beg your pardon? Uh... Uh, all, all right, Mr. Hedinger. I'll, I'll, I'll come to your office tomorrow. Uh, say, uh, about 10 o'clock? That would be just fine. The address is 50 Vanderbilt. We're on the 21st floor. I'll be there. Well, it looks like the fun is starting. Oh, Daisy. Please sit down, Mr. Snowden. I think you know the situation as well as I do. And uh, you've probably anticipated my first question. Well, I'm not sure I have, unless it's, uh, why don't I just go away and stop bothering her daughter? It's uh, something like that. But it would be hardly sensible to expect you to do such a thing without um, incentive. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't, don't tell me I'm about to get an offer, a, a money offer. Nobody's talking about a bribe, I assure you. There's a practical reason for such an offer. Annulment proceedings, no matter how certain we are of success, cost money. Mrs. Daniels could actually realize quite a savings if you cooperated for some uh, flat figure, um, say $5,000. Not unreasonable of her. 
Uh, do me a favor, huh? You tell Mrs. Daniels that I wouldn't give up my marriage license for one million bucks. I notice you specify one million. So long, Mr. Hedinger. Uh, please sit down. Huh? That wasn't all I had to tell you. Okay. What else is there? We can sue for annulment on a few other bases. Such as what? Falsification of your marriage certificate, for instance. Falsification? What the heck are you talking about? Your uh, age, for instance. You're not 24, Mr. Snowden. You happen to be 30. Well, what's so important about that, for Pete's sake? You gave your age as uh, 24. Well, so what? Everybody knocks a few years off their age at some time or other. It's uh, it's just business. Let's see. Um, your business is freight forwarding, isn't it? You work in a three-man company at a salary of $145 a week. <laughs> Surely you didn't think it was necessary to uh, dye your hair or anything like that for the sake of... Uh, Executive advancement. Look, Mr. Hedinger, first of all, I'm 29, not 30. I'm a few days premature, I suppose. You'll be 30 next week, won't you? Happy birthday, in case I don't see you. I just didn't want Bonnie to think I was too old for her. Don't make everything so difficult, Mr. Snowden, because you know how it's going to end. Mrs. Daniels is the most determined woman you've ever met in your life. She, uh scares the pants off me, I can tell you. Oh, well, that's your problem. If she has to spend a million dollars to get Bonnie out of your clutches, she'll do it. I'll guarantee you 10000 if you'll sign an agreement. I'm sorry, Mr. Hedinger. No can do. You're a stupid boy. Do you know that? Uh, sorry, I take that back. A stupid man. So long, Mr. Hedinger. Give my best to Bonnie's mother. And tell her we're both very happy. Oh, Davy, it's horrible. We don't have a chance. I know we don't. Well, it doesn't look good, that's for sure. You should have told me the truth. You should have told me you were really 27. Well, I, I, I don't know. I just... I just didn't want you to think that I was still an undergraduate at that age. Oh, there's got to be some way out, Davy. There has to be... If you could just talk to her. She won't give me the chance. She's made up her mind that all I want is your lousy money. Well, what if there wasn't any money? What if I was on the way to rights to the money my father left me? That would make her believe us, wouldn't it? Well, I, well that's uh, uh, pretty drastic, Kitten. I, I mean, that money is yours. Uh, you know, when you come of age, you're entitled to it. But I don't care about money, Davy. Well, you, you don't now, maybe, but later... Uh, I, I couldn't have you making that kind of sacrifice for me. Bonnie, you'd probably hate me for it later. Oh, I could never hate you. I love you so much. I think I'll love you after I'm dead. Davy? Davy, what are you thinking? Nothing. Davy? You don't care about the money, do you? Please talk to me. Bonnie, I have an idea. I have a, a very crazy, very good idea. About what? Well, I wouldn't blame you for not going through with it. I, I, I'd understand. But what is it? You remember what you said, uh, what you told the old... Yeah, what you told your mother up at the house about your killing yourself? Yeah, I, I remember. Well, she didn't believe you, of course. Uh, what if your mother really thought you were serious about killing yourself... Wouldn't that make her change her mind in a hurry? Well, yeah, I suppose it would, but we, we could never fool her about such a thing. Ah, no, no, if we were smart, we could. No, she's smarter than both of us put together. I know her, Davy. There's just no fooling no, her. Wait a, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Don't throw it away so fast. Let, let's talk about it. Let's think for a minute. But it just wouldn't work. Yeah, but if you really did try, Bonnie, only you didn't. Try too hard, only, only enough to make it look good. Well, how can I do that? There's a couple of ways. Uh, gas, for instance. We could fix up a phony gas suicide. Bonnie, well, don't look like that. I, I'm sorry. All right, forget it. Forget I ever said it. No. No, go on. It could be something like um, sleeping pills. You've got sleeping pills, haven't you? 
Yeah, I, I have. What, you, you wouldn't have to take more than two? You, I mean, maybe, maybe three. Now, that won't hurt at all. And, and we'd make you think you took the whole bottle. Now, don't you see how easy that would be? Yes. I, I suppose so. Oh, baby, hold me, please. Oh, kitten, you could write your mother a letter. You could tell her what you were planning to do, but that I don't know about it, see? You could say you were going to swallow the whole bottle of pills. But you'll actually take just a few. Then when your mother shows up here... I'm so scared, Davy. I promise you nothing will happen except that your mother will know that you meant it, Bonnie. About loving me so much. You do love me, don't you? Yes. Yes, Davy. I do. I do. There's another famous saying about love. That it conquers all. Presumably, that includes time, distance, and mothers-in-law. But will love and deception succeed together? We'll find out shortly when I return with Act Three. Ever had a tall, frosty glass of amplitude? Well, if your beer is Budweiser, you've had it often. Amplitude is a fancy word for the entire taste phenomenon, the total experience of flavor. Next time you take a healthy swallow of Bud, watch what happens. Think about the sensations you're experiencing. Notice how the flavor of Bud comes on nice and easy. Not too strong, not too quick, just right. Notice the clean, crisp togetherness of Bud's taste. Everything in perfect balance, with no single element jumping out at you. And there'll be no aftertaste either, no hanging on. And you'll be refreshed and ready for another glassful. Actually, Bud drinkers have been experiencing amplitude for years, but they never phrase it that way. They just say, Budweiser, and that says it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. It's so good to see the green grass grow again After years of being careless Now the folks seem to know It's time to pitch in Time to pitch in We can breathe the fresher air There's more beauty everywhere Cause more people seem to care They're all pitching in We've got to pitch in To clean up America Association, P.O. Box 2570, Washington, D.C. Things seem very normal in apartment 4G. The one-room residence of the newlyweds, Bonnie and David Snowden. Music is playing on their transistor radio. A frozen dinner is thawing slowly, and Bonnie and David are hunched over the kitchen table, composing a letter. The only thing that makes this domestic scene a bit bizarre is that they are collaborating on a suicide note. Dear Mother, I warned you what I would do if you tried to get our marriage alone. Tonight, I'm going to take a whole bottle. Davy, hmm? do we have to have that music? Uh, okay, okay. I, I didn't know it was bothering you. I'm nervous enough as it is. Okay, I said. Dear Mother, I warned you what I would do if you tried to get our marriage annulled. Tonight, I'm going to take a whole bottle of sleeping pills. Oh, Davy, hmm? it just doesn't sound right. Uh, it's, it's not so bad, Bonnie. Uh, look, maybe you'd better put in something about me not knowing about it. Uh, I, I think that's important that your mother realizes that I had no idea you were going to try to take your life. Well, maybe you better write it, Davy. I'm just no good at this sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I guess you don't have uh, much experience writing suicide notes. Well, I, I, I just can't help feeling it's wrong. 
Wrong what? How? Well, you know. No, 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 I don't. The only thing that could be wrong about it is if it, if it didn't work, but... Okay, if, if you've got cold feet, okay, we'll let your mother go through with it. We'll let that lawyer, Hedinger, get our marriage and know. Is that what you want? Well, you know it isn't. And have you got a better idea than this, have you? No. And tell me what you want to do, Bonnie. You, you name it. Well, just tell me what to write in the letter. Well, the first line is okay. I mean, after that, I, I think you should say, um... Davy doesn't know I'm doing this. I didn't want anyone to know so that nobody would stop me. Wait a minute. Not so fast. Wait, well, you don't have to put it down exactly the way I said it. Make it sound like yourself, you know. Yeah, I- I'll try. And, uh, what else? Uh, oh, yeah, say something about I'm doing this because I love Davy, because I, I-, I can't live without him. Yes. That'll make her understand. You see, she'll realize that you might try to kill yourself again if she broke us up. And if she loves you, she won't want that to happen, Bonnie. You see? Yes, yes. Hey, come on. You're getting tears all over the letter. Oh, Davy. Go on, Bonnie. Now, now, sign it. That's right. That's just perfect. Now, you got the envelope? Here. Okay, if I get it into the mail now, she'll have it tomorrow morning. Now, she's sure to phone here as soon as she receives it. Davy, she might even call the police. Oh, it doesn't matter who she calls. Police, the doctor, it'll be okay. I mean, you'll, you'll really be asleep, Bonnie. You, you'll take just enough pills to put you into a nice, deep sleep. Understand? Yes. I understand. Now, I'll be right back, sweetheart. I'll just run downstairs and mail this, huh? All right, Davy, but, but hurry, hurry back... I, I don't want to be alone. What time is it, Davy? Hmm? Uh, 9.15. Do, do you think Mother got the letter this morning? Well, you never know with the post office these days. But it could happen. Even if the letter gets there, she might not be home. She might have left the house early. Doesn't matter, Bonnie. Sooner or later, she'll see it. Well, I, I just don't think it's going to work, Davy. There. That must be her. Do, do, do you think it is, really? Well, there's no doubt about it. I don't know anybody who'd call me this early in the morning. Well, how, how about the people at your office? No, 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 no. I'm away on a two-week honeymoon, remember? They don't even know I'm in town. Well, Davy, shouldn't you ask her? No, Kit, no. Don't you understand? She's got to get worried enough to do something. And you've got something to do, too. You mean, take those pills? That's right, Bonnie. Hey, you see? She stopped calling. She's probably on her way over here right now. Uh, get the pills, Bonnie. Yes. I have them right here. There are only three of them. Yeah, yeah. Get you. A glass of water. All right. Davy, you're sure it'll be all right? I'm sure, Bonnie. It takes like a dozen of these things to hurt you. You just take a couple. Yeah, no, you better make it all three, just to make sure you're fast asleep when your mother gets here. She's only about half an hour away. Well, that's time enough if you take them now. Yeah, all right. You can trust me, Bonnie, you know that. I won't let anything happen to you. Yeah, uh, I know that. I know that, Davy. Okay, now, come on, take the pills, sweetheart. Yes. There. That wasn't so hard, was it? No. Now all you have to do is go back to bed. Go to bed and to sleep. That won't be so hard either. Even without the pills. I slept so badly last night. Yeah, I know. Davy? Yes, kitten? Please kiss me. Kiss me. Good night. One second. Oh, Mrs. Daniels. Where is she? Where's Bonnie? Well, not to take it easy. She's sleeping. Is she all right? Well, what are you talking about? Of course she's all right. She's just asleep. She likes to sleep a little late in the morning, that's all. Bonnie? Bonnie? Hey, now, what, what do you think you're doing, Mrs. Daniels? Let her sleep, would you? She's had a bad night. Look. Look at her color. Look at her. Can't you see this isn't normal? 
Well, she's always a little pale, so what? Bonnie. Bonnie, can you hear me? It's it's Mother. Oh, dear God. Hey, what's the matter with you? You idiot. Where were you? I phoned here about an hour ago. The phone just rang and rang. I was and... out. I went out to get the paper. I just got back a couple of minutes ago. Oh, Bonnie, darling. Wake up. Wake up. Oh, why didn't I call somebody? Why didn't I call a doctor? A doctor? What for? Here. Read this. Well, what is it? Where's your telephone? Where is it? Good Lord, this letter is... We need a doctor, you idiot. Bonnie, maybe... Oh, no. Mrs. Daniels. It's... Huh? She's dead. She's dead. Oh, she can't be. She's just sleeping, Mrs. Daniels. She... She took the pills. All, all those pills. There weren't that many in that bottle. Maybe, maybe she'll be okay. If, I'll, I'll get the doctor. It's too late. It's too late. Dad, I tell you. Bonnie. Bonnie, wake up, kid. Wake up. It, it, it's all right. Everything is all right. Bonnie, for Pete's sake, it, 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 it's all over now. You, you've got to wake up. Oh, she, she's so cold. Bonnie, wake up. Leave her alone. Can't you leave that, that poor girl alone? Even now. Mrs. Daniels, I swear there weren't many pills in that bottle. It wouldn't have taken many. Not with Bonnie's heart. It wouldn't take us. Well, it wouldn't take many. What are you talking about? Bonnie had rheumatic fever when she was 12. Her heart's been weak ever since. No. No. <laughs> Barney, please. Please. You've got to wake up. Hello. Mr. Snowden? Yes. Walter Hedinger. You uh, remember me, I trust. Yes, I remember you. Sorry to disturb you. I realize that you're still in uh, mourning, of course. What do you want? I was wondering if you might be able to attend a meeting in our offices at uh, 10.30 tomorrow. A meeting? What for? It concerns your wife's estate. Now, what are you talking about? I've got nothing to do with my wife's estate, and you know it. Bonnie wasn't dead two weeks, and I got a letter from you telling me so. Well, there is still something that Mrs. Daniels wishes to discuss with you. Something uh, beyond the, um, shall I say, the legality of the situation. Look, if Mrs. Daniels thinks she can make some kind of trouble for me... No, 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 no. It's nothing of the kind. Uh, don't try to kid me. She still blames me for Bonnie's death. She'd do anything she could to hurt me. I assure you, Mr. Snowden, it's to your advantage to attend the meeting tomorrow. My advantage? That's correct. Because I can promise you one thing. Mrs. Daniels wants to do the right thing. Please come in, Mr. Snowden. Yes, yes. Uh, how are you, Mrs. Daniels? I'm as well as I can be, thank you. Yes, of course. Don't look stricken, young man. Nobody's going to hurt you. Have a chair. Um, uh, thank you. Well, let's get started, shall we? Mrs. Daniels, as you know, we've already informed Mr. Snowden that he has no legal claims on your daughter's estate. Yeah, I uh, know all about that. But did you explain why? You see, Bonnie's inheritance from my late husband wasn't due until she reached the age of 21. Since her death, it automatically reverts to me. I didn't expect anything, Mrs. Daniels. A very kind of you, I'm sure. However, Mr. Snowden, the fact that you did marry Bonnie imposes a certain kind of obligation on me. Some kind of gesture regarding your welfare. I don't understand. Mr. Snowden, you seemed most impressed by that old house we own upstate. You recall the one I mean? Yes, uh, of course. It was once valued at a great deal of money. And it's yours. Uh, what was that? I'm deeding you the property. It would have been Bonnie's in a few more years. I have no further use for it. You may have complete possession of the land, the house, and everything in it. Everything? 
You, you, you really mean everything? Of course. Mr. Hedinger will see to the formalities. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go. Well, gee, Mrs. Daniels, Please I... don't thank me. I can stand anything from you now except gratitude. Good day. Well, let's uh, take care of the details. Uh, Mr. Hedinger, c- could I uh, ask just one question? Yes? When Mrs. Daniels said I could have everything in that house... Uh, well, there, there are certain places, there are locked rooms and, and, and things like that. A- am I entitled to all of the contents? You're entitled to every stick in the place, Mr. Snowden. In fact, uh, Mrs. Daniels left you this full set of keys. It. It's all mine. The whole house, mine. God knows how much it's worth. Yeah, sure, it's run down, but uh, the furniture alone. Now, uh, where's that light switch? Yeah, here it is. Yeah, what did Bonnie call it? A terrible old bomb. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's all mine, sweetheart. It's Davy's bar now. Maybe it's not a million bucks, but it's something. Now, where are the rest of those keys? A dozen keys, but one of them must open that door. Yeah, one of them will do it, so let's just get going, baby boy. That was really something her giving me this house. I don't know, bless the bleach, I guess. I gotta give the lady credit. She's got class. Now, let's see. It wasn't this floor. No, it was the next. That'd be a very good reason for locking up a room. There's got to be something very valuable inside. Yeah, that's the door. That's the one. Okay, now to find the key. <laughs> no, no, not that one. This is... No, it's obviously too small. How about this one? No, nope, that didn't do it. This one's too big. No, not yet. I hope it's here. The lawyer said they were all here. I'll try this one. Well, it slipped in all right, but will it turn? Wait a minute. It's stuck, but I think it's going to do it. I think it's going to work. Uh-uh. That did it. That did it. The lock's open. All I got to do is open the door. Uh, pretty dark in there. Shades are down. Uh-huh. What? I see a lamp over there. Some more sherry, Walter? Uh, uh no, thank you, Mrs. Daniels. Oh, stop looking so grim, Walter. Sit back and relax. Uh, Mrs. Daniels, I can't help but worry about, uh, about what happened. Worry? About that scoundrel? You know what I mean. When that police lieutenant questioned me about Snowden's death, well, I didn't actually lie to him, but I didn't tell him the whole truth either. You were completely honest, Walter. I'm sure you were. No, I wasn't. You see, I'm absolutely sure you knew what you were doing when you deeded that house to him. Of course I knew what I was doing. I was being generous. But you knew what would happen, didn't you? Yes, Walter, I knew. I knew there was no treasure behind that door. Only the rotten floorboards that made us shut up the room 15 years ago. I used to argue with my husband about it. I used to say that we should have the floor repaired before someone fell through to the basement. But he was a strangely miserly man sometimes. Not nearly as generous as I am. Now drink your sherry, Walter. Well, what can you say about an 18-year-old girl who dies? Or her 30-year-old lover, for that matter? Regretfully, this love story has ended with both the lovers gone which ought to make it twice as popular as the movie. I'll be back shortly. 
who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems. The Better Business Bureau knows. Wednesday, 10 o'clock. I'm back at the office working on the case when my secretary brings me the mail. Thanks, kid. The usual stuff. Then I see it. It's addressed to me, resident. Inside, a fake rabbit's foot. The pitch, a two-dollar donation or send back the rabbit's foot. My problem, what to do about it. I'll help you with good advice from the Better Business Bureau. Oh, yeah? Spill it. If you receive unordered merchandise in the mail, you are under no obligation to return it or pay for it. Thanks, pal. You're okay. Just another consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. David Snowden isn't the last victim you'll hear about on our radio mystery theater. We intend to bring you the final dying screams of many, many more. That's a specialty of radio, of course, which explains why we give all our actors scream tests. Our cast included Carmen Matthews, Corinne Orr, Jack Grimes, and Sidney Smith. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I know I'm no sort of expert, but can't you talk about your work with me? There's a reason for it, Lisa. There's a reason. Well, what? I told you, my... My nightmares, they're all visions in... Black and gray and slashes of red. <laughs> well, then if you won't talk about your paintings, why not tell me about your nightmares? You wouldn't enjoy hearing about them. Or rather, about it. It? I have only one nightmare. Just one, I have it. Virtually every night. Sometimes it follows me into the daylight. I can close my eyes and there it is. For years I've tried to destroy it by painting it. Not its details, just its colors. But the therapy hasn't worked. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall, opening the door to another tale of mystery and suspense, inviting you to open your ears and your mind to the world of terrifying imagination. You're about to be taken on an unusual museum tour. There won't be any Mona Lisa's on this tour, no Greek vases or Roman statuary, because this establishment specializes in only one kind of exhibit. And that's why our story is called The Murder Museum. You may have been to a murder museum like the one in our story, a house of wax, where the most brutal crimes of the century are recreated in paraffin for the wide-eyed enjoyment of the public. But now you're going to have the unique opportunity of hearing one of the most shocking exhibits of all speak for itself. Oh, John, please believe me. He means nothing to me. I... Where is... And that's why he was in your bedroom, Ida. Is that oh, why? Please, please. Oh, think of our little boy. Look at Vincent. You're frightening him to death. Death? 
That's right, Otter. Death. Oh, That's what you deserve. Oh, no! Our mystery drama, The Murder Museum, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Michael Wager. Our tale begins inside the murder museum itself, the home of Professor Raphael Gallinari's House of Horrors. There's a fair-sized crowd in the museum today. As usual, they listen in fascination to the words of their tour guide as he takes them from one bloody exhibit to another, recreating for them the terrible crimes which have immortalized these criminals and their victims. But there is one person in the crowd who seems reluctant to listen to his words, who hangs back and shields her pretty eyes from the sight of the wax images. Her name is Lisa Brandon. To this day, no man knows the true identity of the madman known as Jack the Ripper. But the theory persists that he may well have been a physician or at least a medical student. Judging from the skill with which he wielded the instrument, you see clutched in his hand as he attached the terrified young woman. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes the tour of Professor Gallinari's Murder Museum. Thank you for your patronage, and please tell your friends about us. Sir, excuse me. Uh, yes, miss? Could I ask you a question? Well, yes, yes, of course. I, I was curious about the Raymond exhibit, but I see that you haven't opened it to the public. No, no, miss. The Raymond exhibit is still closed for repairs. Well, the truth is, it's the only reason I came to the murder museum. I wanted to see the Raymond. Oh, well, I'm sorry. The exhibit won't be open for another week, at least. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going out for some coffee. But even if it isn't completely ready, I wonder if you'd mind showing it to me. Oh, I'm sorry, miss. I can't do that. Well, I came a long way to see it, all the way from San Francisco. It would be a terrible disappointment. Look, I'm willing to pay you. No, please, put that money away, miss. <laughs> Why is it so important for you to see the Raymond? You, uh... Any connection with the family? Well, yes, in a way. I knew Vincent Raymond. I, I met him when he lived in San Francisco. I see. Look, you said you were going out for coffee. Could I come with you? Well, sure. I just go to this little coffee shop down the street, but you're welcome to come along. <laughs> artist, too? Uh, no, not really. But my brother owned a small art gallery on Green Street. And sold Raymond's paintings? Well, actually, no. He he didn't really care for Vincent's work. It was so dark and gloomy. Frightening, really. But he felt sorry for him, and he loaned him some money, and, and sometimes he let him help out in the gallery. And that's how you met him? Yes, that's right. I came home from college, and I met Vincent. I didn't know anything about him. Meaning, uh, about his parents. It took Vincent a long time before he was willing to talk to me about them. Vincent. Yeah? Isn't that music a little loud? Sorry, I'll, I'll turn it down. Are you angry with me or something? No, why? Why should I be? I don't know. You've hardly said two words to me tonight. All through dinner, we... I was trying to digest that rotten food. Whoever told me that restaurant was worth trying must have had a secret death wish. I didn't mind it. Had only one thing to recommend it. It was cheap. That's the only criterion I have, you I know? I didn't complain, did I? No, you never complain. You just suffer in silence. You think I'm some kind of gifted, starving artist who has to be tolerated for his poverty. Oh, you're so hard on yourself, Vincent. Well, let me tell you something, Lisa. I'm starving, but I'm not an artist. Well, let's not talk about it tonight. Let's just relax. You know I can't paint. Your brother knows it. I fill all my canvases with memories of my own nightmares, only you cannot call them art. Vincent, 
Why do you paint in such a gloomy style? I've never seen you paint with anything that had any color or lightness. All those blacks and grays and slashes of red. Oh, I, I know I'm no sort of expert, but can't you talk about your work with me? There's a reason for it, Lisa. There's a reason. For well, what? I told you, my... My nightmares, they're all visions in... Black and gray and flashes of red. <laughs> well, then if you won't talk about your paintings, why not tell me about your nightmares? You wouldn't enjoy hearing about them. Or rather, about it. It? I have only one nightmare. Just one. I have it virtually every night. Sometimes it follows me into the daylight. I can close my eyes and there it is. For years I've tried to destroy it by painting it. Not its details, just the colors. But the therapy hasn't worked. Please tell me about it. I've never told anyone before. But why not? Suppose I never met the person I wanted to confide in. Maybe now I have. But if I'm going to do that, this music has to stop. My mother's maiden name might mean nothing to you, but at one time, many years ago, it was famous among people who love the theater. She was an actress. Her name was Ada Krim. Ada Krim. I think I do know that name, Vincent. She was born and raised in England. She was known as the beautiful Ada. She didn't have a very long acting career because she capped her success on the stage with an even more successful marriage. She became the bride of John Lloyd Raymond. Your father? Yes. My father. He was a wealthy man. My grandfather had left him heir to one of the largest glass manufacturing companies in the West. Mirrored glass was his specialty. It seemed very appropriate to have our house full of mirrors. Maybe that's how it all started, that problem. What problem? Well, you know, the way mirrors are these after a few years go by, they stop being kind. And when that happened to my mother, she had to do something about it, something to prove that she was still the beautiful Ada. No matter what the mirrors were beginning to say. And what did she do, Vincent? She took lovers. Lovers are the best kind of mirrors for a bored rich woman. Were you the only child? Yeah. I was her only child. At first there was a pampered little boy, one of her favorite playthings. Then she became bored with me, too. She stopped noticing that I was around. Maybe that's why she never made any attempts to hide her actions from me. She simply didn't know I was there. Vincent, you saw these men? I... I think I've said enough. So you never found out what Vincent's dream was all about? Not then, I didn't, no. But you could have guessed, I suppose, if you knew the history of Ada Krim and John Raymond. Well, yes. I, I became curious enough to learn the history. I had a friend who worked in a newspaper, and she checked into the dead files and found the story for me, the whole terrible story. But, but I didn't tell Vincent that I knew about it. It was obvious that he didn't want anyone to know the truth. But one day it emerged. Oh. Well, it was a, a beautiful spring day, the first really warm day of the season, and Vincent and I went for a walk. Vincent, why don't we walk down to Ghirardelli Square? We could do some window shopping, maybe have some lunch. <laughs> Considering the state of my finances, we'd better window shop the restaurants, too. Oh, no, I have money. Good for you. Are you going to be you. stubborn again? I'm going to teach you a lesson. I tell you what, Grandpa, Vincent, I'll, I'll buy myself hospital. some lunch if you want to split a hamburger Wait with me. Wait a minute, don't fool can... around with me. Get those two. You need a lesson hey, of mine. Hey, you get away from her. About time somebody help get away from, from her. Help me, Perry. Hey, help you me. You take your hands off her. Please, Vincent, you don't. I don't give a... Stop it, Vincent. 
Sorry, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. I just went crazy. Why? What made you do it, Vincent? You could have killed that man. I couldn't stop myself when I saw what he was doing and what he was but going to do. But they were man and wife. Yeah. You... Man and wife. So were my parents. Was that the reason? Was it because you saw your mother and father quarrel? Quarrel? <laughs> you think that's all they did? Don't you know the truth yet? Yes. Vincent, I do know. I didn't want to tell you before, but I know that your father murdered your mother. And you know how he murdered her. My father came home early one night. A full day earlier than he was expected, he walked into my mother's bedroom and that man was there. Might have killed him too, but he was fast on his feet. We lived in a very old-fashioned house, these are quaint old fashioned Victorian manner, the kind that still had gas lamps on the wall and fire axes. <laughs> I used to hear my father joking to his friends about the fire axe on the wall. Don't, don't, don't talk about when it. When he saw my mother, he ripped the axe off the wall and he used it. Please. You read about it, Lisa, but I saw it. You what? I was six years old, terrified six-year-old who came to find out what all the noise was about. Oh, no. I saw the whole thing no. happen from the first stroke of the axe to the final blow. Oh. Now you know what my nightmare is all about, all the blacks and grays and flashes of red. Oh, you poor man. All right. Now I've told you the whole story, so... Maybe now you know why I can't see you again. What? Don't come near me again, do you hear me? Simpson! Don't come near me! Ever. It's been said that the mind is like a haunted house where the ghosts of the past rattle their chains and cry out their suffering. Of course, that's why we have our psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, and these days, even our exorcists. The house cleaners of the mind. But what will it take to free Vincent Raymond of his demons? Or can he ever be freed? We'll find out. And now, Act Two of the Murder Museum. Lisa Brandon has come all the way from San Francisco to see the Raymond exhibit. But she seems to be having a hard time talking the museum guide into allowing her a private showing. However, she hasn't given up. Yes. I was in love with Vincent Raymond, and I was terribly unhappy when he walked out of my life. You mean you never saw him again? Oh, yes. I, I saw him again, but, but things weren't the same between us. He was tormented by the memory of what he had seen, and it changed his life. The dreams began in the orphanage. They began there, and they never stopped. I, I woke up screaming in horror every time the dream came to me. <laughs> I became an outcast without friends, without sympathy. Oh, Vincent, I'm so sorry. That's when I realized that my only hope for any sort of life was keeping my secret. But you're not a child now. No, I'm older, Lisa, but nothing's changed for me. Oh, yeah. There's one thing that's changed. Well, what's that? I'm giving up my so-called art. I'm going to look for a job. Well, I'm sorry, Vincent. Because I did think you had talent. I've got to get some money to live on. My talent won't provide that. Well, I thought you had some savings. <laughs> They're all gone after that lawsuit. What lawsuit? That man I beat up on the street. He sued me for damages. He won, of course. His wife stood up in court and verified that I'd beaten him up with no provocation at all. Nothing like a wife's loyalty, is there? But, Vincent, why didn't you let me know? I would have been a witness oh, it for you. it mattered. Well, how are you living now? Well, on the welfare rolls, of course. But don't worry about me. Look, if I can lend you any no. money, it won't... no. I have borrowed enough from you and your brother. I don't want any more money or sympathy. Just leave me alone, Lisa. Can't you get that through your head? 
Leave me alone. He did find a job eventually, waiting on tables down at Fisherman's Wharf. He seemed to sink lower and lower every day. My brother and I tried to help him all we could, but he refused to take any more charity. I tried to sell his paintings by putting them in the window of our little gallery. But there was only one person who seemed interested in Vincent's gloomy efforts. Hello? May I help you? Uh, yes. I have been looking at the paintings in your window, uh, trying to make out the artist's name. Oh, his name is Raymond. Raymond? Would that be Vincent Raymond, by any chance? Well, yes, it is. Did you like the work? Mm, it's interesting, interesting. I'm an artist myself. But uh, that sort of thing, all those dark colors, it doesn't really appeal to me. Oh, I see. However, I am interested in the artist. I wonder if you could tell me how to reach him. Is he a local resident? Yes. He lives in San Francisco. Mm. Oh, would you mind telling me your name? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Here is my card. Raphael Gallinari. Uh, you might say that I am a portrait artist. Oh, and is that why you want to meet Vincent? To paint his portrait? <laughs> Something like that. Now, will you help me? All right. I'll tell you where you can reach him. Who is it? Raphael Gallinari. Who? Please open the door, Mr. Raymond. What do you want? May I speak to you for a few moments, Mr. Raymond? I don't know you. Oh, I thought perhaps the young lady in the art gallery might have mentioned my name to you. What young lady? Oh, you mean Lisa. Uh, may I come in, please? It's about a rather important matter. Oh. All right, come in. What is it you want, Mr... What was that name again? Uh, Gallinari. Uh, please, my car. What are you, some kind of bill collector? <laughs> no, no, Mr. Raymond. As a matter of fact... I'm an artist, like yourself. Tough luck for you, Mr. Gallinari, if you're an artist like me. Take a look around. You see any canvases in this place? I understand that you are working at a restaurant these days. That's right. Listen, if it's my work you're interested in, they're all at the gallery. Let me be honest with you, Mr. Raymond. It isn't your work I care about. It's mine. Yours? That is correct. You see, I am a portrait artist, a sculptor, actually. So what? This is how we differ in our talents. Yours is dependent on the quality of imagination, while mine is devoted to very similitude. If you would permit me, perhaps I can buy us both some dinner and we can talk about our art. If you hadn't mentioned dinner, Mr. Gallinari, I would have said no. <laughs> you know how it is with an artist. You know how we become obsessed sometimes, obsessed with a certain idea, a certain passion for a subject. No, Mr. Gallinari. I wouldn't know. I lost all my passion for art a long time ago. Ah, but if you had the inspiration, if there was one thing you wanted to paint more than anything else in the world, believe me, the passion would come flooding back like the tide. And do you, do you have such a subject in mind? Yes, I do. A subject which has haunted me for years, more years than I wish to count. And this has something to do with me? Everything to do with you. Uh, will you have another glass of wine? Sure, since you're buying. You see, Mr. Raymond, I am contemplating a certain work, a sculptural project. 
And one which would be impossible without you. How could that be? In order to answer that question, I have to bring up a subject which may be painful to you. A lot of subjects are painful to me, Mr. Gallinari. This one, I think, has left the deepest wound. Wait a minute. Yes, Mr. Raymond. I mean your parents. How do you know who I am? Did Lisa tell you? Oh, no, 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 no. No, I assure you, the young woman at the gallery said nothing at all to me about you. And how did you know, damn it? Because I've made it my business to find you. Believe me, it's taken a very long time. The last address I had for you was in the Midwest. Then I ran across one of your paintings in a traveling exhibit, the Moorland exhibit. Yeah, that was the only show I've been in, and nothing sold. I found out that you were in San Francisco from the proprietors of the exhibit. Finally, I saw your work in a little gallery on Green Street. Your style is unmistakable. Rotten, but unmistakable. Mr. Raymond, I remember the beautiful Ada. Go on. I'm quite a few years older than you. I have a very clear memory of how your mother looked on the stage before her retirement. I thought then that she was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Beauty is very fleeting, Mr. Gallinari. Like life itself. Yes, yes, I know that. But then, that's why artists are born, aren't they? To capture that fleeting beauty and... Imprison it on canvas or in clay or in what? Or in other media. Why don't you get to the point, Mr. Gallinari? Your mother's beauty is the point. If I had been the sculptor then that I am now, I would have carved her image then. But alas, I was only a boy. I still don't know what you want from me. I want to sculpt your mother's image, Mr. Raymond. But there is only one drawback. I have no model to work from. There's nothing I can do about that. My mother's been dead for 25 years. I know there are some faded old newspaper photographs of her, but they're not really helpful, not to someone who insists on very similitude. I don't see why it's so important. Who cares what Ada Krim looked like? But I care. Very much. You see, I've already started the project. You have? Yes. I've been using the crude photographs of her as a guide. I have obtained a sort of likeness. Look, I cannot stop you from doing what you please, Mr. Gallinari. If you're asking for my permission... Well, in a way, yes, I suppose I am. It does seem like a slight invasion of privacy. All right. If your conscience bothers you, I'll tell you what you can do. You can order another bottle of wine. Mr. Raymond, I would gladly order you a case if you would give me one more permission. What's that? To sculpt your father, too. My father? As I said, this is a form of obsession with me, but... From the moment I began work on the statue of Ada Krim, I felt that I couldn't stop until I had also done the head of John Lloyd Raymond. He's dead, Mr. Gallinari. I have no way to prevent you from sculpting him or painting him or anything else, but I'll tell you one thing. You won't get me to talk about him. Oh, no, 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 no. I would not dream of it. Uh... But, you see, I have a peculiar problem. While there are some likenesses of Ada Krim available, in the case of your father, well, I cannot find a single photograph. I have searched and come to a dead end. And what I was wondering, and I know I know this is an imposition, if there is something in your possession... You think I have a picture of... Him. It was only a hope. 
I know his memory is painful, but you were his son, and sometimes, well, there are souvenirs one hates to discard. Well, Mr. Raymond? I have pictures of him. You do? I won't give them to you. Uh, please, don't be so hasty. I won't give them to you. But I'll sell them to you. Oh, yes, of course. I'm perfectly willing to pay. I owe Lisa Brandon and her brother exactly $127. That's the price. Done, Mr. Raymond. $127. And I'll still throw in that case of wine. <laughs> told me about Mr. Gallinari's visit when he paid me back the money that we'd loaned him. He didn't really care about those photographs he had. He was happy to have gotten rid of the debt. But there was only one thing wrong. I, I think you must know what I mean. Yes, I think I do. Raphael Gallinari didn't tell Vincent Raymond the whole truth. No, he didn't tell him the truth. He didn't tell him what kind of a sculptor he was or what use he would make of his work after it was completed. Yeah. And obviously he didn't tell him the medium he would use to carve the statue. No. He didn't tell him that the medium would be whack. And that the subject would be murder. <laughs> And what happened when Vincent Raymond learned of the duplicity of Raphael Gallinari? Or was it really duplicity? Gallinari said he was a sculptor. Gallinari said he believed in authenticity. And of course, Gallinari paid for the privilege of using Vincent's photographs as a model. But has Gallinari paid enough? Act Three of the Murder Museum. For Vincent Raymond, all nights are the same. A dark passage into yesterday. A grim return trip to the past. But men must sleep, and sleepers must dream. So there's no escape for him. Harder! Oh, please believe me. Harder! And that's why he was in your bedroom, Ada. Please. Is that why? Please. Think of our little boy. Ada. Look at Vincent. You're frightening him to death. Death. That's right, Ada. Death. That's what you deserve. Oh, Ada. No. That's what you deserve. No. Oh. Oh, dear God. When will it stop? When will that dream stop? Who is it? It's me, Vincent. It's Lisa. Lisa? Oh, wait a minute. Hey, what is it? What are you doing here so early? I just couldn't wait. I've got wonderful news for you, Vincent. What about? Your painting, the large one in the window. It's been sold. Sold? You're joking. Who would buy it? Oh, please, let me come in. All right, all right. Just let me get a robe on. It happened first thing this morning. The gallery wasn't open more than ten minutes, and this man walked in. <laughs> Wearing a Homburg, Vincent. <laughs> I didn't think people wore Hombergs anymore. <laughs> he did. Well, who, who was he? What was his name? Well, he gave me a card. Oh, wait a minute. It's right here. I've got it in my purse. It, it wasn't someone named Gallinari, was it? What? Raphael Gallinari calls himself a sculptor? No, no, no. Oh, that... No, it wasn't him. It's, uh... Wait. His name is... Here it is. Charles Mulholland. Does that mean anything? Mulholland? That's... That's Mulholland Gallery in Chicago. Hi, Price. Oh, no, I doubt if there's any connection. Well, anyway, he bought it, Vincent, without any quibble about the price, and... 
In fact, he was surprised that it was so low. <laughs> <laughs> Miracles never cease, do they? Oh, Vincent, Vincent, if he really is somebody, then maybe your work will start to be recognized. Oh, forget it, Lisa. There isn't any more work for me. Just waiting on tables, that's my art. And I'm getting better at it all the time. Well, anyway, here's your money. It's all in $50 bills. Wait now. <laughs> that's the full 300 what about the galleries oh, commission? Oh, don't be technical, Vincent. You need the money more than we need the commission. No, sir, you've got to accept one-third of it. Right. It wouldn't be fair otherwise. Oh, I knew you'd feel I that way. I can't <laughs> believe it. It's the first painting I've sold. Do you realize that? I told you you had talent. That'll teach you to listen to me. You're right. I should always listen to you. Oh, listen, <laughs> I've got an idea. Have you had breakfast yet? Well, I had coffee. Tell you what. I'm going to get dressed, and we'll go celebrate with... Champagne and eggs, Benedict. <laughs> and then we're going out tonight. I'm going to buy you oh, the fanciest wonderful. dinner in wonderful. San Francisco. Well, Vincent, you can't spend all the money in one day. Why not? It's probably the first and last money I'll ever make for my paintings. Let's put it to good use. Well, it seems that Vincent had more talent than anyone realized. Those dark and gloomy paintings seem to have the qualities of genius. At least, that's what Mr. Mulholland said in his letter. Lisa, listen to this. Just listen go to on, this. Go on, go on, I'm says, listening. The Mulholland Gallery would be most interested in arranging an exhibition of your work. Oh. Listen, they're willing to pay all the costs of carding and insuring the paintings. They'll even pay my fare and expenses to Chicago so I can attend the opening. Lisa, can you believe it? Oh, Vincent, it's the most wonderful thing I ever heard. Well, it's not a one-man show, nothing that grand, but the Mulholland Gallery. That's one of the best, Lisa, one of the most pre prestigious. Do you know when you'll be leaving? As soon as I can get all the stuff crated and shipped. I guess the sooner the better. Lisa, why don't you come with me? Oh, I couldn't do that. I, I still have to be at the Your gallery. brother can take care of it for a week or so. That that's all the time it'll take. Oh, I, I just couldn't do it, Vincent, but... But when you have that big one-man show, I promise to be there. And that was when Vincent Raymond went to Chicago. Yes, that was his reason for going there. A very happy reason. Was the show a success? Oh, it was. The press reception to Vincent's work was very good. Far better than the evaluation he received back home. <laughs> I guess it's true what they say about a prophet being without honor in his own country. In this case, in his own state. There were a dozen paintings in all the exhibit, and at least half of them were sold in the first week. And for the first time, Vincent was a happy man. He sent me just one letter, and it contained a very good piece of news. Perhaps even more important than the news of his artistic success. Dear Lisa... Just a quick note to tell you that I'm well and spending money like a drunken sailor. I've bought two new suits. Yes, I said suits with matching pants and jacket, believe it or not. But more important, I'll tell you one other thing that seems to have happened to me. For the last three nights, I've slept without a dream. I think you must realize the importance of that, Lisa. Three nights of dreamless sleep the most precious three nights of my existence. But those dreamless nights didn't last very long. Because the very next morning at breakfast in his hotel room, Vincent opened the local paper and saw a strangely familiar name. Gallinari. Gallinari? What's that all about? Announcing the opening of Gallinari's murder museum. Oh, no. That can't be the same man. The Murder Museum, world's most terrifying house of wax, vivid recreation scenes of crime, passion, and horror never before witnessed. Oh, oh, it can't be the same man. It can't be. Where's that phone number? Oh. Hello. Is this the Murder Museum? Yes, I know you're not open yet. Listen, I want to ask you a question. This man, Gallinari, I want to know his first name. Raphael. And he is. Listen, what time are you open? No earlier than that? Then tell me where I can find Mr. Gallinari. Yes, it's important. No, my name does not matter. 
All right, all right. First shot, two o'clock. Oh, dear God, don't let it be true. And here, ladies and gentlemen, you see the notorious mass murder of Huntersville, Nebraska who not only dispatched his victims with poison, but then mutilated their bodies in the dreadful fashion you see before you. Oh, no. And now, if you step to the next exhibit, you will see the latest addition to Professor Gallinari's world-famous murder museum. For the first time in any house of wax, the horrifying axe murder of one of the most glamorous women ever to appear upon the American oh, stage. It's true. They oh. called her the beautiful Ada. And yes, Ada was beautiful, as beautiful as she was faithless. And one day, her wealthy manufacturer husband, John Lloyd Raymond, returned home Listen, from a business I've trip. I've got to ask you something. Excuse me, sir, but I'm still not through with this. I, I... Where is he? Does he have an office at this museum? Well, no, please, Look, sir. Look, I've got to see him. It may... Make him remove this. Abomination. Well, no, his office is in the rear. I don't know if he's... Out of my way! No, just here. Come back here. Is it? Open up, Gallinari. Open the door. Yes, what is it? Let me in. I have to talk to you. I'm sorry. I'm quite busy at the moment. And I... Raymond? Is that you? Yes, Vincent Raymond. What are you doing in Chicago? The question is, what have you done? Now, uh, be calm, young man. There is nothing to get so excited about. That's... Your art out there, Gallinari, out there. That's the very similitude you were talking about. Yes, yes, that's right. I tried to be faithful to the original. I'm not ashamed. You liar, you thief! Now, come, come, come. I've stolen nothing. I've imitated life, but stolen nothing. Now, please, sit down. Calm yourself. Uh, let me offer you, you a drink. You lied to me. You pretended to be something you weren't. You never told me you were going to create that... That horror out there. I told you only the truth. That I wish to do a sculpture of your mother and father. I only neglected to tell you the medium. Some artists work with clay and marble. I chose wax. Is that so wrong? You know it's wrong. You made a public spectacle out of it. And now you're going to do something about it. You're going to get rid of that. Thing out there. I am afraid that's impossible. The exhibit took months to create. They all do. I'll... The investment in time and money. I'll show you. I will make you destroy it. Ah, Mr. Raymond, don't make unnecessary problems for yourself. Murder is in the public domain. There has to be some way to make you tear it down, and I will. I swear it. I won't let that thing stand. Of course, I know myself what happened next. Because I was there in the murder museum the night that your friend Vincent Raymond returned. Oh, please. Can you tell me about it? I never did know the details. Well, from what I understand, he went to a lawyer the very next day to see if there was some legal means to get Gallinari to destroy the exhibit. He must have gotten some idea how difficult it would be to get an injunction against the museum. Because that's when he decided that the only recourse was to destroy the sculpture itself. Yes, that would be like Vincent. And what he did was very simple. He came back to the museum for the last show of the day. But during the tour, he slipped away from the crowd and hid behind one of the curtains until everyone had gone. And then he walked up to the exhibit and stopped in front of it. Of course, the instrument he needed to destroy the exhibit was already there. The fire axe was real, like the clothes of the wax figures and the furnishings of the room. All he had to do was take the axe out of the hands of his father's statue, and that's what he did. Destroy. Destroy. Mark, be destroyed. Destroyed. So I'm standing there as still as the wax figures themselves. And I froze in the doorway, too, afraid to move. Because I saw his eyes. And I was afraid to become a victim, too. 
And then I heard him sobbing. You should have done it. You should have done it. I saw him turn the axe toward the figure of his father. But then a strange thing happened. He began to shake from head to foot. He seemed unable to bring the axe down on the figure of John Lloyd. Brady. No! No, it wasn't your fault. It was hers. And suddenly he turned around and brought the axe down on the wax figure of his mother. No, who did it? You did it! That was when Professor Gallinari himself came out of his office. Stop it! Stop it! Raymond dropped the axe. The destruction of the wax figure complete. But Gallinari was infuriated and threw his arms around his throat. Raymond struggled with him. They fell in a heap to the floor. Stop it. Don't say any more, please. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just can't bear to hear any more. Does that mean that you don't want to see the Raymond exhibit now? No, I... I still want to see it. But I'm taking the next flight back to San Francisco, so I suppose there's no use. Well, I guess it's only fair that I show it to you, Miss Brandon, since you came all this way. Oh, we keep the curtain closed whenever we're fixing up an exhibit or preparing to show something new. This is really very kind of you. Oh, that's all right. I just hope that you don't find the exhibit too depressing. Is it a very good likeness? Yes, I think it's very good. But judge for yourself. As you can see, the figures are all ready, but the furnishings need some work still. Well, what do you think? <gasps> it's horrible. I know I shouldn't say that. I I did ask you to show it to me. Yes, I was afraid you'd feel that way, miss. Because the likeness is really very good. It was Gallinari's brother who did the statue of the professor. Naturally, he'd get that right. But that's Vincent, too. Yes. It's just like him. It's a very good likeness of Vincent Raymond. That's just how he looked when he strangled the life out of Professor Gallinari. Right here in the murder museum. If you are contemplating a visit to a wax museum, we pass on this advice to you. One, don't go during a heat wave. Two, Make sure that you can stand the sight of wax. And three, be certain you don't have any murderous ancestors who just might show up in one of the exhibits. We hope you enjoyed tonight's tour through the Murder Museum. We hope that you'll always come back through the creaking door of the Radio Mystery Theater because it's the one place you can enter where your imagination provides the real thrill. Tonight, we tried to aid that imagination with the voices of Michael Wager, Marion Seldes, Robert Dryden, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network.
invites you to relive again the story of another real-life crime fighter on Gangbusters. That's tomorrow night at the same time on KRLD. The News Authority. KRLD. Dallas. Major fires at this hour, one near downtown Grand Junction. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of your own terrifying imagination. All of us daydream. It seems a harmless enough way of passing the time. But what might we do if some of the things that pass through our minds come true? Supposing the man or the woman we created in the mind's eye became reality. The phantom became flesh and blood. Our puzzling, nerve-tingling tale begins as it ends, with sudden, irrevocable death. Hello? Isabel, it's Sky. Sky, I've been worried sick. Where have you been? Where are you? At the apartment. I've been calling and calling. The phone must be out of order. Are you with her again? There isn't any her anymore. Deirdre's dead. Whoever she was. Whatever she was. What do you mean? She was a witch, Isabel. There was no other way. I had to kill her. You what? Oh, Scar. Honey. Honey, there's a letter on the desk. I've tried to explain. And there are letters for the kids. Forgive me. No, Sky. Sky, don't hang up. Sky! Oh, good Lord. Oh, no. Our mystery drama, Out of Focus, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars William Redfield. It is sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hi, I'm Goldilocks, Ms. Goldilocks, if you please, and I'm a professional taste tester. Here at my taste test laboratory, that's TTL for short, (laughs) I taste test everything from porridge to diet drinks. Actually, there's not that much taste testing in porridge these days. There used to be once upon a time. I mean, that's how this Miz got into the biz. (laughs) But lately, it's been diet drinks. I mean, with so many diet drinks going sugar-free, I've been really busy conducting taste tests. A rather unbearable assignment, to be sure. But then I discovered sugar-free diet 7-Up. Fresh, natural, delicious. My only problem is that sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that it broke my Goldilocks diet drink taste meter Well, sugar-free diet 7-Up certainly has my seal of approval. This one's just right. When you're in Los Angeles, stay at the dazzling new Los Angeles Marriott Hotel. Because no matter where you travel, a Marriott Hotel always means a marvelous time. And the exciting new Los Angeles Marriott is exactly what we're talking about. With seven superb restaurants and lounges, a sensational swim-up bar in our big, beautiful pool, and the new Los Angeles Marriott is only minutes away from L.A. International Airport, a great location, the center of everything in Southern California. Reservations and 
ask the toll-free information operator for Marriott's nationwide 800 number. Skyler Harris, Sky to your friends, a typical commuter, an account executive at Lorne Peabody and Davis, married 18 years, two children, Gary 16 and Lisa 12, 35000 a year, and an expense account. You live up to every penny. You are bored at home, driven at the office, given to fantasizing about women because you don't have the courage to take a mistress. But you are to find one, and such a one, who will quite literally be the death of you. What do you got here, Jack? It's a DOA, Sam. Cold turkey. Mm-hmm. It's like the woman on the phone said. Where's the other? The dame? Yeah. Search me, not in here. It's probably the bedroom. Check out the rest of the apartment, huh? There's a letter or a confession or something on the desk. Yeah, I see it. Dear Isabel, I have just killed the Edra. And before I kill myself, I want to explain or try to explain why. It started ten days ago. It doesn't seem possible that in so short a time my whole life was ripped to shreds. It was such an ordinary day, climbing aboard the old 737, just like thousands of Why make four this morning, Sky, if Ed isn't on? Oh, no thanks, Charlie, I'm bushed. I'm going to catch a nap on the way in. Hey, you do look a little frazzled. Everything okay? Oh, <laughs> well, my health's all right, as far as I know. Oh, it's just the rat race, I guess. It's getting to me. Maybe it's a male change of life, Sky. No, 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 not yet. Please, God. Oh, Lord, that I could do with a little change of life, you know? Oh. <laughs> well, oh. leave you to get on with it. At least you got the whole seat to yourself in case the action gets rough. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sweet dreams, lover boy. Oh, go trump your partner's ace. All tickets, please. <sighs> Have your tickets ready, please. Oh. Good morning, Mr. Harris. Oh, hi, Benji. Hang on to it. It's the last ride left on the ticket. Tough night, Mr. Harris? Oh, oh, they're all tough these days, Benji. I'll see you at the end of the line, okay? Mm. Mm. You don't mind my joining me? What? Oh, 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 I beg your pardon. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I thought I was alone in the seat. You don't mind, do you? Mind of what man in his right mind would. Uh, I'm glad you find me pleasing. I. Uh, what? Don't look so surprised. I'm just what you've been waiting for. Am I not? Mr. Harris? Wake up, Mr. Harris. We're in the terminal. Huh? What is. What, uh, Benji, what is it? Everyone out, sir. End of the line. But I, I was just. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I. I fell asleep? What happened to the girl that was sitting beside me? What girl, Mr. Harris? Well, Benji, she was sort of a tall, dark-haired, deep, violet, black eyes like Elizabeth Taylor, long legs that... Well, I mean, if you saw her, you could never forget her. Sorry, sir. I passed you a couple of times, and the seat beside you was always empty. What? Oh, Benji, come on. You're sure there wasn't a girl? I didn't see her. Maybe you dreamed her. Maybe... Well, there's no doubt about it. She was a perfect dream. Yes, Doris? Harry? Oh, sure. Send him right in. Sky, have I got news for you? Hold on to your hat. What? <laughs> I just came from a session with the kingpin. Oh, so what does boss man Peabody have up his sleeve this morning? The brass ring for you, Sky, and I go along for the ride. The Bianchi account. Bianchi? It's all yours, baby. 
All you have to do is come up with a campaign. That's ten million in billing. Biggest new account in the shop. The plum. Yeah. Now, if you pull it off, it's the VP rating we're all bucking for. Yeah, and if I blow it, I'll be on the unemployment line. No, 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 no. Not you, Sky. That's why the kingpin picture. Now, you better go right on up. <laughs> he wants to see you to kick a couple of ideas around. Ah, uh, you know something, Harry? What? You either cured my headache or arranged I'll never have one again. Uh, what does that mean? The Bianchi account. If I don't cut it, I won't have to worry about headaches anymore. Old Kingpin Peabody will hand me my head in a basket. Hey, Mario. Hey, yes, Mr. Alice. Uh, once again, not too lightly for Mr. Lipscomb and me, okay? Right. You don't want to miss your train, Sky. Oh, you don't know how often I want to, but not tonight. <sighs> What's the big deal tonight? You and Isabel socializing? No, 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 no. For once, it's the train I'm interested in. Oh, well, that's a switch. Yeah, oh, thanks, Mario. Well, what's so special about tonight's commute? I won't know until I prowl all the trains. I'll be looking for something. Uh, do me a favor, Sky. Now, I'm only a poor working photo stiff. And you're the idea man. Look for an idea for Bianchi. But I already have it. Genius. What? Could you picture a girl like this? Great violet gentian eyes framed with black lashes, natural at least a half inch long. Cream white skin, full lips, deep carmine to match the cheek blush. A mass of blue black hair to frame the face. A figure full but gorgeously shaped. Long tapering legs with ankles that lead to high arched feet. Picture her in semi decolletage, a hint of cleavage, and the promise of all sex. And underneath, that caption, Bianchi. If you have it, you don't need anything else. And if you don't have it, it doesn't much matter what else you have. Now all we got to do is find the bay. Harry, Harry, I already found her. The trick is just how I find her again. Oh, oh holy cow, I got to make the first train. I, uh, uh, put this tab on the national debt, Mario. Right. Harry, you can pop for the tip, will you? I got a date with an angel. I hope... Something I can help you with, Mr. Harris? Huh? Oh, no, uh, no, Benji. I, I was just looking for someone. Yeah, I uh, figured. You've been from one end of the train to the other. Anyone I know? No, 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 just, uh, just a girl. The one you asked me about on the way in this morning. Yes, yes, I've got to find her. Well, if she's anything like you described, I uh, wouldn't blame you. Uh, you know, Benji, you better find me a seat now. I'm still a little stoned. Well, take my spot, Mr. Harris. I'll put my work case up on the rack. Oh, thanks. I'll stretch out and make yourself comfortable. I'll wake you before you get to your stuff. Oh, you're a scholar, a gentleman, and a fine conductor, Benji. Wake up, Skylar. Huh? It isn't very flattering to have you always falling asleep on me. What's that? A... Oh. Oh, you're real. This time I've been waiting for you. But I hunted the whole train for you. Did you? You shouldn't have worried, Skylar. I wasn't going to let you get away. How do you know my name? If I want information, I just ask questions. Skylar Harris. Well, how do I do with the same question? <laughs> The name is Deirdre. Oh, lovely. Provoking, sensuous, uh, a little incomplete, perhaps. No surname? Do you really care? Well, it would be necessary eventually just to satisfy the accountants, you know? Social Security and Uncle Sam. Dear me, does everyone have to know all about us? <laughs> well, maybe I didn't make it clear. See, I have a proposition to make to you. <laughs> oh, yes. I thought perhaps you might. Uh, no, 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 don't misunderstand me. See, I'm an advertising executive. I guess with a... I know all about you, Skylar. No, I mean, there's this account, Bianchi Cosmetics. Oh, yes. Deirdre, uh, uh, I guess I may call you that. Uh, I want you to. Oh, uh, I, I have no idea who you are or what you are, but would you be interested you, in this? Skylar. No, look, honestly, I mean, this is strictly a business arrangement. 
I have a campaign in mind using you as the central figure. I don't know what you want to call it, Skylar, but as far as we're concerned, there needn't be any embarrassment or cover-ups. Don't we both know what we really want? No, no, come on, Deirdre. Don't put me on. I'm not. You're the one who turned me on, Skylar. Now look, Deirdre, um, whatever your other name is, I am honest to God leveling about this big ad campaign and how perfect you are for it and how much money you could make if it all goes the way I think it could. If you insist, Skylar, anything. But if we have to talk about something other than ourselves, would you mind getting me a drink? Oh, sure, sure. I, I could use one myself. Uh, what'll it be? It doesn't matter. You pick it. Just hurry back. Oh, don't worry. Just don't vanish. Westfield. Next stop, Westfield. Hey, Mr. Harris. Mm -hmm. Coming into Westfield? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm with you, Benji. I'm with you. Thanks. Westfield is the next stop. Westfield. Uh, uh, Benji. Uh, yes, Mr. Harris. What happened to the girl? We back at that again. Oh, no, now, come on, Benji. This time it's no dream. I've been talking to her all the way up the line. What do you want me to say, Mr. Harris? Well, I want to know where the girl went. Mr. Harris, we've been riding this line a long time together. Uh, you don't want to make no scene. Benji, all I'm asking you I is what... I get the message. So what do you want me to say? If there was this girl, maybe she got off at the last stop or the one before but she couldn't have. Mr. Harris, you've been cold turkey the last ten miles. Now, maybe this girl was here, I don't know, or maybe you just had one too many. Excuse me, we're coming into the station. This is where you get off. A man who doesn't realize how near the end of his emotional rope he is a girl named Deirdre, who promises desire as sensually as a centerfold in today's magazines. A suburban family who awaits the return of the husband and father as routine. And the disaster we know is to happen. We'll start to fit the pieces of the jigsaw together when I return shortly with Act Two. see a beer drinker pour his beer real easy down the side of the glass? Maybe you do it yourself. If so, the Budweiser Brewmaster thinks you're missing something, especially if you're a Budweiser drinker. You see, Bud is brewed, so it will kick up a healthy head of foam. Exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation make it a lively brew. Well, anyway, pouring Bud plunk down the middle of the glass helps bring out the best in that clean white Budweiser foam and real beer aroma. It also helps you get the full benefit of a taste, smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. Remember, brewing beer right does make a difference. Next time, pour that Budweiser right down the middle and see for yourself. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. When occasional heartburn or acid indigestion is combined with a gassy, foolish feeling, that's what we call gassed indigestion. Digel is made for gassed indigestion because Digel is different. It does more than plain antacids. Digel reduces excess acid while its patented cymethicone gets rid of trapped gas fast. Use only as directed. Digel for gassed indigestion. No plain antacid can do what Digel can. Of all the leading laxatives, only one, Phenomint, is a gentle chewing gum laxative. And for a very good reason. It's pleasant to take. Phenomint goes into your system gradually, little by little. And after Phenomint has entered your system, it begins to work gently, predictably, to relieve occasional irregularity. Phenomint, the gentle chewing gum laxative. Like all medicines, take only as directed. One of the minor sad comedies of the world 
is the faces of the wives as they meet their returning commuter husbands. As the trains get later and later, the faces get tenser and tenser. Till finally, as the last commuter train pulls in and errant hubby pours himself off, the wife's eyes roll helplessly heavenwards. Hi, Isabel, baby. How was your day? My day was miserable, and most of my night was worse. Really? Well, what do you mean, night? Well, it's just about half over. Do you know you're well over two hours late? This is the fourth train I've met. The least you might have done is call. Me. Well, honey, look, I'm sorry. It was a big day at the office. I was swamped, and on top of that... Oh, don't did... give me that, Sky. When you weren't on the early train, I called the office, and they told me you left in plenty of time to catch it. Well, that's right. That's right. I know. I did. But look, it's big news, hon. I got handed the plum of my career today. The Bianchi account. So, is that any reason to go out and get stoned? Oh, have a heart, Isabel. I handle this right, I'll end up a VP. Well, I'll... you handle it the way you started off, and you're going to end up PNG at home. Well, now, what does that mean? Persona non grata. Somebody not wanted. No, no, no. I know what persona non grata means. Well, what do you mean about me not being wanted? Well, you've already got two out of three of us feeling that way right at the moment. Okay. You and who else? Gary. Obviously, you've forgotten you promised to be home early while there was still enough light to give him a driving lesson. Oh, so that's such a big deal. Everybody has to snap their corks. I mean... It is when the driving lesson was to be on the way to the basketball team's father and son dinner, which you promised to attend with him. Oh, damn, Isabel, I, I, I forgot. You see, I, I was so up to my ears you that it just... You couldn't have been so far up. You couldn't put a phone to one of them and let us know. Well, I told you, Isabel, I forgot. Now, you're not going to tell me that you also forgot you have a wife who meets you at the station. Six nights a week these days. Well, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. I mean, honest to Pete, Isabel, I've had a lousy day. I, I, oh, I, oh, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Isabel. So am I, Sky. About you, I mean. It's just. Just what? Sky. I've been worried about you lately. I guess I'm tense because you're tense. So who's tense? Come off it. I'm not the only one who's noticed it. Even Liza's worried about you. Oh, now what have I done to her? It isn't so much what you've done as what you haven't. You've been neglecting a daughter who needs her father very much. Why? She's 12 years old. You're a big man in her life. Okay, oh, Isabel, okay, can we knock it off for now? I just don't want to go into the house bickering. Neither do I, Skye. Especially not in front of the kids. Okay. Truth, huh? And before we go in, apology? Accept it. Oh, I guess I have been off my feet, honey. It's overwork, you know? Well, I hope that's all. What else? Well, it's silly of me, I suppose, but it isn't another woman, is it, Sky? Oh. Of course not, Isabel. Now, now, come on. Let's get inside. I need a drink. Chrysler Model Agency? Yeah, this is Skylar Harris here. Put me through to Irene. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. I'll hold. Uh, Doris, while I'm on one, call IFW and hold them on two. I want to talk to Ed Rashby, okay? Hello, Irene. It, it's Sky. Yeah, 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 fine. Well, I'm looking for a girl. First name, Deirdre. I don't know the second. She is a natural for the Bianchi account, and I've just got to find her. Well, Harry, it's hard to believe anyone this beautiful can't be a model or, or in TV or the theater or somewhere. No, 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 I'm the only one that's seen her. Yeah, yeah, I've checked out all the talent books, and I have every agency in the business pulling pictures of their clients. Well, you're last on the line, Harry, only because I couldn't get through to you sooner. Are those the uh, Maurice Williams picks, Harry? Yeah, I just came by special messenger. No luck yet? Nope, not yet. Okay, well, let me see him. Ah, here, now, now, just look at all these things. And now, any one of them, I can make something out of this world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, why this special one? Because huh? she is out of this world to start with. Well, then I gotta see. Now, 
Now, uh, what's she got the pistol number as of Well, you'd have to see Deirdre understand. Oh. <laughs> it's a name for you. Uh, that's right. It suits her. Keep your fingers crossed. I'm almost through these. Well, suppose you don't find her. I've got to find her. <laughs> Look, it's been nearly a week, Sky. Uh, the kingpin is getting restless. Huh? What? I said Mr. Peabody's hollering for some layouts. At least the kind of campaign you're planning to... Oh. Didn't find her, huh? No. Well, maybe she's not a model. Maybe. I've still got to find her. You don't even know she exists. Now, don't be silly, Harry. She couldn't just vanish into thin air. Sky. What? Sky, uh... Look, I, 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 I just don't want you to take this wrong. Now, come on, come on, Harry. Get it out. <sighs> okay. Now, you've been running off the, the tracks quite a bit for the last few months. You don't look so hot. You've been no ball of fire around the shop. Now, you've been hitting the sauce pretty heavy, and now this screwball bit about this Deirdre dame. Now, I, I think you, you ought to have a little skull session with your local friendly shrink. I got two words for you, Harry. Butt out. Okay, only, only friendly advice. I don't need it. On second thought, I'll butt out. I need a drink and some space to think. Hey, Mario. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Harris. Uh, build me another Manhattan, huh? Coming right up. Good. Boy, shoot deer in here today. Uh, it's a breather. The late lunch is blue finally, and the other drinkers don't come in for the next hour or so. Oh, I see. All right. Sure you want to be alone, Sky? <gasps> Deirdre. Mind if I sit on the stool next to you? Mine? Oh, I've been going out of my mind trying to find you. Where do you keep disappearing to? I'm a very private person, Sky. With me, too, is more than enough company. I hate crowds. Well, this time, I'm not letting you go. How about a drink? Well, does it have to be here? No. No, name the place. How about yours? Mine? Oh, you mean the office? No, I don't like offices either. Well, I uh, have a studio apartment. Well, then can't we go there? Well, we sure can. Just let me settle my tab. Uh, Mario! Ah, uh, uh, now, where did he go? If you mean the bartender, I heard a phone ring. I think he went to answer it around the corner there. But don't you move now. We'll go right away. How far are we going, Sky? Hmm? Oh, oh, you mean the address. 825 East 50th. I'll be right back. Hey, Mario. I was uh, just coming to get you. It's your office. Well, I can't talk to him now. Here. Well, they said it was urgent. Oh, damn. Now, look, Mario, there's a girl sitting on the stool next to where I was around the corner. Don't let her get out of here. Don't let her get away. I'll handle it, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mario. Hello? Who the... Oh, hello, Doris. When? Well, I can't call now. I'm... What did my wife say was wrong? She didn't. Well, well look, uh, call her back and tell her she can reach me at the apartment. I should be there within 10 or 15 minutes. But, yeah, I got to rush now. Oh, what now? Well, Isabel, we'll just have to... to... Mario! The girl! Why did you let her... I'm sorry, Mr. Harris. When I came around, there was no one here. Oh, no. No, she can't get away again. Deirdre, I can't tell you what a lift I got when I found you waiting at the door. <laughs> I'm glad, Skyler. Well, what did you run out of the bar for? I told you. I don't like Ross. I almost had heart failure thinking I'd lost you again. Oh, you'll never lose me. Take my coat. Uh, oh, sure, sure. Get me a drink. What's your poison? Oh, heck. You get that. I'll mix my own poison. Hello. Sky. Why didn't you call me right back? Isabel, I was busy. At a bar? Now, honey, you know how much of our business is... Con uh, well, well, never mind that. What is it? Well, at the time, I wanted you to talk to Gary. All of a sudden, just before I called, he... He, he threw a kind of fit. I don't know how to describe it. He, he just yelled at me like he was another person. Yelled something about being tired of being a kid and ran out of the house. Look, Isabel, please, I'm very busy and now. And this... the worst guy. While I was trying to get you, he took the car and drove off. Oh, well, unless you gassed it up, he can't get very far, and he's a pretty good driver anyway. And he doesn't have a license. Well, what do you want to do, call the police? 
He said, all right, kid, and he'll be right back. Now, Isabel, please stop worrying. And stop worrying me, will you? I have urgent business to attend to. At the apartment? Yes, at the apartment. Now, let me get on with it. Apron string? Oh, no, my wife's just a little upset over one of the kids. I hope she's not going to keep calling back and interrupting our business. Well, there's one sure way of taking care of that. Just leave it off the hook. <laughs> Let's get away from that ugly noise. Okay. What's in here? The bedroom. Oh. This is nice. And comfy. Skylar? What, Deirdre? Aren't you coming in? Well, it'd be a little easier for me to keep my mind on business out here. Besides, you... You never mix that drink. <laughs> I decided on headier wine. There. Now, isn't this what you really want from me? <laughs> What the devil is... You'd better go see before he wakes up the whole building. Oh, I was sound asleep. All right, I, I, I won't be a second. Who is it? What is it? Open the door, Scotty. It's hard. Well, take the chain off and let me in. Harry, what do you want? Oh. Oh, that way, huh? Well, I should have figured. Well, you better ditch her fast and get on home. Isabella's frantic. She's been trying to reach you all evening, and she finally got in touch with me. What is it? Your boy, Gary. He's had an accident with the car. It's a concussion. I don't know how bad. Now, I've got a cab waiting. If you only no, get... No, you... Harry, look. I've got to get dressed. Thanks. For nothing. Now, you make sure you get rid of that chick and get home where you belong. Okay, okay, Harry. <laughs> oh. Deirdre, I, I, I didn't know you were standing there. You heard? I know. Home. What about you? We haven't even talked about... Deirdre, I can't lose you again. I promised you you wouldn't. I'll be waiting. It doesn't matter about tonight. Not anymore now. Because you know there's always tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. So mourn Shakespeare's Macbeth for the death of his lady. How much will our lady called Deirdre mourn the death of her lover? We'll return shortly with Act Three. And now another story of the ball and chain as Kellogg Special K presents Veronica and Jack. Oh, Jeffrey, isn't this romantic? Out in a quiet lake at night with you rowing the boat. Yes, Veronica, it's really neat. Jeffrey, what was that? Uh, frogs. Frogs that go bong? Uh, they're pretty weird frogs. Oh, Jeffrey, you're such a conner. You have a ball and chain. Like the ones they use in those special K commercials. Yes, Veronica. It symbolizes my few pounds of extra weight. But I'm going to get rid of it. How? Uh, by exercising. You know, like rowing this boat and eating smart at every meal, starting with a special K breakfast. You mean a one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, orange juice, and coffee? Uh, precisely. It's less than 240 calories, and it tastes delicious. It'll help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'll help, too, Jeff. After all, we're all in the same boat. <gasps> you have a ball and chain, too. <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with a Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. The Tab Paysetter account from Exchange Bank. An unusual name for an unusual checking account. TAB stands for Total Account Banking, and that means a complete package of 14 customer services. A pace setter is a leader in its field, which means we have the only account of its kind in town. And here's what you get with your TAB pace setter account. As many personalized checks as you need, and you get to write as many as you want. No minimum balance. 
$10,000 accidental death insurance, membership in bank club association, installment loan discounts, all the money orders and traveler's checks you want, local and national discounts, a safety deposit box, and special deals on travel tours, a quarterly bank club newsletter, and financial counseling for the asking. You get all these services for only $3 a month. The Tab Pace Setter account, an unusual name for an unusual checking account. From Exchange Bank, Harry Hines at Mockingbird, member FDIC. No better introduction for what's to come, but the rest of Macbeth's lament. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And then to the messenger who came, he said, thy story, quickly. Deirdre? Thank God you're still there. I told you, you wouldn't lose me again. That's all I wanted to know. Look, I can't talk now. I'll be at the apartment as soon as I can. Will you wait? Through eternity, lover. I've got to hang on. God, what are you doing now? Oh, it's all right, honey. I've uh, just got to get to the office. You're going into town today? Yeah, I have to. You see, the deadline on the Bianchi account's day after tomorrow. I got my work cut out to meet it. I, I, I doubt if I can even get back tonight. Uh, perhaps he, not even tomorrow night. Well, what about Gary? Honey, I checked the hospital, and he's fine. You knew that when we left at 4 o'clock this morning. I'm still glad you checked again. I thought I heard you on the phone coming downstairs. Well, yeah, well, I, uh, I uh, yeah, I, I called a cab, too. I can run you to the station in my car. No, no, it's all right. It, it's better this way. Hey, uh, you want some coffee? No. My stomach's too upset. Oh, Sky, we could have lost Gary. Well, we didn't, honey, so let's not agonize over it. I don't know. Everything seems so confused. Like there was a sort of curse on us. And you worry me most of all. Me? You. You're like a stranger. Sky, why couldn't I reach you last night? What were you doing? I told you, Isabel. I had work to do. I, I didn't want to be interrupted. I, I, I took the phone off the hook, and then I, I just forgot about it. Work seems to be the only thing that matters to you nowadays. Sky, you only had two hours sleep. Do you have... Come on, Isabel. We haven't got time for messing around. Now, now, you see, there's my cab. Couldn't you at least take a later train? Look, my job depends on this. And you won't be home tonight. I doubt it. <laughs> Brother, I kid you not, you are in big trouble, Sky. Now, Peabody is really on the warpath. The only thing saving your neck for a day or so is that Bristol Proctor's in town. Oh, Harry, please, will you lay off me? I've got everything under control. Oh, 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 boy, that is for laughs. Oh, now I get the whole picture. Why, you're off the rails, on the sauce, and running hot and cold flashes. <laughs> well, if you think some chick is worth what you're heading for... Come on, let me give you some advice. The only thing I want from you, Harry, is technical advice in your specialty. What? I want to take some pictures of a girl. What? Bring her into the studio here. No, 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 that's just the trouble. She won't come here, and I'm only gambling that if she'll let anyone shoot her, it'll be me. Well, you know from cameras, you're an idea man. Now, now look, do me a favor. Will you let's set up the copy like you suggested and let me pick the girl. Now, and listen, I've got the girl. If only you can get me a camera that's reasonably foolproof, I can get good enough stuff for the sample layouts. Then we can take it from there. Well, the gal is that sensational. Take huh? my word for it. Well, I can give you a Miklon 35, 85 millimeter lens, a micro blitz strobe with high speed ectochrome film. Well, that's okay. Yeah. You name it. Just show me how to use it. Oh, well, you don't have to worry too much about the strobe, even. The film will take natural light, and I'll push it in developing. Okay, get me the camera. I'll be back with the picture in an hour. <laughs> You having fun, Skyler? Oh, Deirdre, this isn't a game. This could mean our whole future. It could indeed. Yeah, just like that, just like that. I'm glad you let me talk you into taking the pictures. You won't be sorry. I'm just 
very much afraid you will be, Skyler. Oh, damn. Sky, dear, I forgot to ask you. Mm. Cutting out your wife. Well, I've got to finish these pictures. I... Kidra, why did you say I'd be sorry I took them? Skyler, baby, I really don't photograph very well. You'll see. <laughs> You got the prints, Harry. That's great. Well, I don't know how great you're going to think it is. Huh? Come on, what do you mean? Well, I, I don't know what I mean. I, I, look, I just don't see how you could have gotten everything so gummed up. All right, just let me see. Sure. Help yourself. Everything's so out of focus, you can't tell a lamp from a couch. And it's for the girl. Well, <laughs> you find her. I can't. Well, I don't... She was right. It... Well, if that's the couch, she should be... Now, wait a minute. Let me see in this one. No, this one is... Uh-uh. Oh, Harry. How could I have faked out so badly? You got me. Uh, Sky. Level? Yeah. Uh, is this some kind of a stupid put-on? I mean, uh, what are you trying to pull on me? Nothing, Harry. Honest. I shot the film at all the openings, the shutter speeds. I mean, everything that you laid out for me. It all came out like this? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, we've got to figure... Uh, maybe the film is bad or the lens crystallized or something. Well, let's go back. I, I bring other equipment and this time we bring home the bacon. No, 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 Harry. She wouldn't let you shoot her. I, I can't explain, but... All right, so forget her. I can't. I can't, Harry. I've got to take one more crack at it. Just, just one more. Oh, man, you're crazy. Would you help me? You, you won't let me. Some kind of camera that I just can't fail with. Uh, well, okay. Look, I'll, uh, I'll give you an instant. Uh, 20 seconds, you'll know if you goof. You just keep adjusting it until it's right. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll go get the camera. Oh, you're an okay buddy. Thanks. Hello. Oh, thank God it's you, Sky. Isabel, what is it now? I, I'm just at the end of my rope. I could swear somebody's got a hex on us. What are you talking about? You've got to come home. Gary's back in coma. What? When did that happen? About ten this morning. I tried to reach you. Isabel, listen. You've got to cope a little longer. Everything's falling apart for me here, too. I can't get home till at the earliest later tonight. What's the matter? She won't let you go? Who? Oh, don't try to kid me. There has to be another woman. You couldn't be like this if there weren't. Okay, Skye. If this is the way you want it, you can just let us all go to hell. Isabel. The only thing I wish you is a one-way ticket there yourself. Isabel. Isabel. Okay, Sky. here's your instant camera. Now, maybe this will get us all a clearer picture of where we're going. I feel just like a cat. <laughs> I want to stretch and curl and purr. <laughs> then let me take my pictures now. Remember when I said I would take care of tomorrow? And tomorrow and tomorrow? Yes. That was a lot more than a promise. I don't know what you mean. Take your picture. And you'll know. What is it, Deirdre? I've got this weird feeling that's taking me over. I, uh, I'm scared. The wages of sin. Take your picture. Shoot, Sky. All right. All right, now just like that. Just, just hold it. Now, while we wait for it to develop, let me tell you what you'll see. Where? On the picture. Everything sharply in focus for just a second, and then, where I should be, a blank, an empty hole in space. Look. All right. Oh. Oh, Lord, no! As I really look. You've never seen a witch before, have you? No. You think I'd be a successful model for your Bianchi account? Who are you? Look at your picture again. Just what you said. You. Whatever it was, you... you it's gone. 
but I'm still here. This is me. You won't let me go, will you, Skyler? Why me, Deirdre? A personal whim. And you were so ripe for the tempting. You'd, you'd destroy me eventually. Of course. But I could put it off for a while. You don't have me that much in your spell. Oh, are you so confident? What makes you so... No. This. What are you doing with a gun? Well, you see, it happens to be a hobby of mine. I can put five out of six in a three-quarter-inch bullseye at 30 feet. It won't save you anymore. Oh, I know that, I know. But it can the rest of my family. You wouldn't get... <laughs> She was mortal. She was dead. Just a second ago, three hours after I shot her, I rose and touched her cheek. It was cold as the grave. I go to meet her there now, for eternal damnation. I have no hope for myself. Only for you, Isabel, and for the children. Whatever harm there is left in her, I pray can reach only me alone. I hope I've brought you protection. Goodbye forever. For I know whatever life after death there is, I can never ever share it with any of you. I sold my soul to the devil and the witch he sent to find me. Well, how do you like that for a confession, Jake? What am I going to say, Sam? Them guys working in advertising, they're halfway around the bend. I guess you got to be a little bit screwy to get into that kind of business in the first place. Figures. Now, nah, hold it. Yeah? Oh, hi, Lieutenant. This is uh, Detective Sam Banks. Yeah. It's pretty much like the story the wife called in from Connecticut. Guy left a confession you got to read. Won't help much. I mean, it's far out. Huh? On the subject. Yeah, there's not much doubt from pictures around the apartment. This is Skylar Harris, all right. Sure, DOA. Bullet through the head. We're just waiting for the ME now. Hmm? Well, what do you mean, both? There's nobody else in the apartment but the guy. The dame? There's not a sign of her. Well, you'll get it when you read the confession. The way I figure it, she was one of them, uh, what do you call it, firmaments of the imagination. I don't think she ever existed. Did the detective mean to say figments of the imagination? Or was his choice of firmament, perhaps, nearer the truth. Was Deirdre more finite than he believed? Was she somebody of incarnate evil, clothed in beauty, who still stalks the day and the night, looking for other prey? I'll be back shortly. John Jones, statistic, born with cleft feet and cleft pants. Shirley Smith, statistic, Born blind. Tom Kelly, statistic. Born with an open spine. Statistic. Children born with birth defects. 250,000 of them every year. One out of every 14 babies. Small statistics with a whole life ahead of them. Small statistics who cry and think and feel and want to run. Why should life deny them good health at birth? The March of Dimes leads the fight for this life. Good health at birth. Good health at birth. 
could help you. Through medical service programs, public education, and scientific research. So that one day the ultimate goal will be reached. The prevention of all birth defects. But birth defects are forever unless you help Please, me. will you give to the March of Dimes? One parting word until we meet again. Be careful, commuters, and all the other men with extra time that weighs heavy on your hands. Look with a jaundiced eye at that fantasy girl who may materialize beside you in the train or the bus or on the stool next to you in your favorite bar. And before you succumb to temptation, remember, at the best, she's apt to burn a hole in your pocket. At the worst, she may burn your soul forever. Our cast included William Redfield, Joan Loring, Suzanne Grossman, Ralph Bell, Dan Ockel, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. We're going to be extra nice to Aunt Bell, Linda. After all, We're protecting an investment. You're back. I can't believe it. Look, I've had just about enough of this. You people simply have to stop coming into my apartment. I'm going to tell Charles he has to do something about this. Hello? Oh, Charles. Hello, Aunt Bell. Will you get over here and get these people out? That man who was here last week. And this time he has a friend. A lady friend, no less. Aunt Belle, you mean that guy is back? He certainly is. And with a strange woman. I'll be right over. Oh, please do. They're upsetting Julia terribly. I think she's afraid of them. Julia? Aunt Belle, Julia is dead. She can't be there. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. shopping. You like to find what you want without a lot of driving around and without a lot of walking. That's why you'll like Plymouth Park. It's the anything and everything place. Quality merchandise, services, dining, entertainment, you name it. It's all at Plymouth Park. We call it total shopping. You'll call it great. Just off Highway 183 on Story Road in Irving. The leader in sports coverage. KRLD. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to our world of mystery and the macabre, of unbearable suspense. Sit back and lend us your imagination for a while. We'll do some remarkable things with it. Imagine, for instance, an elderly woman, Belle Richwood, alone and forgotten, except for her nephew Charles, her only living relative and the only human being she ever sees. Until one lonely night. You're back. I can't believe it. I, look, I, I've had just about enough of this. You people simply have to stop coming into my apartment. 
This just isn't right. I, I'm entitled to my privacy. Will you answer me when I speak to you? Now, get out of here and leave me alone. I won't have it. I'm going to tell Charles. He has to do something about this. Oh. Hello? Oh, Charles. Hello, Aunt Bell. Look, well, will you get over here and get these people out? Who, oh, Aunt Bell? That, that man who was here last week. And this time he has a friend. A lady friend, no less. I'm frightened, Charles. You mean that guy is back? He certainly is. With this strange woman. Oh, hurry, Charles. Please. <laughs> mystery drama, Strange Company, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Duran and stars Bryna Rayburn. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by new sugar-free Diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. We've been having some fun in our television and radio commercials by using a ball and chain to symbolize the slight overweight problem common to so many of us. We point out that being a few pounds overweight is just a little more difficult for you. Climbing stairs, just walking around, even sitting down can feel, well, like you're wearing a ball and chain. In case you missed the message, it's this. If you really want to get rid of that extra weight, you really have to work at it by exercising and with sensible meals like the Special K Breakfast. A one-ounce bowl of Special K, America's favorite high-protein cereal, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee, less than 240 calories, nutritious, and by the way, delicious. So why not begin each day with a Special K breakfast and then keep up the good work? Special K can't help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. Inflation is something that we're really living with today, and State Farm has what we term inflation coverage. And Agent Gabe Franco, Fort Collins, Colorado, explains the low-cost inflation coverage State Farm offers homeowners in most areas. What it really amounts to is, as the value of your home increases, the amount of coverage that you have on that home automatically increases. Uh, you don't have to call your agent every year and say, look, I think my home's increased in value. Would you raise my insurance? You don't have to do that. It's done automatically. The idea that their home is going to always be protected at all times for the full cost of replacing it is important to a person. In most areas, State Farm Fire and Casualty offers a homeowner's policy that can increase your coverage automatically as the cost of replacing your home increases. A good reason to see your State Farm agent now. fears darken, our anxieties deepen, and our thoughts indulge in some strange tricks. Belle Richwood and her sister Julia lived their whole lives together, almost recluses, until the neighborhood around them deteriorated to the point where their nephew Charles was forced to move them from the city to a peaceful apartment in the country. But for Belle and Julia, there was to be no peace. Hello? Oh, Charles, it's about time you answered. What's the matter now, Aunt Belle? Julia's fallen again. Can you get right over? All right, Aunt Belle. Now, cover her up. I'll be right there. Oh, for heaven's sake, hurry up. She's not moving this time. I, I think she's unconscious. Julia's fallen again. Third time this week. Charles, Julia simply has got to go to a nursing home. Whether Belle likes it or not, she can't take care of Julia anymore, and we can't go on like this. I know, Linda, I know. What are we going to use for money? All they've got is their social security. And I'm so deep in hock myself, I can't pay for a nursing home. Well, I'm sick of you running over there at all hours to pick Julia off the floor. Or get her out of a bathtub. She's too old to be getting into a tub anyway. I'm fed up too. I don't see why you bothered with them after your mother died. I'm their only blood relative. I had to get involved. Well, go pick Julia off the floor. And hurry back. Dinner's almost ready. Oh, 
you took your time. Where is she? Oh, in the bedroom. Hurry. Okay. Oh, can, can you get her up? No, Aunt Belle. Julia. Julia's dead. Oh, oh no. No, 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 Charles. She's she's just unconscious. No, Aunt Belle, she's gone. No, no, I I I can't believe it. It's the fall was just too much for her. Not my Julie. She can't be. No, Julia, Julia dear, wake, wake Please, up, wake Aunt up, Belle. I can't Please, you. I, I'll have to make some phone calls first. I'll I'll, I'll take you back to our place. Oh, no, 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 no. I I, I can't. I can't leave Julia. But they'll be taking her away in a little while. You'll be better off at home with Linda. <laughs> It was all because we moved to this apartment. We should have stayed in the city. Aunt Belle, we've been through uh, all this. I moved you out of the city because you were mugged twice in your own elevator. This, this place isn't any better. Julia always hated this apartment. I think it hates us. It's, it's evil. Julia's gone. What am I going to do? Oh, no, now, now you've got to think about yourself. Myself. I haven't thought about myself for 60 years. It's, it's always been Julia. But you won't have to worry about her anymore. What do you mean, Charles? I'm more worried about her. More than ever. It's time to leave, Aunt Bell. Oh, <laughs> Couldn't, couldn't I stay with her a little while longer? She looks just as though she's asleep. A few minutes more. We'll wait in the lobby. Oh. Ju Julia, dear, do you want to wake up now? Aunt Belle. It's all right, Linda. Oh, oh, perhaps you're better off sleeping, dear. I'll have a nice snack ready for you when you wake. Come on, Linda. But Charles... Sure. I said come on. She shouldn't be alone in there. She doesn't believe Julia's dead. Yes, she does. But you heard her. Belle's been a sister to Julia for 60 years. And a mother for 10. It'll take her time to get over Julia's death. It gives me the chills. Don't worry about it. Oh, I suppose we'd, we'd better go now. You'll have to be getting back to work. I'm not working today, Aunt Belle. I got the day off. You're coming back to the house with us. Charles, I, I have to settle with you about the funeral expense. I'll, I'll take care of them, of course. There's plenty of time for that later. Oh, I want you to watch your head. Oh, That's thank it. Thank you, Charles. Yes, I, I'm in. Well, Linda, would you want her any more rational than that? I suppose not. What a relief. <laughs> You didn't have to see me in, Charles. I'll be all right. Don't be silly, Aunt Belle. And thanks for having me to dinner. You were right. I I wouldn't have wanted to be alone today. I hate leaving you now, but... Oh, I'll be all right. I, I have to get used to it. I'll stop in tomorrow night after work. Yes, do. And I'll give you the money for the expenses. Do you know how much they are? Well, I can wait, Aunt Belle. In fact... I didn't think you'd be able to cover it. I was planning to take out a loan. Oh, nonsense. I have it, and I'll pay it. Well, it's it's $1,500. All right. I'll, I'll have it counted out for you tomorrow. You mean you have that much in cash here? I don't think that's a wise thing to do. No, nonsense. I've always had cash on hand. Well, that's up to you. You'll be all right tonight? <laughs> don't worry about me. Come by tomorrow. I lock the door behind me. I always do. Good night, Aunt Belle. Good night, Charles. Oh. 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 I wonder if there's any ginger ale in the refrigerator. Oh, oh that reminds me. I wanted to tell Charles. <laughs> Charles! Charles! Oh, oh he's gone. Oh. Oh. Hello, Linda. Yes, yes, I'm all right. Oh, Linda, 
Charles just left, and I, I wanted to tell him something. Would you please have him call when he gets in? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I may as well start. <gasps> Who are you? How did you get in here? Answer me. What, what do you want? I order you to leave my apartment. Why don't you say something? Stop sitting there smiling. How, how dare you just come in and sit on my furniture? Tell me what you want if you don't. I'll, I'll get you out of here. I'm calling my nephew. He'll... Oh, oh, dear, I remember he isn't home. Please. Please. What do you want? Why won't you answer me? I'll, I'll give you whatever you want if you please leave. Please. Oh, thank you, Charles. Lord, oh. I just got in and Linda said you wanted to see me. Oh, Charles. Charles is a, is a strange man in my apartment. What? He's sitting on the sofa. He won't say anything and he won't leave. Did he threaten you? No, no, he isn't doing anything, but... But he won't go. I'll be right there. Now, don't do anything to antagonize him. Aunt Belle. Aunt Belle. Oh, oh, Charles. Charles, thank you for coming. Where is he? Oh, he, he's gone. Oh, thank God for that. I call the police. But how did he get in? Tell me what happened. I don't know. I, I put the chain on the door after you. Then I called Linda, and when, when I turned around, there he was. He must have been in the apartment when we arrived. In the bedroom or the bathroom, maybe. He must have been. I, I certainly didn't let him in, but... Oh, he left in a hurry when he heard me talking to you. Well, I'll check the rest of the apartment just to be sure. No, I, I'm more mad than scared. The, the nerve of him just sitting there smiling, not saying a word. I'll get it. Mr. Gordon? Oh, yes, yes, come in, officer. You uh, reported a prowler? Uh, yes, uh, this is my aunt, Miss Richwood. Just a few questions. You say he was here in the apartment? Yes, sitting right on that sofa. I think he was hiding here when we came in, officer. Uh, we had just got back from the funeral of Miss Richwood's sister. What time was that? Um, about nine. And you didn't see him then? No. Hmm. Tell me, Miss Richwood, what did he do or, or say? Uh, did he threaten you? No, no, he, he wouldn't say a word. He just sat there smiling. Oh. And... When did he leave? Well, when my nephew called, that must have scared him off. Because well, when I turned back, he, he was gone. All right, Miss Richwood. We're searching the rest of the building. We'll put out a bulletin on him. We'll uh, call you if we find a suspect. We'll need an identification. Yes, of course. Good night, now. Uh, good night, officer, and thank you. Aunt Belle, now you've got to come home with me. You can't stay here alone tonight. Oh, I... I have to stay here, Charles. I don't dare leave the apartment. Not if someone's getting in. But then I'll have to stay with you. Oh, no, you don't. No, I'll be all right. Now that we know there's no one here... Well, I, I hate... I'll to... lock the door. No one will get in. And with the police around, I feel doubly safe. Okay, Aunt Bell. But I'll call you when I get home, and I'll be in after work tomorrow. Oh, yes. Do come by, Charles. I'll... I'll have the money for you, uh, for Julia's funeral. Aunt Belle, your money, could this, this guy have taken it? Oh, I don't know. He didn't seem to. Oh, dear. Where'd you have it? In the bedroom. I always thought this was the safest. Oh, oh thank heaven. No, oh, it's here. You sure? All of it? Well, the suitcase is here. He, he couldn't have known. Oh, yes, yes. There's no money missing. Good grief. Oh, it's... It's all there. Oh, I'm not worried, Charles. That man won't be back. But, Aunt Belle, all that money... Oh, don't worry, Charles. I'm going to hide my money in a different place, just in case. Charles, it's time Belle went into a nursing home, or at least a home for the aging. That man last week could have killed her. She shouldn't be living alone. She's doing all right. She's doing all right. And what about us? I'm sick of sharing you with them. Oh, her now. For two years, you've been nursemaid to Belle and Julia. Linda, it had to be that way. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of everything. And if you won't put her in a nursing home, I'll leave you, Charlie. 
No, you won't. You just see. Bell's not going to a nursing home, Linda. Those homes cost money. The state takes care of old people who don't have money. But Bell has money, Linda. Lots of it. What do you mean, lots of it? <sighs> a suitcase so full of hundreds she can hardly close it. I saw it that night the man got in. She opened it in front of my eyes and counted out the 1500 for the undertaker. So great, she's got some money. She can afford a nursing home. Oh, no, Linda. I'm not going to see that money go into a nursing home. That money is going to be ours. You mean we're in her will? She hasn't got a will. But she's got a suitcase full of money. And I'm her only next of kin. So? What good is it to you? I'm the only one who knows it's there. When she dies, Linda, that money is ours. The way I feel now, every cent she spends is coming out of my pocket. But she might live for years. She might. And that's why I want to keep her in her nice little cheap apartment. She doesn't spend more than $15 a week for food. We're going to be extra nice to Aunt Belle, Linda. After all, we're protecting an investment. <laughs> You're back. I can't believe it. I, look, I, I've had just about enough of this. You people simply have to stop coming into my apartment. Get out of here and leave us alone. Well, well, we won't have it. I'm going to tell Charles he has to do something about this. Oh, oh Charles. Hello, Aunt Belle. Will you get over here and get these people out? Oh, Aunt Belle. That man who was here last week. And this time he has a friend. A lady friend, no less. Aunt Belle, you mean that guy is back? He certainly is. And with a strange woman. I'll be right over. Oh, please do. They're upsetting Julia terribly. I think she's afraid of them. Julia? Aunt Belle, Julia is dead. She can't be there. <laughs> company indeed. That suspicious man is back, and with a lady friend, an accomplice, no doubt. It's not easy being alone and old and rich, but Julia, that sort of thing doesn't happen. Belle must be imagining things. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Oh, somebody's been drinking my sugar-free diet seven up. Well, actually, I saved a little. Oh, a bear! Hiya, Goldie. What's brewing? That's Miss Goldilocks to you. Oh, come on, kid. You mean you don't remember me? The cottage, the three chairs, the porridge? Baby bear! In the fur. Been a long time, Goldie. But baby bear... Just call me BB. You drank all the sugar-free diet 7-Up, and I have to conduct another diet drink taste test today. Well, yeah, I saw the sign on the door, a professional taste tester, huh? But how can I conduct my taste test now? Why bother? I tried those other diet drinks, too. You'll notice there's still plenty of them around. Why not ask me? Well, okay, B.B. Tell me, why did you drink all the sugar-free diet 7-Up? I like the taste. Light, fresh, natural, sugar-free diet 7-Up is definitely a unbearably delicious. Mm -hmm. Orange or black? Glad is what happens when you use dial soap. Orange or black? It starts right out with a clean, fresh scent that's like nothing else. Orange or black? To get you going clean and fresh. Orange or black? Washes away the cause of odor on your skin. You just can't buy a better deodorant soap than Dial. And that's saying something. Return to the apartment of Belle Richwood, where, so she says, 
her late sister has spent the day, along with some other questionable companions. Her nephew Charles is with her now, and it seems as though the visitors have left. Belle, look. There's no one in this chair. I know. They're not here now. And this is where you saw Julia in this chair? Yes. Yes, and, and I'm so worried. Where can she be? Aunt Belle, you know Julia passed away. Julia is dead. Yes, I know. I, I feel so terrible about Julia. Do you think we should call the police? No, no, yes. they couldn't help. But, but they could look for her. I remember one time in the city she wandered Aunt away. Aunt Belle, stop it. What? Charles. We cannot look for Julia because Julia is dead. I know. Julia's dead. Then stop saying you saw her in the apartment. It's all right, Charles. I, I won't mention Julia again. But I do wish you'd do something about the other two. The other two? I told you before. The man who comes in here. And now the woman. Oh, yes, those. I simply don't understand how they're getting in. Doesn't it stand to reason that you're imagining there's a man and woman here? Charles, I know real people when I see them. Have you... Have you ever touched them? Oh, heavens, no. But that might convince you. Oh, why should I have to touch them? I, I know they're here. But they never speak, isn't that right? Oh, yes, that's true. They, they don't talk. Aunt Bell, I don't know who or what they are, but there's nothing I can do about them. Well, I can. The next time they show up, I'm calling the police. No, I wouldn't do that, Aunt Bell. You, you couldn't tell them any more than you already have. Well, they can certainly put a stop to strange people in my apartment. And another thing. I'm going to find another place to hide my money. Well, that, that is a good idea. Yeah. Charles, come closer. They might be listening. Now, I want you to know where my money is, just in case. I'm going to hide that suitcase. You know, the one you saw it. Yes. I'm going to hide that behind the refrigerator. Good idea. But where should I hide the other one? Two suitcases full of money? And who knows if that's even all. You see why I want to keep things just as they are? But Charlie... That man that's getting in with, with all that money there. There is no man. Or Julia, either. She's imagining that Julia is back. And she imagines she sees those people, too. They aren't there. Oh, it's, it's just one of those things that comes with age. Hardening of the arteries or something like that. It does things to the brain. But if they're so real to her... Yes, they are real to her. And all that money is real to me. All hours when Bell dies. Yes. As long as no one else knows the money's there. No one does. And you'd better make sure she doesn't talk to anyone. Why don't? I'm the only person she ever sees. She wanted to call the police about Julia. Don't worry. I see her every night now. I'll keep her under control. <laughs> Bell. Oh, Charles, I'm so glad you came by tonight. I know how those people are getting in. You do? Yes, through here. They're coming right through this door. Aunt Bell, that's a closet. It's the clothes closet. Oh, that explains where they live, then. They always come through this door. In fact, that woman came in today, and nice as you please, she picked up my coat and put it on. I, I could have smacked her face. Maybe you should have, Aunt Belle. Well, I, I couldn't bring myself to do that. But you would have found out that woman doesn't exist. She's just in your imagination. Oh, yes? Well, I'm not imagining. Missing a hundred dollars. What? I had the rent money all counted out. It was in an envelope on the kitchen table, and now it's gone. I reported it to the police. Aunt Belle, you didn't. Oh, of course. Why shouldn't I? Because you probably misplaced the money and think it's gone. What did the police say? Well, that nice young officer who came the other time said they'd send out a search for that woman. She's the one. I know. Belle, I don't think you ought to keep so much money around. Well, I, I had thought of putting it in the bank. I was thinking, maybe you ought to let me take care of it for you. I mean, with one case behind the refrigerator. Shh, shh. They'll hear you. Don't let them know where it is. 
Oh. Yes, you're right, Aunt Belle. Is... Is anybody watching? Now? No. Oh, good. Oh, come on. We're going to move the suitcases. Now, you get the one behind the refrigerator, and I'll get the one under the sink. Uh, how did you ever get it back here? I can hardly... Uh, there it is. I'm simply going to put them in the bathroom and keep an eye on them. They say if you really want to hide something, keep it out in the open where no one would think of looking for it. Yes, I've heard of that. Well, come on. Bring that case in here to the bathroom. Right away, Aunt Belle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she won't miss it. Charles. Charles, bring the case in here. Okay, Aunt Belle, I'm coming. There you are. Oh. Put it there in the top next to the other one. No one's going to look for my money there. Now, how about a nice glass of wine? Good boy, Charlie. Now you're using your head. She'll never miss it. But if she does, we know who to blame it on. A bunch of people who don't even exist. The only thing that worries me... What? They exist for her. They're real to her. Well, so what? Does she count her money every day? She probably will now. Like you said, Charlie, you're her next of kin. The money's ours anyway when she dies. We're just taking a little advance. I ordered that bracelet I've been wanting at Wilson's Jewelers. But if she finds any more missing, she might go to the police. Well, then... Why don't you get there before she does? Oh, hello, Miss Richwood. Oh, Mr. Keller, I I'm sorry to bother you. Ah, that's what superintendents are for, Miss Richwood. And you don't bother me a tenth as much as some of the other people in this building. Oh, Mr. Keller, I, I wonder if you'd mind coming upstairs and getting rid of those people. I... I can't seem to make them leave this time. People? What people? Why, all those people in my apartment. Well, sure. I'll throw them out. Come on. I, I really hate to bother you, but my nephew's at work, and I'm afraid to call the police again. Why? I don't want strange people in my building, much less in one of the apartments. Don't worry. I'll get them out. Oh, well, where did they all go? You sure there were people here, Miss Richwood? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm not crazy yet. There was that man and woman who always come in and and two little girls. Well, we didn't pass them on the stairs. And there's no floor above this. How can they get out? Oh, but now my sister's gone, too. Oh, do you think they took her with them? Oh, this is terrible. How am I going to find Julia? Mr. Gordon? Yes? Oh, hello, Mr. Keller. Mr. Gordon, this isn't my business, really, but I don't think your aunt ought to be living alone. What happened? Uh, she called me up today to throw some people out of her apartment. And there wasn't anybody there. Uh, uh, that, that, that's right. And then she started looking for her sister. Yes, she shouldn't be living alone. I'm trying to get another living arrangement for her. I think that's a good idea. I wouldn't want her to be embarrassed, you know, by other tenants. I know. Just thought I'd mention it. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Geller. Aunt Belle, it's me. Oh, come in, Charles. Did I have a day? Belle, oh. you shouldn't have gone to the superintendent. Well, I had to get those people out. I suppose you did. <sighs> Aunt Belle, how about a glass of wine? Oh, of course. I, I have some chilling in the refrigerator. I'll just wash up in the bathroom, if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. Uh, do you want an ice cube in yours, Charles? Ah, uh, sure, fine. Now, let's see. Yeah. There they are. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Charles, what are you doing? I'll be right there, just drying my hands. I didn't get a chance to wash up at the shop. Oh, well, sit down and have your wine. I've got something important to tell you. Yes? I've been robbed. What? A thousand dollars gone from one of my suitcases. No. no I, I had a feeling something was missing, and I, I counted all the money in that particular case. A thousand dollars gone. Are you sure? Maybe you didn't count it right. No, oh, no, no. I counted it twice. In fact, I'm going to count it again with you here to make sure. We'll, we'll count it together, and you'll see. <laughs> Six hundred. Well, that's right. But it should be eight thousand, even with that one thousand gone. You mean there's more missing? Yes, four hundred more. I, I, I just don't know what to do. I, I'm running out of hiding places. Those awful people. Aunt Bell, why don't you let me take care of it for you? You? Yes, I'll keep the suitcases. They'll be safe with me. Those people are stealing from you. You can't keep all that money around anymore. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, you're, you're right, Charles. Uh, I've never done this before. But on Friday, I'm putting it all in the bank. Oh, don't let her, Charlie. Keep things just as they are. I need another 2000 for Wilson's jewelers by Saturday. I'll stall her, don't worry. Even if I have to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. <laughs> not safe to have cash lying around these days, particularly when you have unscrupulous relatives. Strange how the smell of money can drive people to acts they'd never dream of committing. We'll see just how far Charles Gordon is willing to go when I return shortly with Act Three. Never heard of beer on the rocks? No? Swell. The people who brew Budweiser never have thought ice in your beer was such a cool idea anyway. If you only knew how ice cuts down the head and waters the taste. Oh, a chilling thought. A downright tragedy with Budweiser especially. Budweiser is the king of beers. The only beer in America that's beechwood aged. Naturally carbonated. Which means Bud brews its own bubbles. Tiny ones over a dense lattice of beechwood strips. The beer ages the best way, the right way, naturally. But add an ice cube and bloop, there goes all that extra effort. So if you forget to cool enough, bud, skip the cubes and put your Budweiser on ice for a while, on the coldest shelf in your refrigerator. Even if the weight does frost you a little, it'll be worth it. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Growing a lawn and garden is really satisfying. You help create something where there was nothing before. And what you create is good to look at or good to eat or both. Hi, Frank Lieber here for True Value Hardware Stores. They have a wide selection of True Temper tools to help you get those green things to grow. You can take your pick of four tools designed for close-in gardening work for just $1.99 each. Get a regular trowel, a three-time cultivator, a transplanting trowel, or a dandelion digger. All four have chrome-plated finishes and finger-molded grips, just $1.99 each. True Value Hardware Stores have True Temper tools for big jobs, too. A round-point shovel with a hollow back blade and a long ash handle, just $5.44. And a lawn rake with 22 spring steel teeth. And a 52-inch handle, just $3.99. This spring, you can get help getting things to grow. See the True Temper tools at your participating True Value hardware store. Check the yellow pages. Charles Gordon seems to have a good thing going for him. An almost unlimited supply of cash, thanks to his aunt and a few suspicious visitors. But now, Belle threatens to spoil all that by putting her money in the bank. And Charles did say he was going to protect his investment. Charlie, you wouldn't kill her. I'll find some way to stop her from putting that money in the bank. That's not what you said. You said kill. So I said kill. I didn't mean it. Now get off my back. Look, Charlie, I want that money as much as you do. Just let me handle it, will you? And shut up. What are you doing? Protecting our investment. Uh, hello, 
Mr. Geller, this is Mr. Gordon. Miss Richwood's nephew. Uh, fine, thanks. Uh, I hate to bother you, but I wonder if you'd mind running upstairs and seeing if my aunt is okay. She doesn't answer the phone. No, and, and, and she wouldn't be in bed at this hour. Thanks, I'll wait. Charlie, you've got something going I don't like. That was an outright lie. A white lie. I want him on my side. What do you mean, your side? I've been thinking about this a long time. I'll just leave it to me. Uh, yes. Oh, yes, thanks, Mr. Geller. Uh, was her door bolted with a chain? Good. Well, thanks again. I wanted to be sure she was okay. She wasn't feeling too well when I left her tonight. Thanks again. Goodbye. Okay, Charlie. I won't ask any more. Stop worrying, Linda. Tomorrow I'm going to see Aunt Belle and persuade her not to put her money in the bank. It's as simple as that. Oh, I... I thought you weren't coming by tonight. I just wanted to drop in and talk. Well, Charles, what are you up to? What do you mean? Why did you have the superintendent come up and check on me last night? I just wanted to make sure you were all right. I was all right, and you knew it. Charles, I know you took the money. The money you said they must have taken. Ah, uh, Belle, I, I didn't take your money. Why do, why do you think I did? They told me. The little man who wasn't there and his girlfriend. They saw you take it, and they told me. Ah, uh, Belle, I can't reason with you. I can't argue with hallucinations. You just think what you want. Well, I'm getting all the money into the bank where it will be safe from you. Oh, Charles, I'll, I'll give you a chance to give it back before I go to the police. The police? Well, of course. You stole from me and I have witnesses. Such as they are. Anyway, you'll have your money safe in the bank soon, won't you? You bet I will. Yes, well, I, uh, I have to be getting home. You want me to drive you to the bank on Friday? I'll get a cab. Thank you. I'm sorry you feel this way, Aunt Belle. You should have thought of that before you took the money. Oh, uh, Aunt Belle, uh, you'll be sure to lock the door behind me. I always do. And particularly the chain bolt. That's very important. I know that. I'll call you tomorrow. All right. I'll be waiting for you to return the money. I'll be sure and put the chain bolt on. I will. Good night, Charles. <laughs> Aunt Belle, it's me. I forgot something. Uh, uh, what? Open the door. But keep the chain on. I just want to tell you something. Don't take the chain off. Oh, what do you want? <laughs> Pleasant dreams, you old witch. <laughs> Well, did you persuade her? Uh, she won't be putting her money in the bank. She changed her mind. How come? Well, I made her see there wasn't anything to worry about. I finally convinced her the people she was seeing were in her imagination. Ren, you didn't... Didn't what? Hurt her. Linda, what do you think I am? Would I hurt a frightened old woman, much less my own aunt? I just can't help thinking what you said about... The goose that lays the golden eggs. Oh, come on, Linda. Belle's all right. You want me to prove it to you? Call her. No. No, Charlie. I'll take your word. Oh, I want to prove it to you. You think I've turned into an ogre or something? Just over a few lousy bucks? I didn't mean that, Charlie. Well, I'll show you. Hello, Aunt Belle. Everything all right? Linda and I were just talking about you, and, and we wanted to be sure everything was okay. Good. Good to see you tomorrow night, Aunt Belle. She's fine. Oh, hello, Mr. Gordon. Oh, anything wrong? I don't know. My aunt doesn't answer the door. Could you come up and open it with your key? I'm worried. Oh, sure, Mr. Gordon. Now, she might be asleep, but she hasn't been feeling too well lately, and I'm a little concerned. Well, like I said before, a lady like your aunt shouldn't be living alone. Yes, I know. I, 
We've got to do something about her. Uh, she's got the chain on. On Bell? But, Mr. Gordon, look. She's on the floor. Right by the door. We'll have to break it in. Let's go. <laughs> uh, oh, Bill. I, I think she's dead, Mr. Gordon. She is. Look at her head. She must have hit this table. We never should have left her alone last night. She was feeling weak. Uh, I'd better call the police. Yes, please. I'll go downstairs and call them. I'm sure sorry, Mr. Gordon. Yes, hurry, please. Well, dear Aunt Belle, I'm sorry, too. Sorry I didn't do this sooner. It's all you deserve for the trouble you've given me for months. Now, I'm going to get what I deserve. I'll try out of the bed first. Not there. Empty. You clever old bird. I bet you would think of that. Back under the sink. And the other must be behind a refrigerator. Where I never think of looking for them, huh? Huh, Bill? Mr. Gordon, the police are on the way. Thanks. They said not to touch anything. No, no, we mustn't touch anything. That hit on the head must have done it. Poor Olga. Yes, I wish I'd moved her out sooner to a retirement home. Oh, looks like she was planning to go somewhere with those suitcases ready. Oh, those. Oh, she, uh, she always had her memoirs out to look at. Uh, they're full of old photos, school programs. She's shown them to me a hundred times. Ah, uh, that's all they've got at this age, memories. Yes, well, I'm, I'm going to take these along with me. They're really all that's left of Aunt Belle. And I'll give the furniture to some charity. Well, oh, oh say, <laughs> my brother had just got married, and he sure could use... Police! Oh, come in, officer. You're Mr. Charles Gordon? Yes. Any idea how it happened? She must have fallen. She was alone. She she was just like this when we found her. Well, it happens a lot with older people. Oh, bad bruise on the head. Uh, we think she hit that table when she fell. Huh? That looks like the answer. I'll call in. They'll send an ambulance. There'll have to be an autopsy. Oh, and I'll need a statement from both of you. Uh, the door was chained from the inside. It had to be an accident. But I didn't say it wasn't. I only said I'd have to get a statement. She's at peace now. Charlie, I feel nervous about all that money back at the house. Why? No one knows it's there. No one knew she had anything. Little by little, I'm going to bank it, invest it, slowly, so nobody gets suspicious. I'm still nervous about $90,000 in the fireplace chimney. Oh, come on, Linda, I'll take you home. I'm going to Belle's apartment and pack up her personal things. Okay, but don't be all afternoon. I don't like being alone with all that money. Mr. Gordon. I've come to start clearing my aunt's things, Mr. Geller. Would you let me in, please? Oh, sure, Mr. Gordon. I'm sure sorry about your aunt. When's the funeral? We had it this morning. There wasn't anyone but my wife and me. Uh, too bad old people have to live alone. If you need any help, I'll be glad to well, do it. Thank anything. you. I'm just going to pack her personal things. Well, all right. Call if you need anything. Thank you. Now, let's see. I'll start with the bedroom. No use saving any of this stuff. Get it to the cartons and out to the dump. Oh, uh, Linda might want these blankets, though. Ah, poor Aunt Belle. Two torn slips in an empty drawer. I'll have to... What was that? Someone there? Is that you, Mr. Geller? 
No, that must have been the people upstairs. <sighs> Completely empty. I never realized Aunt Bell was... There is someone out there. There's no one here. I'm letting my imagination get me. It is kind of spooky in here, all alone. Oh, that poor old thing, what she must have gone through, alone all the time. No wonder she started seeing things. I'll get all the stuff from the bedroom. And... That was something. Who's there? Answer me, who's there? I heard you. I know there's someone here. I heard you. Now, where are you? Why don't you answer me, damn it? Hello? Oh, Charles, thank God you answered. Linda. Charles, come home quickly right now. Linda, what's the matter? It's this man in the living room. What man? I don't know who he is. He just sits there on the couch, smiling at me. He won't leave and he won't answer me. He won't say a word. Good Lord. Oh, Charles, I'm scared. Come home now, please. Charles! Funny how word gets around when there's money hidden somewhere. It looks as though Charles is in for some strange company of his own. But then, that sort of thing doesn't happen. Linda must be imagining things. I'll be back shortly. People can reach. People can touch. This is Paul Newman speaking. I want to tell you about one of the most courageous actors I know, Bill Gargan. At the height of his very successful career, Bill lost his voice to cancer of the larynx. Naturally, everyone thought Bill was through as a performer. But thanks to his fighting spirit, his determination, and also the American Cancer Society's laryngectomy rehabilitation program, Bill learned to speak again. Now he's giving the finest performances of his career, inspiring others like him to find new voices and renewed confidence as a full life ahead. When your American Cancer Society volunteer calls, think of Bill Gargan and give generously. Join the people who care about people. We want to wipe out cancer in your lifetime. Imagination is a curious thing. It can haunt us, help us, even hurt those who cross the line between imagination and reality. Imagination, the stuff of which dreams and radio mystery theater plays are made. We hope we've teased yours with tonight's story and hope you'll be back for more. Our cast included Bryna Rayburn, Laurie March, George Petrie, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, I don't think such thing as those ghosts. I'm just imagining things. But I see you. I see you. Now, don't... Don't hurt me. Whatever you are, please, stay away from me. You want me to leave the house? I will. I will. If that's what you want, I'll go right down the stairs, walk out of the house, and never come back. Is that what you want? Please. No! Don't touch me! Let me out! Suicide. That's what all the papers say, Mr. Garth. But we know better. It's ghosts. That house is haunted. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
It's almost time for the Easter Bunny, and Sears Candy Shop is ready with brimming baskets of special surprises for little girls and boys. Baskets laden with sweets and super surprises, all filled in the candy shop so they're always fresh. From $2.99 to $29.95. There's a bevy of the bunny's friends, too. Plush Easter toys from $2.49 to $8.99 in the candy shop at Sears. You're listening to the Sports Voice of the Great Southwest. KRLD. Down. KWDAF News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense. Justice, the noblest creation and the highest ideal of man. The foundation of all religion and the cornerstone of every law. Justice, the birthright of every human being on the face of the earth. Justice, we're brought up to believe in it, to expect it. But what about those people who suddenly discover that for them, there isn't any justice? You just don't go around killing people, Eddie. But there are people who have to be killed. The war is over. It's been over for a long time. No, it isn't. Not for me. Eddie, you're home now. Don't you understand? What could we tell the police? The truth. We have no evidence. That's why we have to hunt them down and kill them ourselves. So that justice can be done. We can only have justice through the law. Okay. Tell me. Will the law give us justice? I just told you we have no evidence. Okay. No justice from the law. So where and to whom do we go for justice? Tell me. Does that mean there isn't going to be any justice? Our mystery drama, Only the Dead, Remember, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts and Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There's nothing wrong with drinking Budweiser sip by sip, is there? Well, the brewers of Budweiser think there's a better way. Sipping's fine if you're drinking wine. But Bud is the king of beers. A hearty drink. Look, rinse a 10 or 12 ounce glass with cold water. Then, open a can or bottle of Bud and pour it right down the middle so it kicks up a good head of foam. Now, take a big drink and then swallow big. No sips. That's how it should be done. More taste, more beer drinking enjoyment. Thanks to exclusive Beechwood aging, Budweiser has a smoothness that lets it go down especially easy. Sure, it's an expensive way to brew beer, but brewing beer right does make a difference. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. I found the work to be really challenging, and I enjoy it a lot. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't be in it. People. My orientation all my life has been, you know, to help. I wouldn't have been in Red Cross if I didn't care you know, about people. People who care about other people. It's an opportunity for me to help other people and to see my efforts and my skill pay off. It's just a very rewarding feeling to think that some little thing you've done is going to help somebody else. It's the joy you feel when you've helped someone. People who help other people. It's like anybody involved with Red Cross programs. They want to volunteer and they want to help. They are just that type of person who will go out of their way to do anything 
for anybody at any time, and it carries over to the work they do for the Red Cross. You know, it's like they're there when you need them. The people who are the good neighbor, the American Red Cross. I think that anything you know in this world, if you don't use it when, when it's needed, what good is it? time. Ever since he came home from one of our wars, Eddie Benson has been looking for someone. Those vital years of his life that might have been invested in a career, devoted to a family, have instead been devoured by an all-consuming search as Eddie Benson roamed the length and breadth of America. Supporting himself by his nimble and sensitive fingers, playing the piano, in grimy saloons, in sophisticated night spots, but always looking, always listening, ever alert for a clue that could lead to his quarry. Well, now, tonight, suddenly the manhunt will come to an end in a cocktail lounge in a northwestern city just a few minutes before midnight. Odd, how a search so intense could be climaxed by a discovery so casual. How so serious and deadly a crusade can be capped with a laugh. Uh, <laughs> that laugh. Uh, <laughs> Eddie Benson hasn't heard that laugh in years. That laugh. He would recognize it anywhere. It could only belong to one person. <laughs> and now Eddie's fingers slide softly and swiftly over the keyboard and find a melody, a pretty little melody that has a special meaning for certain people, especially for that comfortable-looking man at the corner table. The man with that laugh. <laughs> so I said to her, My dear, if I were to get married again, it would be the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. Jackson. That's a good one, all right. Oh, what's the matter, Mr. Jackson? Uh, uh, the matter? Are you okay? You, you got a funny look on your face all of a sudden. Hey, Millie. You didn't get sick or something. Who's that? Who, who, who's that playing the piano tonight? Oh, some guy filling in for Woody. You know him? Uh, no. For a minute, though, I, uh... Well, I thought he may have looked familiar. That's just my imagination. Uh, Millie? What is it, Mr. Jackson? Ask him, uh... uh ask him if he'll, uh... You got a request, Mr. Jackson? Yeah, I have. Ask him to quit playing that song. You don't like it? It's kind of a catchy tune. Just give him this. Tell him to play something else. Eddie. You've got a request. Yeah. Request in reverse. A uh, customer says to take this ten bucks and quit playing what you're playing now. What's this character's name? Uh, Jackson. R.J. Jackson. I see. R.J. Jackson. Does he, uh, live around here? No, oh, up on the hill. All kinds of money. Figures. Huh? Uh, it's funny, Millie. How it ends. Where it ends. There were times I thought it would never end. All these years. It kind of took over, you know. It became a way of life. Look, I, I wish I knew what you were talking about. No, you don't, Melanie. I think I'll split. You mean walk out? You can't just walk out on How'd the How'd you like to make ten bucks? Uh, all depends. You keep the ten spot, and as soon as I'm out of here, you go up to him, good old R.J. Jackson, see, and you say to him, Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. <laughs> You're kidding. Say it. You're ten bucks ahead. Yeah, but you can't just quit in the middle of playing. Remember the chickens, Millie. See you around. Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. The more I get to know musicians. Oh, 
Now, how'd that go? Mother and his chickens. Mr. Jackson. Uh, uh, Mr. Jackson, the uh, piano player, he wanted me to tell you something. Yeah? <laughs> I'll bet it's thanks. That's the easiest ten bucks he ever made. Well, what he wanted to tell you was... Yep. Well... <laughs> Well, he said, uh, let me see, uh, Mother Hennessy's chickens are uh, coming home to roost. <laughs> what's that? I'm sure that's what he said. Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming. No. Come no. Hey, Mr. Jackson. <coughs> hey, hey, somebody, give me a hand quick. He's fainted. And you know what time it is? It happens to... I got a message for you, Tom. Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. What? What did you say? Who is this? Hello? 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 Is Bill Trainer at home? No, but I expect him. Who's calling? Is this his wife? Yes, I'm Liz Trainer. Will you take a message? Well, of course. Tell him. Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. Yes. That's all. <laughs> You're joking. Hello? Hello? Oh, well. Hi, darling. Oh, Bill. You know, you just missed a phone call. Oh, never mind that. What'd the doctor say? Oh, things are just fine. He'll be born on schedule. <laughs> you mean you won't take it, girl? <laughs> darling, I'll take whatever we can get. I can't believe it, honey. After all this time, everything but everything is going our way. Uh, you know, Tom worked out the contract. Oh, Bill. Oh, I'm so happy. Ah, uh, we're going to be rich, honey. We're going to own a business, and we're going to be parents. Uh, <laughs> what were you saying about a phone call? Oh, well, a uh, man just called. Very mysterious. Hmm? He said to tell you that, uh, let me see, uh, Mother Hennessy's chickens are coming home to roost. He said what? Well, that's what he said. He hung up. Can it mean anything? Oh, no. No, no, no not, nothing at all. Just, just, just forget it. What about dinner? Bill, dinner? Did, did the man say anything else? Bill, you... It's okay. So Honey, believe me, this is really nothing that should concern you. The key is the name Hennessy. Uh, w w where should we go to dinner? Darling, you're trying to distract me. Hennessy, we... We don't know any Hennessy. Uh, look, honey, I've, j I've just been going at a very fast pace, and, uh... Hennessy's chickens. Hennessy's chickens. That combination is familiar. Darling, I'm really very hungry. I've got it. Oh, I've got it. Your old army outfit is holding a reunion. What do you know about my old army outfit? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, except... Except you and Tom Wilson were in it together. You... You were in Korea. You were prisoners, and... You refused to talk about it. Even to me. Why do you say we're having a reunion? Hennessy. What... Last year, when we moved into this house, I... I was putting a lot of your old stuff away. There was an army picture of you and Tom Wilson. Well, you must have been all of 18. And two other young soldiers. In the middle, an older man, a, a sergeant. And underneath it, you had written, Mother Hennessy's chickens. It, it just clicked in my mind. That, that, that sergeant, uh, that older man. He was all of 26. Well, his name was Hennessy, wasn't it? Yes. And, and, and he looked after all of you like a... Like a mother hen. Yes. And now you're having a reunion. Oh, Bill. What a wonderful person, that Sergeant Hennessy. How I want to meet him. No, you can't. Why? He's dead. Oh. W was he killed in the war? In the prison camp. Bill. That music, that, that piano. Hmm? Why don't you hear it? It's coming from the living room. Someone's playing the piano. I, I didn't hear anyone ring the bell. Well, let's go see. No. But someone's in the apartment. Let's stay here. 
Bill. I want you to stay in the bedroom. Yes, but why? Liz, in all the years we've been married, I never asked you to do anything just because I said so. But I'm asking you now, please. All right, Bill. Just for a while. Hello, Eddie. Front door is open. I just walked in. Well, you're welcome, Eddie. Been a long time. A lifetime. Nice layout. Yeah. I've done well. I'm sure you deserve it. I went to school on the GI Bill, became an engineer. I always said you had the stuff, Billy. I'm going to own a good-sized electronics company. That's nice. Our old buddy Tom, Tom Wilson, remember him? <laughs> Who could ever forget Tom? Well, he's drawing up the contract. He became a lawyer. What about yourself, Eddie? Me? Yeah, a fellow with your talent, the way you could write songs. Like this one, for Hennessy. We all figured we'd hear you doing Broadway musicals, coming up with top hits. Well, I've been too busy. Doing what? Looking for somebody. Looking for an old friend of ours. Bill, I had a phone call. The craziest phone call. Hello, you... Tommy. Eddie. Hey, Eddie Benson. It could only have been you. Where you been hiding? Tom. Billy. I got the greatest news in the world. I found him. Hmm? I finally found him. You finally found who? The uh, needle in the haystack. One grain of sand on the beach. It was such a long time. It was such a long search. Eddie, who did you find? Who do you think? Myers. Myers? R.J. Myers? He doesn't call himself Myers anymore, but it's Still R.J., Robert Joseph, or as Hennessy said, our own little Bobby Joe. Well, that's incredible. Except he's not so little anymore. He's a very portly gentleman these days. You say you found him? I found him. What did you say to him, Eddie? Nothing. Well, how could you just say nothing? Tom... You, Billy, and I, we've got nothing to say to Bobby Joe. I just made sure of where we could find him, and I came here to pick up you two guys. Eddie. I, I have a forty-five. What do you guys want to use? Eddie, what are you saying? I'm saying if we leave now, we can fly to where he is in less than three hours and kill him before midnight. <laughs> into the pleasant, well-ordered, comfortable world of Bill Trainer and Tom Wilson, there suddenly intrudes a strange, terrifying, and ugly word. It's not a word of this world. It's a word that belongs to another world, a world of pain and horror, a world that they thought was dead and gone. We'll continue in that world when I return shortly with Act Two. Great taste in the morning. Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that wholesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. We've been having some fun in our television and radio commercials by using a ball and chain to symbolize the slight overweight problem common to so many of us. We point out that being a few pounds overweight is just a little more difficult for you. Climbing stairs, just walking around, even sitting down can feel, well, like you're wearing a ball and chain. In case you missed the message, it's this. If you really want to get rid of that extra weight, you really have to work at it by exercising and with sensible meals like the Special K breakfast. A one-ounce bowl of Special K, America's favorite high-protein cereal, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee, less than 240 calories, nutritious, and by the way, delicious. So why not begin each day with a Special K breakfast and then keep up the good work? Special K can't help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. Sheriff, Sheriff, they're gone. Lock, stock, and barrel. Those low-down polecats. 
told me this new roof was guaranteed. She's leaking like a seal. I'll help you with some good advice from the Better Business Bureau. Beware of the salesmen who offer such a guarantee. Roof waterproofing requires skill and judgment. It may take several treatments to completely waterproof your roof. Remember, no known process is 100% guaranteed. Thanks, partner. Now we're riding out. Looking for them ornery polecats, sir? No, looking for some pockets before we drown in here. Just another consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. When they were 19 years old, Eddie Benson, Bill Trainer, and Tom Wilson suffered and starved and froze in a prison camp in North Korea. Now it's a lifetime later, and to Tom and Bill, Korea is barely a dream. But Eddie Benson is still stuck deep in the nightmare, still determined to carry out a deadly promise they made to each other long ago. I thought you two guys would be glad to see me. Now. Now we can keep our promise. What promise? Tom, you're kidding, aren't you? Bill, you remember the promise the three of us made? Well, do you? Yes. It was more than a promise. Eddie. It was an oath. Look, Eddie. No, you look, Tom. You look back. An amount of dirt in that prison camp. In Korea. You look back and see three guys, we three guys, were kneeling next to that mound of dirt because it's Hennessy's grave. Look back and hear us. Hear us swear never to rest. Never to stop. Never to know a moment's peace until we kill Robert Joseph Myers Eddie. How could we just kill him? How simple. Blow his brains out. You, you live in another world whether you realize it or not. Now, you just don't go around killing people. But there are people who have to be killed, Tom. You're not in combat. The war's over. Not yet. Eddie, you're home. There's the law. Now, what do you tell the police? The truth. What's the truth? You know the truth as well as I do, Tom. Myers turned rat in Korea. He gave away our escape plan, and he got Hennessy killed for it. But can you be sure it was Myers? We know it was Myers. We knew, didn't we? Bill. I guess we did. All right, tell me this. If we were so sure, why didn't we denounce him six months later after we were freed? Why? You know why, Tom. You were the law student. You said don't denounce him. I said? You said. We had no hard evidence. A smart defense lawyer could get him acquitted at a court-martial. That's what you said. All I said was, I wished we had more evidence. You... You said we would have to get Myers by ourselves. That's what you said. We would find him, kill him, and announce it to the whole world. And that's what we swore we would do. Do you remember, Bill? I remember. Tom. All right, Eddie. All right. That was a long time ago. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. No, but it means it happened in another time, in another place, under different rules. In other words, you're not willing to do it. I can't do it. I'm an attorney, a member of the bar. I simply cannot be an accessory to a felony. Okay. Bill, what's your excuse? I'm not aware that I need an excuse. I just... I spent my life looking for Bobby Joe so that justice could be done. Eddie, we can only have justice through the law. Okay. Tell me, then. Will the law give us justice? We have no evidence. Okay. No justice from the law, then. Tell me. In that case, where and to whom can we go for justice? Well... Does your silence mean there isn't going to be any justice? Eddie. Eddie what? 
Hennessy saved the lives of each of us more times than we can count. If it weren't for him, none of us would be around today. He was betrayed. He was murdered because of... Robert Joseph Myers. Now, is that going to be the end of it? Eddie, there are certain realities... I know what you think, Tom. Bill, I want to hear you say something. I wish I knew what to say. You've got nothing to lose, Eddie. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it comes down to, doesn't it? I'm just crazy Eddie, the piano player. You guys. Pillars of the community. Rich, respectable, gutless. Well, I'll do it alone. Eddie, there must be another way out of this. Tell, tell me about it. Look, I don't want him to go unpunished either. But Eddie... Eddie. Eddie, what's wrong? Eddie? Uh, I don't know. Hey, Eddie. Get, get me a... Drink of water. Tom, hold on. He's going to pass out. Let him sleep. What's the matter with him, Doctor? <clears throat> well, I'd say this man's been living on his nerves for a long, long time. Well, what can we do for him? Let him sleep. For a week, if you can. And uh, whatever you do, see that nothing excites him. I'm afraid that's going to be difficult. Why? Oh, it's a long story. He needs rest. It's calm. Call me tomorrow. Yes, yes, Doctor. Bill. Try to get some sleep, Eddie. I feel so tired. I... I'll just rest a while, okay? Sure. I never felt so tired, except... when we were in Korea. I... Remember? Yeah. Remember... Um... Hennessy would keep us awake while we were on guard. Sure. <laughs> you, you were his favorite. Oh, he didn't play favorites. He, he liked you more than the rest of us because you were the best soldier. Eddie, try to get some sleep. I don't care about Tom, but you, especially you, you have to help me kill Myers. Eddie, you need your sleep. Yeah. I'll sleep a little, and then when I feel stronger, we'll go get him. You have to help me, Bill. After all, if it weren't for you, if it weren't for you... If it weren't for me, what, Eddie? Eddie? Sergeant. Sergeant Hennessy, get me out of here. Hennessy, Hennessy, help me. Please, don't leave me alone. Yeah. Yeah. Don't leave me. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. I, I was having a nightmare. Oh, darling, you, yes. look, you just can't keep torturing yourself. Oh, Liz. Liz, what am I going to do? It'll be all right. No, Liz, whatever I do, it won't be all right. It won't. Oh, surely you just can't. Just can't what? Oh, I better not say any more. Why did Eddie have to show up now? Oh, darling, what are you going to do? I don't know. But I just can't go and kill Myers. It would be throwing away my whole life. Yours as well. Liz, please help me. I... I can't help you. No one can help you. <laughs> It's all set. We have the closing tomorrow. You'll own a factory, Bill, my friend. Yeah. Is uh, Eddie better? Yeah, yeah. He um, He's sitting up now, getting an appetite. In a couple of days, the doctor says he can be out of bed. You know what we have to do, don't you? We have to get word to Myers somehow. I don't like this any more than you do, but we have to warn him to keep out of sight for a while. I suppose. Has he told you where Myers is living? No. He won't even tell me what name Myers is using. Why? I don't think he trusts Tom. He thinks we betrayed him and Hennessy. Bill. Look, Tom, what's the use? In a sense, we have betrayed Hennessy. I know. We've even betrayed ourselves. It's all... It's all part of what you have to do to live. 
Now, we must find out where Myers is. Eddie won't tell me. He might tell me. I'll get it out of him somehow. We'll save him yet, in spite of himself. Freezing. It's so cold. So cold. Bill, darling, you're having a bad dream. What? Wake up. Can we build a fire? Why won't they let us build a fire? Bill! A fire. Bill, please. Why can't why can't they let us have a fire? Bill. Eddie? Yes. Eddie? We gotta break out of here tomorrow night. Hennessy said to tell you. We won't have a chance. We better not. We'll die if we stay here, Tom. He's right, Tom. You guys know where we have to meet? Yeah, Tom and I know. Did you tell Myers? No. Why not? Myers isn't going. Why not? Shut up, Bill. You can't tell who's around. Hennessy says Myers can't cut it. But he's one of us. We can't leave him here. Hennessy says we can't take a chance on him. No. No what? Without Hennessy and us around to protect him, he'll die here. I'm going to talk to Hennessy. I'll convince him. I'll convince him. I'll convince Hennessy that we have got to take Myers. I'll convince him. Bill. Bill, wake huh? up. Darling, you're dreaming again. What? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Bill. I, oh. I, are you all right? Yeah. I'm all right. Oh. Only sometimes I... I don't know which is the dream. This or Korea. Hi, darling. Oh, hello, Bill. Uh, Tom's here. Oh? Yeah, he's inside talking to Eddie. Yeah, I, I've got something to say to Eddie, too. Look, I almost forgot you saw the doctor today. Is there anything... Oh, everything's just fine. Oh, Liz, this should be the happiest part of my life. I, I know, Bill. I'll be right out. Well, how is everybody? I want to thank you for everything, Bill. Oh, it's nothing. I'm leaving tonight. Leaving? Where to? There's a promise I have to keep. See if you can talk him out of it, Bill. He won't listen to me. He won't tell me anything either. I won't try to talk you out of anything, Eddie. I want to go with you. Bill. What for? To help me or to stop me? I don't know. I just feel that I have to face Myers with you. And then... Well, right now, I don't know. Fellas, if this is the way the conversation is going, I have to leave. I can't be part of what happens. Well, Eddie, where are we going? I'll tell you when we get there. What's the matter? Don't you trust me? Are you going to try to save him? I don't know what I'm going to do. We're in this because you tried to save him the last time, you remember? Yes, I remember. When are we leaving? Tonight. All right, I'll go pack. You don't need much. Just a toothbrush, a razor, and a revolver. <laughs> The decisions have been made. Or have they? Tom stays. Bill goes. But what is it that Bill will do when he faces Myers? Right now, his emotions are those of a 19-year-old. But how long can those emotions sustain a man who is close to 40? We'll know when I return shortly with Act 3. Hello, this is Goldilocks. It seems like only yesterday that I was a little girl tasting porridge. You know, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. And now I conduct taste tests on diet drinks. And there's one I must tell you about. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. It has a fresh, natural, delicious taste. It drives my taste meter crazy. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. <gasps> this one's just right. Hi, I'm Nanette Fabre. Eleven million Americans have an untreated hearing problem, including three million school-age kids. I was one of those kids, but I got help. Most hard-of-hearing people can be helped either medically or through amplification. There is a Better Business Bureau booklet that may help you, and it's free. Write Better Hearing Institute, Box 1840. That's 1840, Washington, D.C. You want to hear what you're missing. Pollution. Crime. Substandard housing. Energy crisis. Corruption. Inequality. Vandalism. If you don't like these conditions, you can do something about it. Law Day, May 1st. 
reminds us that the great thing about our system is that people can have a voice in improving it if they understand it and if they use that voice in the many ways possible through involvement like helping to register voters, campaigning for candidates, voting. People of all ages can work to bring about change lawfully. But with almost half the population under 25, youth can make the difference. Learning what can be done and how should begin at an early age. Law Day urges young America to lead the way. Help preserve good laws. Help change bad laws. Help make better laws. A public service message of the American Bar Association and your state and local bar associations. Many of us spend our lives searching for the truth. But what is the truth? When are we closest to the basic essence of our existence? Is it when we have the experience and wisdom of age or the fire and idealism of youth? We keep asking, what is the truth? The answer is, each man must find his own truth. Liz, Liz, Eddie's gone. Yes, I know. You know? Well, I, I, well, I went to his room to see if he was up to having dinner and he... He wasn't there. But I was supposed to go with him. I know that, too. How did you know? I didn't tell you. Oh, darling, you didn't have to tell well, me. Well, then how? I have faith in you, Bill. I have faith that... that in the end, you... you will do what's right. Looks as if I'm not going to do anything with Eddie gone. Well, do you really want to find him? But how? How could I even begin to look? Uh, I... Uh, know where he went. You know? How do you know? Well, well while he was sick, I... I sent his clothes to the cleaners, and in his pocket, there was an airline return ticket. A ticket to where? Now, look, Bill, I, I won't tell you unless you take me with you. Honey, you can't go in your condition. Bill, but we have to do this together. But it might be dangerous. You're wasting our time, Bill. We should be getting the next plane for Central City. <laughs> Oh, boy, I didn't realize how hungry I was. Well, we we missed dinner last night. Now, tell me something. How do we find Eddie in a city this size? Oh, where's the waitress? Oh, miss. Oh, uh, could you bring us the morning paper, please? Well, how's the paper going to help us? Well, the paper would carry ads for the night spots where, where he might have worked. Hey, it's right. If he found Myers, it would probably be in a bar or a club. Yes. Oh, th thank you, miss. All right, darling, you go through the ads, so I'll just sit and finish this coffee, mm -hmm. then I'll start looking for Eddie. Well, I intend to go with you. Oh, no. No, you don't. It's miserable out. It's snowy. Now, you stay in the hotel. I can find him. Bill. Oh, Bill, we won't... We won't find Eddie. What do you mean? Look at what it says. Hmm? Here in the paper. Let's see. Yeah. Eddie is... is dead. What? Musician found shot to death. Police puzzled by mysterious murder. Body discovered in hotel room. No apparent motive. Eddie dead? How yeah. can he be? Only yesterday. Well, do the police have anything to go on? No. It says here no leads, no clues. Liz, it had to happen last night. Someone was waiting for him. It has to be Myers. Well, look, we'd better tell the police. But Eddie said that's not the name Myers is using. We don't know who he is. Liz, Bill. Tom. Tom, what are you doing here? I just got in. I checked the hotels and ran you down. Then you know. Yeah, I saw it in the paper. That's why I flew out here. But, Tom. What? Uh, how, how, how could you... Liz, what is it? Oh, nothing. Poor Eddie. You know what this means? We're both in trouble now, you and I. Why? Well, it's obvious Myers knew Eddie was after him, so he killed him. Tom, we have no choice. We have got to find Myers. While we don't know who he is, he knows who we are. In this big city, who is Myers? He could kill us from ambush and get away with it. Oh, Bill. Of course, there's one thing we could do. Yes? Call it off. How? Take the next plane out of here. That would be our way of telling Myers it's all over. Is that what you want to do? I'm not saying it's what I want to do. I'm listing our options. I think we have to find Myers, Tom. 
This time we can turn him over to justice. Well, it's funny the way it worked out. Eddie had to die so that justice could settle accounts with Myers. We have to find him first. All right, we'll try all the music places. Liz, you stay here and stick close to the phones. If either of us gets a lead, we'll be in touch. Would you ask the piano player where he learned it? <laughs> he learns it from me. I hum it all the time. You know, he says to me, Hey, Millie, I like that. Now he plays it all the time. I knew the man who wrote it, Eddie Benson. Oh, you knew Eddie? Sure, we were good friends. That's a shame what happened to him. He was, uh, I don't know, somebody once told me a word. Uh, mercurial. Yeah, yeah, he was a mercurial character. That he was. <laughs> a guy like him. Oh, he got a lot of people sore at him. Well, at least he left a pretty tune to remember him by. I, I just can't get it out of my head. Everybody loves it. Well, uh, almost everybody. I know one character who didn't. That's so? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it was Eddie's last night on the job. He, he was playing the tune. And... and then this guy, who he comes in here all the time, this guy wanted to give him ten bucks just to quit playing it. You're kidding. <laughs> no, no, it's a fact. Do you know the guy? Oh, sure. He's a regular. Oh, he, he hasn't been in lately. Yeah, one thing I got to say about old R.J. Jackson, he's, he's got a tin ear. R.J. Jackson. Tell me more about him. <laughs> Liz, I found him. How? I'll tell you later. His name is R.J. Jackson. He has a place out in the country up in the mountains. I'm going there now. Oh, Bill. As soon as Tom checks in with you, tell him to take Route 603 to Mountain Lane. Turn right and go up the hill as far as he can. That's the place. But, Bill, there's so much snow. They keep the roads clear up there. Bill, Bill, I must tell you. I know what bothers me about Liz, Tom. I want to get started. Look, how did Tom know to come to Central City? We didn't tell him where we were going. He said he read about Eddie in the morning paper. Yes, but Tom was already in Central City early this morning. How did he get Charlie, here? Are you talking about Tom? Now, I'm sure he... Look, honey, I have got to be on my way. Hi, Tom. Glad you made it. Yeah, I guess this is as far as the car can take us. It's that house on the top of the hill. Yeah. I think we should have sent the police. How? Once again, we don't have the evidence. And what are we going up there for? To kill him ourselves? No. I think we can get a confession out of him. Oh, sure. Now, look, he's human. He's got a guilty conscience. He'll break down. He has to. Now, come on. Boy, looks like Korea, doesn't it? Yeah. Miles and miles of nothing. You could just sink into the snow. It could just be the end of everything. That's far enough. What? <laughs> Stay where you are. Look in the doorway. It's Myers. He's got a rifle. You're trespassing. Now get out of here or I'll shoot. You wouldn't shoot us, Myers. My name isn't Myers. Now get out of here. We have to talk with you, R.J. We're coming up. I'm warning you. Come on, R.J. You can't get away with it. Look out. Hit the ground. Stay low, Tom. There's a line of trees leading up to the house. We'll work our way in. Ill, this guy can kill both of us. I don't think he wants to. Are you crazy? 
This is the man who just killed Eddie last night. Right now, he's scared. Come on. Head for those trees. Keep away! Keep away! Ah! We'll try for that stone fence. Tom, what? put your gun away. I'm not going to let him pick me off. He'll show himself in the doorway when he wants to shoot again. Don't. He's only trying to scare us off. I see him. Don't, Tom. Don't. Ah! I got him. I got him. Look. He's on the ground. Hurry up. Come on. R.J., uh, don't kill me. Don't shoot again. Get me a doctor. You'll get a doctor. But first, we'll get a confession. Now, you sold us out in the prison camp. Confess. No. No, I didn't tell. Let him alone. He'll confess later. <sighs> Let's bring him inside. No, he'll confess now. <sighs> and when Eddie Benson found you, you shot him. No, I didn't. Then who did? I'm hurt bad. Get me to a doctor. Bill... You were always a good guy. Help me. R.J., it was a long time ago. The world's forgotten. I don't even think you could be brought to trial for it. It's just among the three of us. Now, I want you to confess. I didn't do it. Honest. I didn't do it. You did because you didn't show up. You stayed behind. You told the guard. No. What did they give you? Did you have to kill Eddie, too? I didn't kill anybody. Yes, you did. We can get the waitress to testify. She'll tell how you saw Eddie in the lounge, how you passed out. Well, sure, I was scared. Because you guys always thought it was me. But it could have been anybody. You, Tom. What? Or you, Bill. Or even Eddie himself. Let's drag him down to my car and bring him in. Tom. Now, please. Haven't I suffered enough? No, it's not enough. Tom. How did you know about the waitress? Huh? How did you know about the waitress? What? You you told me. No, I didn't tell you anything about the waitress. I just left a message for you to meet me here. Well, I... I well, you must have said something about it to Liz. But I didn't. Well, then, how would I know? How? Because Eddie told you. Eddie? Why would Eddie you tell You said you could get it out of him. Did you tell him that I would never help him, but that you would? Is that how you got him to trust you? Oh, come on. Why would I want to kill Eddie? Because of that talk we had in my house. Maybe unconsciously, both Eddie and I started to think. Why were we always convinced that R.J. was the informer? Because... Because you were the first one to accuse him. And who said not to denounce him to the army? You did, Tom. And who said, let's hunt him down ourselves? You did. Why? Because you knew it would be impossible. You knew we would settle down in a civilian life and forget it. Bill, you've got it wrong. But you didn't figure on Eddie. You didn't figure one of us would spend his whole Bill, life... Bill, you know me. Everywhere you turn, it's you, Tom. You with all the shrewd answers. Why did you have to kill Eddie? Because... Because he was starting to talk just like you are. And then... And then he figured it out. And he wanted to kill me. So... So I had to kill him. It was self-defense. Oh. I had to kill him. It was like it used to be. Back in combat. Kill or be killed. You were the informer. No, no. I informed, but I wasn't the informer. I... I just didn't do what Hennessy ordered. I didn't cover my tracks. That's why they found us. What did they pay you? Nothing. I, I, I wanted us to get caught. You wanted it? Why? Well, Hennessy was wrong. The only time in his life he was wrong. We could never have made it, Bill. All of us would have died in the snow. I was trying to save our lives. Uh. I tried to explain it to Hennessy. I tried, but he wouldn't listen. He would only say in that, that way of his... Trust me, kid. It'll be okay. And I... I keep trying to explain to him. Believe me, I try. Every night. Every night for the last 20 years, I try to make him see it, but... I can't find him. He's out there in the snow. And I can't find him. All right, Tom, we better go back to town. No, no, wait here. I'll find him. He he can't have gone far. I'll find him. I'll explain why I did it. 
He'll forgive me. He'll understand. Stop him, Bill. Stop him. He'll get lost out there. He'll freeze to death. I can't leave you, RJ. <coughs> we'll have to get you to a doctor. We'll come back for Tom. Later. They found Tom Wilson later. Much later. About the time of the spring thaw. The snow, the ice, had preserved the final expression on his face. It was one of peace and calm. As if he had actually found Hennessy. And Hennessy had forgiven him. Well, Hennessy would. He was that kind of man. I'll be back shortly. Oh, sure. You can talk about good-tasting diet drinks, but I know. I'm Goldilocks, and here at my taste-testing laboratory, I taste-test them all. And nobody's been drinking my diet drinks until I tested sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And then, kabloomy. Every bear wanted some. Diet 7-Up is fresh, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. This one's just right. You finally made your gift list. Your neighbor's child is two, your niece is six, and nephew is seven. But before you go to the toy store, there's something else you should do. Write Toys, Washington, D.C., 20207 for a free booklet on toy safety. That's Toys, Washington, D.C., 20207. This message is brought to you by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. dreams. The man does. It's what we call the generation gap. And this is not the distance between parents and children. It is the unbridgeable abyss between what a man is today and what he wanted to be yesterday. But that's because you can only be young once. Something you can do more than once is listen. You can listen again and again to our mystery theater tales. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Mandel Kramer, George Petrie, Bryna Rayburn, and Lon Clark. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Now, what made you do a thing like that? I couldn't help it. It just came out. Ah. We were talking, and I told him about what happened to you that night. Nothing happened to me that night. It was just a mistake. You fainted. There wasn't any mistake about that. Fainted? What kind of a word is that? Old ladies faint. Me, I just conked out for a couple of minutes. Yes, but the reason... Never mind the reason. You still trying to tell me I'm nuts? I didn't see that guy in the elevator? No, I'm not saying that. Because I did see him. Understand? He was some kind of freak, that's all. And maybe somebody who had a bad accident. But a man without a mouth. It's so incredible. I mean, how can anyone live without a mouth? This guy was alive. I seen him. Yes, and he scared you so much. Did you cut that out? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. DAF News. G. Marshall. Welcome to another fearful earful. And speaking of ears, 
The story we are about to direct to yours concerns a different part of the facial anatomy, the mouth. Only in this case, the mouth isn't there. Now, if that sounds incredible, listen carefully to the tale of Joe Gannett, who has the great misfortune of meeting up with men without mouths. If you think you're baffled by the mystery of how men can exist without mouths to breathe with, eat with, and speak with, then imagine the plight of poor Mr. Gannett himself. Kitty, Kitty, I saw another one today. I swear I did. A man without a mouth. Oh, Uncle Joe, you didn't. I'm telling you, I swear it on my mother's grave. He walked into this bar, see? He sat down at the end. He looked straight at me, Kitty, so help me. And he didn't have a mouth. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Men Without Mouths, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Joe Silver and Patricia Elliott. It is sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be... It has a fresh, natural... Hello, this is Goldilocks. It seems like only yesterday that I was a little girl tasting porridge. You know, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. And now I conduct taste tests on diet drinks. And there's one I must tell you about. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. It has a fresh, natural, delicious taste. It drives my taste meter crazy. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. <gasps> this one's just right. Answer on. I'm building a kite out of tissue paper, and it's beginning to rain. What do I need? Umbrella or plastic kite. Answer on. How many children are born with birth defects? 250,000 a year in the United States. What's being done? The March of Dimes supports research, medical service, and public education programs. How can I help? Answer on. <laughs> Like me, the March of Dimes needs money for answers. Give to the March of Dimes. A few good men. That's what the Marines are looking for. A few good college men who want to lead. Men who have enough on the ball to be eligible for PLC. Platoon leaders class. Not everyone can make it. It takes brains. It takes muscle. And summer training is no picnic. It takes men who want a real challenge. The challenge of leading Marine ground troops, flying sophisticated Marine aircraft, or serving as Marine lawyers. If you're one of the few who can make it, there's financial assistance available during school. Up to $2,700 over three years. There's even free civilian flying lessons for qualified men. PLC Ground, PLC Air, PLC Law, for a few good men. Our story begins in the heart of New York City. A heart which, as usual, beats with the rhythm of rushing traffic, the clang of construction, the clamor of commerce, and the never-ending flow of people on their way to meetings, parties, rendezvous, and other human encounters. But we're interested in only one person today. There he is, just hailing a taxi on the corner of East 63rd Street. He's a dapper figure in his blue serge suit, his white shirt, and conservative gray tie. He appears to be a man in his late fifties. Well-dressed, well-tanned, and well-heeled. His name is Joe Gannett. Occupation? Retired. But retired from what? Listen. Hey, taxi! Hey, taxi! Taxi! Uh, 530 West Side Avenue. Right. Nice day for a change, eh? Yeah, that's okay. One day hot, one day cold. 
It's enough to drive you crazy. Yeah. Hey, you know something? You look familiar. Yeah. I'm a movie star, Mac. I'm Raquel Welch. No, I mean it. You really do. You ever live in Chicago? Look, you mind we do without the conversation? I'm from Chicago originally. Moved here about 10, 11 years ago. I could swear I knew you from some... Wait a minute. You're Joey Ganatello. You got it wrong, mister. Listen, you wouldn't remember me, Mr. Ganatello, but I used to drive for Turk Wilson sometimes. You remember Turk Wilson? He's in stir now, of course. They got him on income tax evasion. I don't know no Turk Wilson, and my name isn't whatever you said, you understand? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, uh, no offense, mister. Okay. No offense. And no more conversation. <laughs> Just a minute. <laughs> Uncle Joe! <laughs> well, here I am for the housewarming. Oh, you <laughs> angel. Hey, come on, come on, take it easy. Oh, You're choking me. <laughs> couldn't believe my eyes when those things started to arrive this morning. You like your eyes? First the dishes, then the silver. <laughs> Uncle Joe, that silver. It must have cost a fortune. Hey, 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 do I have to stand out here in the hall? Huh? You got a new apartment. Let me to take a look at it, huh? Of course. Come in. Hey. Only don't look too hard, please. Hey. Everything's still in such a mess. Yeah, it looks pretty good to me. Well, I still got to paint the bedroom, and the drapes aren't up yet, uh, and I'm going to cover the whole wall over there with bookshelves. Yeah. Ira's going to build them for me. Oh? And don't you think it was a good idea to break through to the dining room? Makes the living room look twice as big. We'll put up some kind of divider between the two. Hey, hey who's, who's this we? You got a roommate or something? No, of course well, not. Who's this Ira? Uh, a carpenter. No, a boyfriend. Oh, you got yourself a steady, huh? Why do you think he's steady? Hey, listen, the guy who's going to build your bookshelves and dividers and all that Never stuff. Never mind you know. about that. Come on and see the kitchen. <laughs> hey, stop rushing me. Hey, how about give me a drink first? Oh, of course. I'm just so excited. <laughs> You're not sorry now, huh? About accepting all this? Yeah. Oh, how could I be sorry? My own co-op apartment... I just wish you hadn't paid all that money, Uncle Charlie. Ah, come on. You know why I did it, Kitty. I did it for your old man. This is the kind of thing Matty Russo would have done if he was alive. No, Uncle Joe. That isn't true. My father could have never afforded anything like this. Well, if he hadn't been so dumb about life insurance, it... Ah, what's the use of worrying about that now, huh? He was my best pal, and you... Well, you're like a... You're like my daughter now. <laughs> and if a guy can't help his daughter, then, you Oh, if you, you know. keep talking like that, Uncle Joe, you're going to have a shoulder full of wet tears. Oh, come on, come <laughs> on, huh? Knock <laughs> off that sentimental guy. I mean, next thing you'll be sitting in my lap. And what, what would Ira say about that, huh? <laughs> Uncle Joe? Yeah? I'd like you to meet Ira. Oh, 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 oh so I was right, huh? It's serious, huh? I do like him. I like him very much. Yeah, what does this Ira do? I mean, besides build bookshelves. He's a doctor. A doctor? Hey, nice going, kid. Your mama would have liked that. His full name is Ira Hamill. Mm -hmm. And I didn't just meet him. He was doing some postgraduate work at college. Hey. I've actually known him for almost eight months. I... Told him about you, Uncle Joe. <laughs> sure, why not? I mean, I'm, I'm the only folks you got. I mean, I told him about your trouble. What are you talking about, huh? Now, what made you do a thing like that? I couldn't help it. It just came out. Ah. We were talking, and I told him about what happened to you that night. Nothing happened to me that night. It was just a mistake. You fainted. There wasn't any mistake about that. Fainted? What kind of a word is that? Old ladies faint. Me, I just conked out for a couple of minutes. Yes, but the reason... Never mind the reason. You're still trying to tell me I'm nuts? I didn't see that guy in the elevator? No, I'm not saying that. Because I did see him. Understand? He was some kind of freak, that's all. And maybe somebody who had a bad accident got himself sewn up. But a man without a mouth... 
It's so incredible. I mean, how can anyone live without a mouth? This guy was alive. I seen him. Yes, and he scared you so much. Did you cut that out? Hey, hey wait a minute. This, uh, this, this boyfriend, this doctor of yours, he's, he's not a shrink, is he? No. He's an internist. <laughs> Good. For a minute there, I thought she was trying to make a patient out of me. <laughs> Ira doesn't have any trouble getting patients. He does very well all by himself. Well, I guess I have to meet this terrific guy, won't I? Ask him what his intentions are. <laughs> That's exactly what my intention is, to have you two meet. Anytime you're free. Me? I'm always free, you know that. Look, look, why don't you bring him over tonight, huh? To my place. You really mean it? Of course. I'll call that catering joint. We'll order some, something fancy like that beef Wellington joint, huh? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll open a bottle of that $60 wine and press the pants off. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to impress us. Well, sure, why not? Let him think you're an heiress or something. A, a princess, baby, huh? <laughs> oh, you make me feel like a princess, Uncle Joe. <laughs> Okay, send that up. Look, look, make, make it two bottles. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so long. <sighs> Where's that food? It's not that catering joint. I told him it's 7 o'clock. Ah, I guess that's them, huh? <gasps> oh! Oh, my God! <laughs> Get away from me! Get out of here! Get out of here! Are you sure he's all right? Are you sure it's not his heart? No, his, uh, his heart's okay. Pulse is a little fast. It's just shock, Kitty. He'll be okay. He looks so terribly pale. Uh, he's, uh, he's coming out of it now. Hey. Hello. Hello, Mr. Gannett. I'm sorry to have to meet you like this. Yeah. I'm, uh, Ira Hamill. Uh, the doctor. <laughs> That was a very dirty trick, Uncle Joe. Getting Ira to make a house call by pretending to invite us to dinner. Uh, help me out. Yeah, we better uh, take it easy, Mr. Uh, Gannett. No, I'm, I'm okay now. I'm okay. I just got a little dizzy. How long was I out? I don't know. We got here at 7.15. Rang and rang, but nobody answered. I got word and called the soup. Yeah, listen, did the, did the food get here? It's here. Oh, but never mind about that. What about the wine? I ordered some of that chateau stuff. What uh, happened exactly? Nothing. Uncle Joe, please. The last time you had a blackout. Well, was it anything like the last time? You want the truth. It was exactly like the last time. A man without a mouth. And she told you that, too? Well, it was interesting. I even looked up a book I have, Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine. There is a condition called uh, atresia of the mouth. I'm uh, afraid I don't know of any modern case. So what you're saying is there is no such thing? No, I didn't say that. For one thing, I, I don't really know the whole story. Just what Kitty told me about uh, you seeing this man in the elevator. That's right. He was in the corner of the elevator reading the newspaper... He didn't even look up when I got in the car. But then I turned around and I seen him. Staring at me. So he had eyes, but no mouth. None that I could see. Just skin. Covering everything from his nose to his chin. It was only an optical illusion. I'm sure of it. Mr. Gannett, did you see that man again tonight? No. You mean it was... Something else this time? It was another one. A different man right at my front door. But there was something unusual about him. It was the same thing. He didn't have any mouth. Oh, Uncle Joe. Now, look. Maybe it's freaks. The freaks walk around it. Hey, hey, Martians, maybe. <laughs> what, what do you think, Doc? Could it be, could it be Martians? Well, why should they pick on you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've never done nothing to a Martian. Why pick on me, eh? Hey, come on. Let's forget this junk. Huh? Let's eat that food. How about it, Kitty? You want to warm it up for us? All <laughs> right, Uncle Joe. <laughs> what the heck? We've got mouths. 
Let's use them. <laughs> Is it all right to uh, come in, Mr. Gannett? Is Kitty with you? No, no. In fact, uh, Kitty doesn't even know I'm here. Hmm? Yeah. Why are you? I just thought you and I could have a private conversation, if that's all right. Well, let's let's make it some other time. I was taking a little nap. I'm I'm not feeling so hot. Well, maybe I can help. I am a doctor. It's nothing serious. I think maybe I just bumped my head when I took that fall the other night. You want me to have a look at it? I said no. If I wanted a doctor, I'd call one. Well, I'm not here as a doctor. I'm, I'm here as Kitty's fiancé. Fiancé? Hey. You mean you two are engaged? That's right. Hey, well, okay. Swell. I'm, I'm glad for you. For both of you. I know Kitty means a lot to you, Mr. Gannett. Sure, she means a lot. Her old man was my best friend. She's a kind of a... a legacy. She thinks a great deal of you, too. She, uh considers you her entire family. Look, look, you want my blessing. You got it. You just treat my girl right. That's all I ask. I didn't come for your blessing. I came to ask you a question. Yeah? About what? About you and the syndicate. What was that? I know something about you that even Kitty doesn't know, Mr. Gannett. I know what you used to do for a living. Mr. Joe Gannett seems to be a man who is not merely haunted by strange men without mouths. He also seems to be haunted by his past. Is it possible that the cab driver was correct? That Joe Gannett and Joey Gannettello are one and the same person? And is there any connection between his past and his terrifying present? We'll find out when we return shortly to Act Two. Dr. Ira Hamill may be the most important man in the life of Kitty Russo. And Kitty Russo is the most important person in Joe Gannett's life. But right now, 
Uncle Joe has every reason for wanting Dr. Hamill to go away and leave him alone. But Ira is a persistent young man. As persistent as the memories which Joe Gannett has been determined to forget. Okay. What do you know about me, Doc? I know you were called before the Illinois Crime Commission back in the 50s. You weren't old enough to blow your nose in the 50s. That's right. I don't remember anything about it. But I've read magazines. And I've seen television documentaries. But this uh, man I saw yesterday, this psychiatrist friend of mine, he was just getting his medical degree during the hearings. He remembered you, too. Did you say psychiatrist? I thought it wouldn't hurt to have his opinion. About whether I was nuts, huh? No, he didn't give me any diagnosis. He said he wouldn't even try, not on the basis of such slim evidence. But when I mentioned your name, well, he wondered if uh, Joe Gannett might have once been Joe Gannettello. Was a pretty good guess, wasn't it? Why don't you go home and practice medicine, Doc? You say one word that's going to Kitty. Now I'll really act like her papa and tell her her boyfriend stinks. Believe it or not, Mr. Gannett, I'm trying to help you. But here's how you can help me. Here, go through this. This psychiatrist friend of mine, he did have an idea about these apparitions you've been seeing. The men without mouths? Sounded valid to me. He did, huh? If you want me to, uh... Tell you what he said. Shut the door. Okay. Tell me. He said there was no doubt that they were hallucinations. But the pattern was fairly clear, given your background. What's that got to do with it? What does it bring to your mind? The idea of a man without a mouth. Well, you tell me. All right. Someone who can't talk, isn't that obvious? Man without a mouth is silenced. Mouthless men tell no tales, just like dead men. What are you trying to say, Buster? You calling me a murderer? I'm just reporting my conversation, Mr. Gannett. The psychiatrist said well, your past associations may have left you with strong guilt feelings related to, well, informers or would-be informers. That's that's uh, that's not an accusation, just an analysis. You all through? Well, the only reason I'm telling you this is because it might help. The only reason I want to help you is because of Kitty. I, well, I'd jump off the George Washington Bridge if Kitty said jump, Ira. Okay. Okay, you jump off bridges if you want to. You do anything you please, Doc, except for one thing. You don't say one word about this to Kitty. She really doesn't know, does she? One word, and I'll wrap your diploma around your neck, you hear me? I wasn't going to tell her, Mr. Gannett. I don't want to see Kitty hurt. I love her. Just as you do. Now you can open that door again. Sky Doctor. Do you want another drink, Mr. Gannett? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, Harry, Harry. Another drink, that's right. Here you go. Yeah, right up to the top, Harry. Right up to the brim, huh? Sure, Mr. Gannett. You know, we always take good care of you. Nobody has to take care of me. I take care of myself, Harry. I always have. Sure, that's the way. Look out for number one, right? Hey, Harry. You know something? You know, you got a good, strong mouth. Thanks, Mr. Gannett. A guy can see your mouth, plain as day. And I was thinking of growing a mustache. You figure that wouldn't be a good idea? Hey, Harry, people have to have mouths, don't they? Uh, yeah, they sure do. Listen, some of the people come in here, they got real big mouths, never stop talking for a minute. You never saw anybody without a mouth, Harry, did you? Uh, no, Mr. Gannett, I can't say that I did. Oh, excuse me, I got a new customer. Uh, what can I do for you, sir? Oh, God! Oh, no! No! It's another one! It's another one! Hey, what's the matter? I gotta get out of here! I gotta get out! Hey, Mr. Gannett! Let me what's out! What's the matter? Let me out! <laughs> Come on. 
Kitty. Hello? Kitty. Kitty, it's me. Uncle Joe? Yeah. Kitty, I seen another one today. I swear I did. A man without a mouth. Uncle Joe, you did. I'm telling you, I swear it at my mother's grave. He walked into this bar. He sat down to the end. He looked straight at me, Kitty, so help me. And he didn't have a mouth. Oh, Uncle Joe. You need help. You've got to have help. I thought, I thought maybe that, that friend of yours, a doctor, I thought maybe I, maybe I should see him. I wish you would, Uncle Joe. He could recommend someone. Yeah, yeah, look, I'll see him, Kitty. Kitty, I gotta do something. <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Gannon. Thanks. You've, uh, seen another one, haven't you? Now, listen to me, Doc. I, I know you think I'm nuts. I ought to be seen as a psychiatrist, not a guy like you. I'll be happy but... to give you the name of someone. No, 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 wait, now listen to me. I couldn't take that. I, I mean, go to a shrink. I, I'm just not the type. But, but you, you got a, you got a good head on your shoulders, I, I can tell. I'm not a psychiatrist. But you can help me. I know you can. I got... Ghosts haunt me, just like you said. I never believed in ghosts before, but maybe I've got to believe now. I'm not a spiritualist either. Look, I figured two ways. I could go to a doctor, or I could go to church and talk to a priest. Both might help. That's one thing psychiatrists and the church have in common. They know that confession is good for the soul. What do you mean, confession? It's the uh, root of the problem, isn't it? Guilt feelings build up pressure in the mind. Sometimes the pressure becomes unbearable and, well, there's some kind of explosion. What, you mean in the brain? Well, you might have been right when you used the word ghosts. The ghosts of the past may be haunting you, Mr. Gary. The past, the past, always the past. Why do you have to keep bringing that up? Isn't that the whole point? No! Where do these... Ghosts come from. From hell, that's from where. <laughs> you mean they're ghosts of dead people? I knew I shouldn't have come here. I knew it'd be a waste of time. Now, wait a minute, So Mr. long, Janet. doctor. You were right. You're no shrink. Maybe you're not any kind of doctor. Wait, Kitty and I are having a, a party in a couple of weeks, an engagement party. Have a good time. No, 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 we want you to come. It's important to Kitty that you be there. I don't like parties. So long. I should have gone there in the first place, a stupid kid. It was a stupid kid like that. But... Hey, watch where you're going, Mr. Oh, no. Oh, no. Jimmy. Are you okay? Yeah, fine. Great. Why shouldn't I be? I just want to know. I suppose your boyfriend told you about me seeing him today. Uncle Joe, is it true that you don't want to come to our engagement party? Uh, you know me, Kitty. I'm not... I'm just not the party type. You have to be here. All of Ira's relatives are going to be here, and there won't be anyone at all from my side. Uh, honey, I just can't make it. I... Kitty, I got a million things I got to get this place of mine in some kind of shape. I mean, it's got all kinds of junk laying around. Joe. I, I, okay. Okay, honey, I'll, I'll try to be there. It's next Friday, 8.30, right here. I'll try, honey, I will. So long. Bye. Uh, as, long as, as long as I don't go nuts before then. Maybe I should clean up the junk around here. Look in that closet. Oh, look at all that junk. This Christmas stuff I ain't even open. Yeah. This old typewriter, I should give that away, get rid of it. What am I going to do, write a book? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's the thing, all right. <laughs> Confession's good for the soul. I ought to put down a whole story like the doc said. Maybe he's right about it. Ah, I couldn't even write a postcard. Hey, wait a minute. How about this? 
<laughs> the tape recorder, one kid he gave me last year. She said, I never even touched a thing. Hmm. See, how's this thing work anyway? Yeah, on, off, record, stop, rewind, play. Well, there's nothing very hard about that. Let's see, now, where's the microphone here? Oh, yeah, it is. It plugs in here, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that looks right. Now what? Uh, press the record button, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, testing one, two, three. Uh, testing one, two, three. Okay. Let's see how that sounds. Okay, press the rewind button now. Uh, then press play. Testing one, two, three. It's easy enough. Only how easy is it going to be to confess? Well, only one way to find out. Try. Uh, my name is Joe Gannett. No, that's not starting off with the truth, is it? My name is Joey Gannettello. In 1945... No, 46. I shot and killed a man named Ricky Natans. What the heck am I doing? Am I crazy? I can't put that on tape. That's crazy. I can't. Well, maybe, maybe that's the way. If they're really ghosts, then maybe that's what they want. A confession. Sure, why not? Nobody will hear it. I'll tell everything, but I'll, I'll take the tape and stick it in an envelope. I'll leave it at my desk and write to be opened only after my death. Maybe, maybe that'll make them leave me alone. My name is Joe Gannett. I used to be called Joey Gannettello. I was born and raised in Chicago... I worked for a man named Turk Wilson. In 1946, I shot and killed a man named Ricky Natans. Turk Wilson paid me $200 to kill him on account of Natans talking to the feds about a black market operation. Six months after that, I shot and killed a man named Wally Sanchez. I don't know why Turk Wilson wanted him dead. <laughs> A tape recorder is a wonderful device, a very useful tool in all sorts of situations. And if confession is good for the soul, you might even call it a confessional box. But will it be the right answer for Joe Gannett? Will it provide him with the magic formula to rid him of all his mouthless phantoms? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. And now, another story of the ball and chain, as Kellogg's Special K presents The Library. Welcome to the public library. May I help you, sir? Uh, yes, I'd like to check out... Uh, I'd like to check out Famous Laundromats of the World by Audrey Schnorbart. Sir, excuse me, but isn't that ball and chain you're wearing just like the ones they use in the Kellogg Special K commercial? Uh, this ball and chain? Shh. Yes, that one. How are you going to get rid of it? Well, you know, lots of good exercises. And by eating smart at every meal, starting with the Special K breakfast. Don't you have to watch your calories? Yes, and the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories. Less than 240 calories? Right. A one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's really tasty, and it's going to help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'd say it's <laughs> long overdue, get it? <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with the Special K Breakfast from Kellogg's. The Veterans Administration helps people in little ways. A veteran, let's say, is trying to get an apartment. He is filed to go to school under the GI Bill. Uh, he's not getting any money, but he is entitled. Well, what's wrong with writing a letter saying that under the law, this man is entitled to receive $220 a month? for attending school on a full-time basis. Believe it or not, he can take that letter 
with the little job, take it to the real estate people, and because he has an additional income of $220, although he isn't receiving it, it makes his chances of getting that apartment much better. And, and this is what I mean about the little things. Going beyond the duty every once in a while. Just go a little bit out of your way to help someone. Uh, that's my philosophy. To me, these are little things. But big things to that person. Very a big thing to that person. At VA, we try a little harder to help. Now, two weeks later, the day, Friday. The occasion, the engagement party of Kitty Russo and Dr. Ira Hamill. As you can hear, it's a very happy occasion. But for Kitty Russo, it becomes even happier when the doorbell rings again and she opens it for a very important guest. Uncle Joe! Hey, Kitty, well, here I am, just like I promised. Oh, Uncle Joe! <laughs> gave up hope. What? What for? Didn't I say I'd be here? You never said it very convincing. Uh, hello, <laughs> Mr. Gannon. Uh, Glad you made it after all. Hiya, Doc. Hey, you think I'd miss my little girl's one and only engagement party? Well, huh? I'm glad you didn't. I think Kitty would have been very disappointed. Well, listen, no engagement is official without me, right, Kitty? That's right, Uncle Joe. Oh, you look just marvelous. Ira, doesn't he look well? Oh, yeah, you look Fine, Mr. Gannett. Been feeling okay? Me? I feel like a million bucks. Oh, it's so wonderful to hear you say that. Well, then you haven't had any more um, trouble. Would you like passing out? No, no, no more of that. No, I didn't mean just uh, that. It's all over, Doc. The whole problem. It's all over and done with. Then you're not seeing anything peculiar these no, days. No, no. I figured out what the whole trouble was. Yeah. I changed my brand of booze. Oh, Uncle Jeff, <laughs> come on. <laughs> That's what it was. I changed my booze. I changed my reading glasses. Oh, hey, God. hey, hey, speaking of booze, how do you get a drink in this joint? Oh, you come on with me. I'll show you where the best booze is. Right, go on. <laughs> Say, is it uh, really true? Have the hallucination stopped? Stopped cold, just like that. Oh, I'm really glad to hear that. So am I. For a while back there, I thought I'd have to take a trip to the funny farm. Yeah. <laughs> but it hasn't happened once in the last two weeks. Yeah, well, that... That certainly gives us something to drink to, doesn't it? Yeah, we'll drink the kitty, Doc. I mean, I... Yeah. Uh, you like uh, scotch, right? Yeah, scotch is fine. Um, listen, Ira, I, uh, I said a couple of things here that weren't so nice. I, uh, I hope you can forget. Well, I didn't take any offense. That's good. Uh, Tom, you know, you marrying Kitty, that means you'll be, you'll be stuck with me, too, huh? <laughs> Joe, why do you think it happened? What? What? Losing your ghost. Oh, I don't know. I guess he just got tired of haunting me. Huh? <laughs> oh, hey, hey, now, listen. I mean, I, I got a little present for you oh. and Kitty. No, nothing fancy. Just something small and green. Huh? Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Okay, go on, open it up. Take a look. Well, all right. That's a lot of money, Joe. Well, a couple of kids get married today. They need every penny they can get their hopes out. Oh, I, I still think it's too much. Now, look, look, you got a nice long future ahead of you. Me, most of what I got is past, you know? Well, I know something else, too. The past is the past, Joe. Once it's gone, it's gone. Understand? Hey, Ira, you know something? I think... I think Kitty got herself a pretty good catch. Come on, now, honey, you don't have to do this. I can get my own taxi. <laughs> it's all right, Uncle uh, Joe. I just want to make sure you get home all right. Oh, yeah, I know what you think. You think your Uncle Joe is drunk, <laughs> huh? That's what you think. You just had a very good time. That's well, it. I had a very good reason that my little girl is getting herself engaged. Hey. Now, look at that, huh? You see that? See what? That lady, there's some nerve, huh? Hey, lady! Lady! We were here first! Well, don't worry about it, Uncle Joe. There'll be more than one cat. Yeah, people shouldn't do that. It's not nice to do that. Hey, lady! Are you trying to steal our cab? Oh, excuse me, honey. I'll Uncle just... Joe! Now, listen, lady, you can't do... Oh, 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 my God! Oh, no mouth! Uncle Joe! No! Come back! No mouth! Please! No mouth! Are you 
real lucky man, Joe. You must have good, strong bones because you didn't break one of them. I'm, I'm okay. A car just knocked the wind out of me. Look, I ought to pull some strings where you get me out of this place. Well, they just want you for observation, Joe, just for a couple of days. I'll run home and, and get you a toothbrush and anything else you might need. Uh, and your uh, hospitalization card. Don't forget that. Yeah, yeah that's right. There's no, no use adding insult to injury. Now you're being sensible. Okay. Where's my clothes? Everything's right here in the closet, but don't get any ideas. No, no, I'm thinking about my house keys, sir. And... One in the pockets. Don't worry about the keys. I've got my old set with me. Okay. Well, uh, why don't you go now, then, huh? All right. I'll be back in an hour or so. Ira, uh, listen, I, I want to talk to you alone. All right, about what? You was wrong. What do you mean? Your whole theory was all wet. The skies without mouths. I mean, you thought I was being haunted by a lot of... A lot of ghosts from the past, but you were wrong. Why do you say that? Because I saw another one tonight, and it wasn't a man. It was a woman. What? You heard me. I saw a woman without a mouth, and there ain't a woman in my whole life I ever, I ever felt guilty about. You understand? That sent your whole idea up the flue. Look, Joe, I told you I wasn't a psychiatrist. Now, maybe my diagnosis was wrong, or maybe it was incomplete. It was wrong. There ain't no reason for me to see a woman without a mouth. I never heard a woman in my life, never. All right, all right. So I was mistaken. I'm sorry. And I... I did it all for nothing. I put the whole thing on tape. Well, what were you going to say? What are you talking about, Joe? My my hospitalization card, all that stuff. I, I keep it in the library. I, I, in the top drawer of my desk. Well, don't worry. I'm sure Kitty will know where to look. Yeah. Yeah, she'll know, all right. She'll know exactly. Uh, hey, listen, Ira. Uh, do me a favor, will you? I'm kind of kind of sleepy. Maybe if I took a little nap. Well, sure, Joe. I'll let you sleep. But yes. I'll, uh... I'll see you later. Yeah, fine. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get home. Maybe she didn't find it. Maybe she didn't even look in that envelope. Kitty? Kitty, you here? Kitty? Library door is closed. Two hundred dollars to kill him on account of Nathan oh. talking to the feds about a black market operation. Six months after that, I shot and killed a man named Wally Sanchez. Oh my God! I don't know why Turk Wilson wanted him dead, but I shot him. I got five hundred dollars for that job. I was moving up in the world. The next man I hit was Vic Santioni. And I had to take care of his brother Tommy when he went gunning for Wilson. I never got picked up or even booked for his killings. I was a very lucky man. Kitty. Kitty. What do you think you're doing? Can't you see what I'm doing, Uncle Joe? I'm playing your tape. The one you had in the envelope. Who told you to do that? Didn't you see what it said? Yes. I saw what it said. It said... Not to be opened until your death. Did you think I could resist something like that? You know me, Uncle Joe. Kitty, give me that tape. You know that's why Pop called me Kitty in the first place. Not because my name was Catherine. My name's Mary. But he always said I was as nosy as a kitten, as curious as a cat. Honey, please. Please, you shouldn't have listened to that stuff. It's got nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with me anymore either now. That was the second time, Uncle Joe. What? What did you say? It's the second time I've played the tape. I heard it all the way through the first time, but I didn't believe what I was hearing. Uh, I couldn't. Why? Why did you have to do that? Papa. My poor Papa. Kitty, Kitty, listen to me. 
You don't know about these things. You don't know how a man gets pushed and shoved in this world until he's got to be like an animal. He was worried about her finding out what he was doing. He never stopped worrying about that. Only then they needed a fall guy for a payroll job, and they picked Marty, and he refused. He said he wouldn't take a rap. He wouldn't go to jail and shit. <sighs> Marty had this daughter in college. He called her Kitty. He was worried about her finding out what he was doing. He never stopped worrying about that. Only then they needed a fall guy for a payroll job, and they picked Marty, and he refused. He said he wouldn't take a rap. He wouldn't go to jail and shame his daughter. He said he'd spill for it. Are you listening, oh, Uncle Lord, Joe? Lord. <laughs> made him a problem, you know. I wanted him hit. I said I didn't want the job. Marty was my friend. Him and his daughter was like my family. But they didn't care about that. It was like a, a test of my loyalty. So I had to do it. I had to kill Marty Russo. Is that why you took such good care of me, Uncle Joe? Is that why? I had to do what they said. I had to do it. Kitty, it would have been the same with your papa if he was told to hit me. There's a gun in your desk, Uncle Joe. Is this the gun you killed him no, with? No, put that down, Kitty. That thing is loaded. Tell me how you killed my father. No. Your best friend. Why don't you tell me how? No, please, put it down. Did he know it was you, Uncle Joe? Kitty. Did you look him in the eyes when you shot him? Kitty. The way I'm looking at you? Kitty! God! Is this? It sounds like the whole room is breathing. <laughs> I can hear it breathing. Is that me? Do I hear myself? <laughs> oh, that light. I never saw a light that big. <sighs> but it's, it's not the summer. I can't open my eyes. <laughs> It's too bright. I gotta open them. I gotta... I gotta see where I am. Oh, no! Oh, the, they're here! Oh, the, the, the men with our mouths! The whole army! And the woman... The woman without a mouth! No! Get away from me! Go away! His eyelids are moving. Anesthesia must be wearing off. His pulse is still dropping fast, Doctor. Keep that respirator going. It's no use. We're losing him. Past tense, nurse. We've lost him. I'm sorry. Yeah. So am I. But I'm not sorry to get this mask off. Oh, yes, me too. It always makes me feel as if I have no mouth at all. Well, it seems that Joe Gannett was seeing ghosts, all right. But in this case, they weren't the ghosts of the past. They were the ghosts of the future. Men without mouths clustered around an operating table, not trying to destroy his life, but attempting to save it. I'll be back shortly. Hi, Ms. Goldilocks here. Professionally taste-testing diet drinks can be very difficult, but I've just had to bear with it. Then I found sugar-free Diet 7-Up. It doesn't taste like other diet drinks. It's fresh, light, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up tastes so good that I've taste-tested it hundreds of times. And each time I've given it my seal of approval. Yes, this one's just right. Expecting a baby? Plan to refinish that old crib? If so, make certain that the layers of old paint are completely removed and the new paint you use is labeled non-toxic. Also, remember to check all crib surfaces. There should be no sharp edges. If the teething rails are damaged, they should be replaced. 
For free detailed information concerning crib safety, write Cribs, Washington, D.C., 20207. A public service message from the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Of course, we're really not worried about men and women without mouths at the Radio Mystery Theater, as long as they have ears. And since you seem to have a pair of ears in good working order, we hope you'll turn them to our wavelength again. It's our purpose in life to show you that sometimes it's fun to be afraid. Our cast included Joe Silver, Patricia Elliott, Ira Lewis, and Dan Ako. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Hey, that's wonderful. That's just like a magician I saw once. It's, it's not magic, Effie. It's a natural power. I read somewhere that most of us use only a small portion of our brain potential. Uh, less than 5%. You, you mean that anyone can do what, what you just did? Sure, most people can. I'm sure of it. Oh, hey, Joe, will you teach me? Will you show me how you did that? If you want to, I can show you that and much more. Like what? Well, like hear what I have in my mind without my saying a word. Oh, hey, that'd be neat. We could talk and nobody would hear us. I could show you how to move objects from across the room. We could clean up from here. I could even teach you how to fly. Yeah, like Peter Pan. Hey, look, I'm flying. Hey, you mustn't joke about it, Effie. Oh, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, Joseph. L listen, I wasn't making fun of you. I... I was just happy. Never make fun of me, Effie. You're frightening me. It's all over now. Let's let's finish the dishes. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E. G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents. Welcome to the terrifying world of your own imagination. There are many fearful places that surround us. Ancient houses where ancient whispers never die out. Evil lands where the light of reason vanishes. But the most horrifying of all lies deep inside of us. Few of us dare look into our minds and hearts and souls. And when we do, we find it more than we can bear. This is essentially what happens in this tale of Joseph Compertino, a young man who looked into the souls of others only to find destruction. I don't need your help, Father. I think you do. You told me how much you loved our Savior and St. Joseph. You're not appealing to them now, are you? I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do. The incense, the magic circle on the floor, the cabalistic figures. You're reaching for the hand. What if I am? What good did my piety do? I lost my parents, then Effie. Perhaps I'll get some help now. From Satan? You don't want his help. He doesn't share. 
It possesses. I want revenge, Father. I want to see the man who killed Effie suffer as I am. I want to see him in the same kind of torture. He is, Joe. Believe me, he is in torture. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Horror Within, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Milt Wissoff and stars Don Scardino. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Great taste in the morning. Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. You know, for years we've been talking about the Special K breakfast, a great way to start the day if you have a weight problem. You may have seen or heard our latest commercials, which symbolize the problem of being a few pounds overweight by using this ball and chain. That's the sound effect. But so many people have come to know the Special K breakfast that can help solve weight problems, they sometimes forget that Special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It has eight essential vitamins and iron, and so delicious that lots of folks, kids as well as adults, eat Special K just for the sheer good taste of it. So we don't want you to think that you have to wear a ball and chain to eat Special K. All you need is an appreciation for the finer things of life, a one-ounce bowl of Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, coffee, and maybe a little sugar. The Special K breakfast this can help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. You're 17. Now well, that's plenty old. Old enough to know about things like grass and speed and acid and smack. We probably can't tell you anything about the stuff you haven't already heard, or maybe even found out for yourself. So we don't intend to give you any advice. You wouldn't listen. But the trouble is... Neither will your kid brother. He doesn't know half of what you know. He doesn't know how dope can affect your body. He's never spent a violent night hugging a friend who was on a bad trip or watch a guy nod off in class and fall to the floor. He's just a kid and a real setup for anybody out there selling the stuff. We'd like to warn your little brother. Too bad he doesn't trust us. We can't get to him. But maybe you can. An advertising council campaign. It has been said that a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. In our weird tale, the journey of a thousand horrors starts in the light of day in a most prosaic fashion. Joe Compertino, who has been orphaned, is on his way to visit his uncle in the city. He waits in a diner for a truck driver to finish his meal. Have something to eat, Joe. I'm not hungry. Well, how about a sandwich or some soup? Hey, it's chowder. It's nice and thick. No, Effie, I don't want any. I've got to save the little money I have. It's a long trip. Oh, I wish I were going, too. Any place is better than this. Oh, it's not a bad town, Joe. The people don't mean any harm. Oh, sure, they don't mean any harm. Calling me a nut all the time, making fun oh, of now me. Now relax, Joe. You're getting excited again. Yeah, I guess you're right. They're not worth it. I wish you were coming along. Yeah, but what would your uncle say? I don't know. I only saw Uncle Pietro once when I was a kid. He came to visit. Oh, hey, look, Joe, that truck driver is getting ready to leave. Oh, okay, I guess I'd better... Yeah, sure, sure, you better go. All right, Effie. Yeah. And thanks for getting me the ride. You ready, kid? Let's go. There she is, the pride of the Manchester fleet. Hop in. How far did you say you were going? Elk City. Why? My uncle lives there. Well, what about your folks? Well, they're both... they're both dead. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, you gonna stay with your uncle? I don't know. Sure you will. Blood's thicker than water, right? And God makes brothers of us all. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. Oh, but it's true. God is everything. 
He creates life. And takes it away. Don't say that. All right, come off it, kid. I was just kidding. I believe in God. Do you really believe in him? Do you have so much faith that you can feel him close to you? Oh, well, uh... I do. When I concentrate, I can almost feel as if I'm one with him. He makes me see things. Look, kid, maybe you better get some shut-eye, huh? We got a ways to go yet. I see things happen halfway across the world. Wars, plane crashes, floods. They all come true. Hey, yeah, sure. Uh, you want some coffee? That thermos... No, thanks. Uh, this is a fast day for me. Like my namesake, St. Joseph. It helps me focus my concentration so I can do what I want to do. Like what? Move things without touching them. <laughs> hey, you'll be great in my business. You can offload this truck by yourself. And like St. Joseph, I can fly. Fly? Yes. The Lord gives me these powers. Look, dummy. I gave you a ride against company regulations because I felt sorry for you. Jenny told me you were a nut, but I said, what the heck? But I ain't going to stand for that kind of talk. I'm a church-going Christian, and I don't stand for no blasphemy. Get your butt out of here. You'll regret this. Sure, sure. Just beat it. Take my advice. See you shrink. Lord, make him see the true light. Lead him from transgression. Thank you, Lord. open. Who are you? Uh, I'm Joseph. Joseph Compertino, Uncle Pietro. Peter, kid. Pete Compton. Don't you forget it. What are you doing here? You're the only one I have left. What? Papa, he's dead. A fire in the house. Oh, good Lord. Why didn't you let me know? It happened so suddenly, and there wasn't much left for a funeral. I just buried him in... Oh, you poor kid. Yeah. How about something to eat? No. It's a fast day. Well, you take after your mother. What's wrong with that? Nothing, kid. Nothing. Don't have to jump down my throat. She was a saint. I learned a great deal from my mother. About sin and, and worldliness. Well, what are we going to do about you? Just give me a job and a place to stay. That's all I need. Yeah, I suppose I could use you around the club. You could clean the place, run sandwiches and coffee for the poker players. Poker players? Sure, what'd you think this is, a church? I run a little club here where the guys can get together for a little fun. Got any objections? No, Uncle Pietro. Pete. Call me Pete, I told you. I'm sorry, Pete. I mean no harm. Sure, kid. Now, uh, let me see... Where can you stay? I can't put you up at the house. I haven't got any room. I, I could stay here. It would make it easier for me to keep the place clean. In that case, make yourself at home. Well, how do you like it? The club is crowded. So many men. It's a big night. Friday, payday. Guys want to blow off a little steam. You know how it is. You work in the mill all week. It's a grind. They need something to take the taste out of their mouths. They can find comfort in the Lord. Sure, but now they need action. A little gambling's a lot better than uh, some things they could be doing, huh? Hey, hey, where's the beer? Here, Joe, take this order to the table. Move. Now, uh, but what do you call this jerk, huh? A hamburger. No, kid. Well, I am glad you told me. I'd never know. Hey, what do you know, fellas? It's a hamburger. Ah. <laughs> Is something wrong, Ollie? Nah, nah, nothing much. Just that I ordered a cold cut hero when I get a hamburger. You no, know, he said a hamburger. Who asked you? Look, Ollie, the kid's new. I'll get you a hero. On the house. Nah, nah, nah. Forget it. Forget it. Forget about it. Hamburger's okay. Hey, just watch him, will you? I think he ain't got all his marbles. <laughs> yeah, watch yourself, Joe. Just be a little more careful in the future. He's the one that should be more careful. Not me. Hey, Pete. Get a load of this, will you? Hey, <laughs> look at my old card. That's not bad, huh? Well, suckers, it's going to cost you plenty to see what Pete saw. Now, raise the pot that's on the table, eh? Hey. <laughs> oh, the only 
one with guts. It's okay. Here they are, Brennan. Five little hearts, four through eight, straight flush pal. <laughs> They're not all hearts, Sully. Your whole card is a diamond. Ah, you crazy. It's four hearts, I tell Hey, who switched cards? Oh, it's you, you, you little punk, you bird brain. You must have done it when you were setting the sandwiches. Come on, I'll now. Hey, the kid never touched the card. I'm going to take you apart, squirt boy. You're going to be on. sorry. Hey, come on. Come on, stop it. Come on. Ali. What's wrong with you? It's him. Get rid of him, Pete. Oh. Take it easy, Ali. You're going to be all right. Hey, get a doctor. Somebody get an ambulance. It's too late, Pete. He's dead. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. It's crazy. He thought you had something to do with it. I didn't harm him, Pete. I swear I didn't. I, I wouldn't take a life. Relax, Joe. I know you didn't. The excitement was just too much. Funny about that card, though. It wasn't like Ollie to pluck everything down in a four-flush. I had nothing to do with his death. Yeah, I know. What's eating you, kid? Come on, spell it. I'm the only family you got. Nothing. Just nothing. Okay, don't tell me. I don't give a damn. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle Pietro. Uh, Pete, I wonder sometimes... What? Why nobody likes me. Lots of people do. Who? I like you, that's who. I, I want people to say nice things to me. And you, you gotta learn to give and take. Besides, you keep saying wild things all the time about your powers. Oh, they're not my powers. They're the Lord's. You see what I mean? But it's true. I'm his vessel. We all are. He, he pours his powers into all of us, but only a few like me can retain them. But how do you do it? With faith and deep concentration. You really believe that? Well, of course I do. And so should you. Never lose faith. If you do, you will never have any hope. Swell. Let's wrap it up and go home. You've used that brush on the floor long enough. Save some of it for tomorrow. You really think that you can... I know it. Let me show you. Oh, hold on. Before you deal the cards, let me cut the deck. It makes no difference. Okay, if it makes no difference, let me cut. All right, I'm going to deal five cards face down. We'll both call them. And if you don't call as many as I do, then you promise to lay off? I promise. Well, go ahead, cut. That one. It's the Queen of Spades. No, Peter. It's the Ten of Hearts. Turn it over. Uh, you made a lucky hit. And <laughs> Try it again. Four clubs. Nope. Eight of diamonds. That's two in a row. Still believe it's luck? Let me see that deck. I know every kind of marked deck. You're just wasting your time. You open the deck. You know it's legitimate. Uh, why am I bothering with... Let's knock it off for tonight. Tomorrow's... Here, day. watch this. Nine of spades. Jack of hearts. And uh, uh, three of diamonds. Ah, it's a two of diamonds. All right, four out of five isn't bad, is it, Pete? Um, it's not bad at all. Yeah. I don't know what the trick is. We could sure clean up with it. No, I don't use my powers for profit. Who's asking you to? You can do an act. Amuse the customers when they get tired of playing. You sit in as a dealer for the house, and when things get dull, you do your stuff. Yeah, they'll get a kick out of I it. I don't like to use my powers lightly. Do you want to keep on eating? Okay, okay, forget it. Well, just this once, Pete. But don't ask me again. A deal has been made between Joe and his Uncle Peter. It seems so simple and so innocent on the surface. But like most seemingly simple matters, who knows what currents and eddies swirl beneath the surface? We will, I trust, know more 
when we return shortly with Act Two. Hello, Ms. Goldilocks here, and welcome to my professional taste testing laboratory. Oh, Papa Bear, mm -hmm. could you bring that case of sugar-free Diet 7-Up over here? Another case? Ms. Goldilocks, you're drinking this sugar-free Diet 7-Up like there's no tomorrow. You can't still be taste testing it. Oh, no, Papa Bear. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up has already earned my seal of approval. It's fresh, light, natural. Delicious. I drink it because I love its taste. Now hurry up. Okay, okay. Here. Mm-hmm. This sugar-free diet 7-Up really tastes delicious. Ladies, if you're tired of switching from one diet drink to another, take some advice from Ms. Goldilocks. Try sugar-free diet 7-Up and you'll say, yes, this one's just Right. I'll bear witness to that, Goldie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hal Linden. There's a lot of talk these days about America's energy crisis. Talk about doing without heat, about doing without our cars, about what's going to happen if we run out of fuel. Well, we may not have to run out of fuel if we all work together to conserve the fuel we have. That means turning your thermostats down to 68 degrees during the day and turning them down to 60 at night. It means turning off lights, TV sets, and electrical appliances the minute we're finished with them. It means driving no faster than 50, starting or joining carpools, avoiding the kind of stop-and-go motoring that eats up gas by the gallon. In short, it means saving every ounce of energy we can, every chance we get. So please, do your part to make the fuel supply stretch a little further. For your own sake, don't be selfish. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. This message from the Federal Energy Office and the Advertising Council. We all know that small compromises can lead to large disasters. The pretty lady verging on plumpness who diets with might and main to keep her poundage down knows full well that one excursion into the land of calories can mean a plunge into the worlds of pounds. Shall we then wonder that Joseph's consent to turn his powers to profits for his uncle will inevitably result in the loss of all he holds dear? We shall see as we return now to Act Two of the horror within. That was great, kid. The suckers loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Handelman would have a fit when you called his whole car. He thought I was <laughs> cheating, using a marked deck. He wouldn't believe me even when I told him to pick any deck. Well, don't worry about it. That's just his way. Come on, let's go back to the kitchen. You got a surprise for me? That's right. I don't mind doing the dishes. I hope you can't read everything I'm thinking. I don't try. Good. Joseph. Effie. How about that, kid? You didn't get the whole message. Oh, what are you doing here, Effie? Well, your uncle, he, he said I could work here. Sure, why not? <laughs> Business is good. We need another hand. I figured since you and Effie used to get along so well oh, by home. Thank you, Uncle. Uh, Pete. Forget it. Just make sure you get the dishes done before we close. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, looking for the cleanser. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll do them. You just sit right there. Oh, no, 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 no. I'll wash. You dry. You sure? Well, of course. There's no one to earn my way. Boy, your uncle's a fine man. No, he is. Even though he blows his top sometimes. Yeah, I suppose you don't. Joe? You still do tricks? Oh, they're not tricks, Effie. I followed the example of my patron saint, St. Joseph. And I concentrate my powers like he did. Watch. This knife. Yeah. Hold it in your hands. Yeah. Okay, now keep still. Very, very still. <gasps> Joseph, it's getting warm. Mm hmm? It's bending. There. Oh, hey, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's just like a magician I saw once. It's, it's not magic, Effie. It's a natural power. I read somewhere that most of us use only a small portion of our brain potential. Uh, less than 5%. You mean that anyone can do what, what you just did? Sure, most people can. I'm sure of it. Hey, Joe, will you teach me? Will you show me how you did that? 
If you want to, I can show you that and much more. Like what? Well, like hear what I have in my mind without my saying a word. <laughs> hey, that'd be neat. We could talk and nobody would hear us. I could show you how to move objects from across the room. We could clean up from here. I could even teach you how to fly. Yeah, like Peter Pan. Hey, look, I'm flying. Hey, you mustn't joke about it, Effie. Oh, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, Joseph. Listen, I wasn't making fun of you. I, I was just happy. Never make fun of me, Effie. You're frightening me. It's all over now. Let's let's finish the dishes. I promise, Joseph. I'll never do it again. Well, how do you like it? Oh, it looks beautiful, Pete. Just beautiful. I mean, I can't believe it's the same club. Nothing to it, Effie. Fake brick. <laughs> Tile ceilings and a few yards of drapes. Oh, it... it didn't cost much to change from poker to a supper club. But do you think it's wise? Look at the mob. The joint's packed. People are dressed so nice, too. Hey, maybe we ought to pitch in and help, huh? No, nothing doing. Uh, you and Joe are my star attraction. Well... Now, you do the act like I've seen it, and we can't miss. But that was just for Effie and me, Pete. Uh, I, I don't want to perform. Uh, well, not in front of all these people. Are you scared, kid? Well, that's natural. Everybody gets stage fright. No, no, it's not that. I told you before, my powers are between me and St. Joseph. I can't do it for money. What's the difference if you do it in the back room or out here? Well, he's right, Joe. You can't hurt anybody with a little fun. A little pleasure can help brighten up people's lives. That's you, Joe. What do you say? I'm going to introduce you and Effie. If you want to let me down, that's up to you. And now, folks, settle back. I hope you enjoyed your dinner. Oh, boy, the roast pig was good. Good, good. The Cafe Compton presents its star attraction, the amazing Joseph and Company. They'll entertain you with an act never duplicated before in the history of the entertainment world. They'll read your thoughts, perform illusions. And here they are, the amazing Joseph and Company. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My assistant will be seated on the stage as I go through the audience. She will receive the thoughts I send to her across space. You can give me any kind of message or clue, and I will transmit it to her. I'm in touch with a lady who has a question. Is her name Cindy? What? That is correct. She wants to know if you can tell her what color dress she is wearing. She is wearing a blue gown with sequins. Oh, it is a it's size true. 8, I believe. <laughs> just, the, just the color was enough. All right, uh, you, sir, may I have your note? Thank you. Uh, this gentleman wants to know if his partner is cheating on him. Uh, your wife is... Perfectly faithful, sir. Well, I don't think that's what he meant, but I'm sure he's happy with the answer. Uh, one more question, please. One more question, please. Yes. This man wants... He wants to know... Mr. Handelman, I can read a, a great many thoughts in your mind. Your check is $28.90, and you want to know if a $2 tip is enough. It is not. <laughs> Joe, you were great tonight. Just great. Everybody loved your act. Hey, I better get out front now and help close the place down. Now, we'll have a bite to eat later, okay? Sure, Pete. That Handelman. I hate him. I know, Joey. And you frightened me. And that's why I made a joke out of it. Uh, Joe, you wouldn't... No, have... no, of course not. I'm a servant of the Lord. I do his bidding. That's why I wonder about all this. I, I feel it's wrong. It's a lot better than what you wanted to do to Handelman. Joe, you think you could really... Do what you... If God wills it. Oh, well, then you never will, because he preached love. 
It's hard for me to feel love for someone who... How about me? I love you, Effie. With all my heart, I love well, you. Well, then let's get married, Joe. Yeah, yeah, let's let's get married tonight. Tonight? But how can we? We'll go to Rapid Falls. There's the justice of the peace there. No, and we no, get... Effie, no. We'll wait and get married properly in a church by a priest. Well, if that's the way you want it, Joe, but... Let's do it soon. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you want to marry me in such haste. Yes, Joe, please. Let's get married as soon as possible. Well, that sounds more like desperation than well, romance. I can't explain it, Joe, but... I don't know. I feel... Well, like something terrible is going to happen. I want to be your wife, Joe. I want us to be together for the rest of our life no matter how much time we have left. Good evening, Father. Am I late? No, no, you're the first one here, Mr. Compton. We have lots of time for the rehearsal. Is your nephew's family coming too? Well, I am his family. All that's left of it. And the bride-to-be? She has no one else but Joe and me, Father. I wonder what's keeping them. No, here comes the young man now. Joe, where you been? I called for Effie, and she wasn't there. Is she here? Well, no. Don't worry. She'll be along in a minute. Probably had something to do. No, it's not that. What is it? I can see her. She's walking past the library, and someone is stopping her. She... She's frightened. I must go to her. What was that all about? Uh... Joe, my nephew, he's not like other people. He, uh, he feels things, sees things. Uh, I better call the police, Father. May I? Oh, well, certainly. If you feel it's necessary. She's gone, Pete. Effie's gone. They'll find her, Joe. Just take it easy. You don't understand. Sure I do. You're upset. Uh, come on inside the house. We'll have a cup of tea. He's right, Joe. There's nothing you can do now. The police are searching the town. I can't help. I feel so useless. I've got no contact with her. I can't reach her. She must need me. Don't even think about it, Joe. Just come inside and rest. We'll wait with you. You may have been wrong, Joe. I mean, about what you think you saw. I didn't think I saw Pete. I know I did. She was in trouble, I tell you. And now, nothing. There was no sign of struggle at the library. No one witnessed anything. You don't believe in me. Should I? Yes, I have the powers given me by the Lord. You are his servant, too. Are you sure your powers are from the Lord, Joe? As sure as I am that my name is Joseph, I have devoted my life to him and the ideals of St. Joseph. And I have been heard. Explain it to me, my son. Why? So you can laugh at me? No. I want to help you. Help me. Yes. Father, help me. Then go on. My mother was a saint. She taught me to worship, to revere the memory of St. Joseph, to follow in his footsteps. I tried. I poured all my energies into being one with St. Joseph. I learned how to direct all the forces of my mind and soul. E even when I was very young, I could make objects move. I could see things that happened far away. Then one day she was gone and I was bitter. That's understandable. Well, for a while, I used my powers for, for wicked things. People turned against me and I became an outcast. E even my father drew away from me. Then my father was taken from me. I saw the light. I heard the blessed voice of St. Joseph, and he told me to return. And you're sure the voice you heard was St. Joseph's? Well, of course. Well, who else could it have been? Who else, Joseph? No, Father, no. The voice did not come from within me. Joseph, there are forces of good and evil in the world. And sometimes it's difficult to tell one from the other. 
Perhaps it was not the voice of heaven you heard. Good house tonight. Oh, we're still mobbed. Why don't you get dressed, Joe? In a minute. Any news yet about Effie? Not a word. The cops are still on the lookout, but they haven't found anything. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I told them where it happened and exactly what he looked like. Well, there must be hundreds of guys in town that fit the description you gave. You got to understand. I don't want to understand. I want to find Effie. I tell you, Pete, I saw her just as clearly as I see you now. She was walking by the library, and this guy passes her. And he turns back. Joe, the cops know all that. Well, then why don't they find her? Hello. Speaking. What's that? I see. Sure, sure, I understand. Uh, no, he's here with me. Yeah, we'll be down. What is it, Pete? It's Effie, isn't it? Yes, Joe. The cops. They found Effie. Well, is she... is she all right? Bad news, kid. I want to see her. You will, kid. They want us to identify her. Identify her? What are you saying, Pete? They're waiting for us. At the morgue. All that we feared when Joe agreed to do his act at Peter Compton's club has come to pass. Effie is dead at the hands of a madman. And Joseph Compertino says he was a witness to what happened. It hardly seems possible. But then again, I'm sure you will agree. The impossible is becoming the usual with greater frequency these days. We'll know more when we return shortly with Act Three. like having a cold Budweiser, do you automatically reach for a glass? Well, sure, Bud's a great beer any way you drink it. But without a glass, you're really missing something. Now, take that wonderful Budweiser head of foam, for instance. Those bubbles, tiny though they are, still amount to something pretty special at the top of your glass. Taste appeal and eye appeal. Two results of exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation. It takes a lot longer to brew Budweiser that way. But brewing beer right does make a difference that you can taste. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've really said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Pollution, crime, substandard housing, energy crisis, corruption, inequality, vandalism. If you don't like these conditions, you can do something about it. Law Day, May 1st, reminds us that the great thing about our system is that people can have a voice in improving it if they understand it and if they use that voice in the many ways possible. Through involvement, like helping to register voters, campaigning for candidates, voting, People of all ages can work to bring about change lawfully. But with almost half the population under 25, youth can make the difference. Learning what can be done and how should begin at an early age. Law Day urges young America to lead the way. Help preserve good laws. Help change bad laws. Help make better laws. A public service message of the American Bar Association and your state and local bar associations. find out who killed Effie, Joe must make the journey we all fear. He must look deep inside himself and trace the murderer in his mind's eye. The problem is, what more will he uncover? For if you look into any man's heart and mind, you will always find at least one black spot which he has tried to keep concealed. Why are we sitting here, Pete? Because the lieutenant asked us to wait. He'll be back in a minute. She looks so different, Pete. 
Like a poor imitation. Don't think about it, Joe. I can't think of anything else. I've got to find the man who did it. I'll never rest until I find him. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. I had to check a few things out. Sorry, right, Lieutenant. Now, Joe, uh, you don't mind if I call you that? No. Good. Uh, when did you see this taking place? Well, Pete and I were at the church waiting for Effie mm -hmm. when it flooded my mind. And what time was that? It was about 6.30, 7. I see. And uh, was that the time you felt it was actually happening? I guess so. I, I hadn't thought about it. Well, think about it. With the street lights on? Do you remember anything that uh, might give us a handle? Well, it seems... Well, the library was closed, but the street lights weren't turned on. And I would put it at about 5.30. But uh, you saw it happen in your mind about an hour or so later, huh? Uh, uh, can you explain that? No, I, I can't. Well, did you actually see them go off together? Did they get into a car? No. Well, I mean, I don't remember. All I know is I can see them together, mm -hmm. and I knew something bad was going to happen. What's this all about, Lieutenant? Well, I'm just trying to get things straight. You know, there are some loose ends here. Like what? Well, for one thing, we found the body off Highway 50. That means she was in a car when she died. No, it means she was in a car when she was thrown off on the side of the road. She died hours before then. You mean to say she was thrown out in the middle of the day and no one saw it? Oh, it wasn't in the middle of the day. Doc Hatfield estimates she died about 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, with this new daylight savings time, it must have been pitch black when he... Uh, That's when... right. That means, Joe, your mind's clock was off about 12 hours. You couldn't have seen her walk past the library when you said she did. I can't believe it. Joe, didn't you talk to Effie today? No. But she said she was going to the city to do some shopping. She said she'd be away all day and meet us at the church for the rehearsal. But you called her? Just before I left to meet Pete. I wanted to see if she got back earlier. And she wasn't there, obviously. Now, who answered the phone? Nobody. Where were you early this morning? In bed. Asleep. Say, what's going on? Well, Why all these questions? Every little bit of information helps. I, I, I don't like it. Can I go now? Ah, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, just stay around where we can reach you, Joe. We may have some more information later and maybe some more questions. Joe? Joe, open up. Were you asleep? No, I was just thinking. Did you eat anything today? Yeah. I'll bet. You haven't moved out of your room for days. I'm sorry about the club, Pete. That doesn't matter, kid. But it's all my fault. Forget it. I've got no future without Effie. You cooking something, kid? No. It's funny, I smell something burning. Oh, it's uh, incense. Oh, you're not going through that again, Joe. Forget that stuff, kid. That's not going to bring Effie back. No, but it will put me in contact with her murderer. Don't do it, Joe. It's not right. I spoke to Father Coyle about it. You had no right. He says you're literally playing with fire. He doesn't understand either. Why don't you explain it to him? Let him help. I'm not leaving here until I see things clearly. You don't have to. I brought Father Coyle with me. Uh, you can come in now, Father. How are you, Joe? I don't want you here, Father. Your uncle asked me to help. I don't need your help. I think you do. You told me how much you loved our Savior and St. Joseph. You're not appealing to them now, are you? I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do, Joe. The incense, the magic circle on the floor, the Kabbalistic figures. You're reaching for the hand... All right, what if I am? What good did piety do? I lost my parents... Then Effie, perhaps I'll get some help now. From Satan? You don't want his help. He doesn't share. He possesses. I don't give a damn if he swallows me whole. I want my revenge, Father. I want to see the man who killed Effie suffer as I am. I want to see him in the same kind of torture. He is, Joe. Believe me, he is. <laughs> Uh, 
you ever sleep? I will, after tonight. Pete, I've got him. I don't feel up to riddles, Joe. Who you got? That slimy monster who killed Effie. I've got him dead to rights. You now, look. Don't do anything stupid, kid. Let me call Lieutenant Tawny. He can have No, him. Pete. I don't mean I have him in my room. I've got him in the mind. It worked, Pete. I've been put in touch with him. I want to go on tonight. Joe, without Effie, you haven't got an act. Oh, yes, I have. The biggest show I've ever done. Well, I don't know. Please, Pete, don't stand in my way. You're asking me to walk in the dark, Joe. Square with me. I can't, Pete. You've got to trust me. Then why can't you trust me? You wouldn't understand. Try me. All I can tell you is I'm zeroed in on him. I've got him in my sights, and you can help me nail him. How? Well, billboard my return to the club tonight. Play it up big. Hit the murder angle. Promise the suckers a startling revelation. I guarantee you'll be there. You won't be able to resist the bait. I appreciate your coming down, Lieutenant. Uh, it's okay. I haven't had a night out in a long time. You know, Father Coyle? Yeah, I sure do. How are you, Father? As well as my age, my infirmities permit. How do you like the view, Lieutenant? Isn't it grand? Nearer the angels, Father. Nearer the angels. <laughs> we got quite a crowd here tonight. It's all that publicity about Effie. The buzzards are out in full force. They want to see Joe in action and maybe witness something else. Now, that's the cue for Joe's act. they got to introduce him. Uh, just stand by. I'll be back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now it's time for the star of our show to make his appearance. And here he is. The man you've been waiting to see, the amazing Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tonight, I'm going to skip the usual stunts. I'm not going to waste your time on the usual card tricks and memory gimmicks. I'm going to attempt something never seen before on any stage. But I'll need your assistance since I do not have... Well, since I'm working alone tonight. With your help... I'm going to reach into your minds and read your thoughts. If you have a problem, concentrate on it. With divine guidance, I will resolve them for you, if there are any answers. All I ask of you is quiet, complete silence. Remember, if you have a question, concentrate on it. You're doing fine. I see thoughts swirling in space. Is there a young lady whose initials are J.L. in the room? Hey, that's me! Good, good. Would you please stand up? <clears throat> now, concentrate on your questions. Uh, yeah, I see a ticket in your purse. Would you hold it up, please? Thank you. Well, what you... Now, that's an airline ticket to Las Vegas. Am I correct, Whoa. please? My advice that's is wow. follow your mind, miss. Don't use that ticket. Wait until you can pay your way. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hold it, folks. I have, I have another message. Another message coming through. Uh, jo jo uh, George, George. I can't tell whether your last initial is B or V. George, will you stand up, please? Well, I have good news for you, George. You can stop worrying about your mother. It's not what you think at all. Her pains will disappear soon, and she'll be as good as new. Oh, that's right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, now, now. Ladies and gentlemen, the signals are fading, folks. I want you to let your minds go blank. There. That's it. I feel it coming through now. There's a dark thought taking form. Evil. Malignant. You're coming through now. I read you loud and clear. Will the man with the mark of Cain upon him stand up? I don't blame you for hiding. You've committed a terrible sin. There's only one way out for you. The Bible says, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a life for a life. Stop it, Joseph! I call for silence. What you're doing is wrong! He must pay for his crime, Father. It's not for you to judge, Joseph. Don't try to play God. I am his instrument. Are you sure, my son? 
Look into your own soul. Judge not, lest ye shall be judged. I have nothing to fear. Nothing, Joe? Think about it. Where were you when Effie died? In my room. Yeah, you weren't, Joe. Six o'clock in the morning, Joe. Where were you? She... She was wicked. She was everything my mother warned me about. I worshipped St. Joseph, and she laughed at my piety. She was carnal, and she tried to keep me from my vows of sanctity. St. Joseph, in your name... That's blasphemy, Joe! I removed her from my life for your sake. I exercised her as though she were a cancer on my soul. Pray for forgiveness, Joe! I was tormented all night. I went to her early, and I begged her to leave me. She refused. I told her we would go to Father Coyle and ask for his guidance. She struggled in the car and tried to run away. I stopped her. She was like a, a bird in my arms. A poor dead bird. Come with me, Joe. Everything will be all right. Come. No. No, I must go with St. Joseph. What? I must... Give me the power, St. Joseph. Let me fly to you. Don't! Don't, Joe! It's my kid! Stay away from the window! Uh, what's happening? Look at that! I can't believe it! Look at him suspended in space! He's standing free! Poor Joe. Poor Joe. He tried to reach for heaven and hell at the same time. And he stumbled somewhere in between. Don't take it too hard, Pete. Dad ends somewhere. Yeah, but not on the streets. You really think he killed Effie? Yes. Part of him did. None of us are saints, Peter. We're good and evil intertwined. Most of us can keep the worst of our nature in control. Joe couldn't. He was split right down the middle. Well, one thing is sure. He paid his dues. Let's get him out of here and mark his account paid in full. The worst we feared has happened. Joe took the fearful chance of looking deep inside himself for truth and found that the truth was more than he could bear. I'll be back shortly. Banks have their boardrooms, hotels have their ballrooms, but one of the best-known rooms in the country is Project Hope's Room A. Here is where Americans as groups and as individuals send their contributions to support the work of Project Hope. It may be a check for $5,100 from a college group who held a hike for hope. It may be $2.95 from a 10-year-old who saved it up from summer jobs. It may be a check for $10 from a retired school teacher. It may be $400 raised by a teenager in Massachusetts whose carnivals for hope have become an annual event in his neighborhood. Every contribution, large and small, helps hope continue its programs of treating the sick and training medical personnel to improve health care in many countries. Health is what hope's all about. Help Project Hope reach out. Help Hope reach out. Write to one of the best-known addresses in the country. Project Hope, Room A, Washington, D.C. close the entrance to the cave where murky waters run deep but not always still. From time to time we hear the evil rumbles of the coursing stream but we manage to ignore its babbling and save our sanity thereby. Joseph Compertino lost this snack that civilized man has developed. This veneer that hides some of the ugliness within. He paid dearly for it. Our cast included Don Scardino, Dolores Sutton, Joseph Julian, Robert Dryden, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. 
What does he see in oh, me? Oh, come on, honey. No, I mean it. Well, let's see. You're pretty. <laughs> well, I'm not beautiful. And you're smart. But I'm not brilliant. What can I tell you? He's an artist. All artists are crazy. But the most fascinating women in the world are ready to throw themselves at his feet. Sis, you're pretty fascinating yourself. <laughs> Thanks to you, Bert. Thanks to me? You sent me through college, and there were the trips to Europe. Well, I had to shape you up before I could marry you off. <laughs> And it looks like you got yourself a grand prize. The great Otis Manley Carter. Oh, Bert, I want you to like him. Oh, I like him. I like He's him. He's so sweet, so kind. Except. Except? What do you mean, except? Well, except every time he paints somebody's picture, it seems to me that person dies. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. city. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your own imagination. One day, a young man named Otis Manley Carter stood before a great work of art in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It was a portrait so beautiful that it brought tears to his eyes. And Otis Manley Carter whispered, I would give my soul to be able to paint like that. It was an idle remark, spoken without thinking, on the spur of the moment. How was Otis Manley Carter to know that someone might be listening? Where'd you learn how to paint, Otis? At the Fine Arts Institute. No. I spoke to Professor DeMarco. They flunked you. You didn't show him any ability at all. Where'd you learn how to paint? Oh, come on, Bert. I was born with it. It, it just comes naturally. I've been painting all my life. But you're over 30. How come there are no paintings of yours more than two or three years old? Where did you learn how to paint, Otis? Bert, well, what are you driving at? Answer this, Otis. How come all the people whose pictures you painted are dead? Well, I, I don't Where understand. did you learn how to paint, Otis? Our mystery drama, A Portrait of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Nat Poland. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K Cereal. And by new sugar-free diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Some beer drinkers have funny ideas about beer. They think beer improves with age. Like wine. Well, find a brewmaster, though. You'll find a beer drinker who knows better. The Budweiser brewmaster says it all depends on how beer is aged. Just letting beer sit in lagering tanks makes it older, not necessarily better. That even goes for keeping a case around the house for a couple of months. But there is one kind of aging that's good for beer, the Budweiser kind, beechwood aging. In this kind of aging, something happens. It lets all the flavor of the choicest hops and best barley malt that go into Budweiser get through to you. 
Sure, it takes more time and trouble to brew Budweiser that way, but brewing beer right does make a difference. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. I've found the work to be really challenging, and I enjoy it a lot. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't be in it. People. My orientation all my life has been, you know, to help. I wouldn't have been in Red Cross if I didn't care, you know, about people. People who care about other people. It's an opportunity for me to help other people and to see my efforts and my skill pay off. It's just a very rewarding feeling to think that some little thing you've done is going to help somebody else. It's the joy you feel when you help someone. People who help other people. It's like anybody involved with Red Cross programs. They want to volunteer and they want to help. They are just that type of person who will go out of their way to do anything for anybody at any time. And it carries over to the work they do for the Red Cross. You know, it's like they're there when you need them. The people who are the good neighbor. The American Red Cross. I think that anything you know in this world, if you don't use it when, when it's needed, what good is it? At the age of 30, Otis Manley Carter was hailed as the world's foremost living artist. He towered above his contemporaries. To describe his work, one had to compare it with the great masters of the past. No one, but no one, painting today, could breathe life into a portrait to match Otis Manley Carter. And yet, just one week before his 31st birthday, Otis made the announcement that would stun the civilized world. He was finished with art. Never again would his brush touch paint to canvas. He would neither amplify his statement nor answer questions. He simply disappeared, and only two people in all the world knew the reason why. One, of course, was Otis himself. The other was a detective on the New York City police force, Sergeant Bert Dennison. Bert! Bert, what are you doing? Just having a cup of coffee. We'll be late. Late? All I gotta do is put on my jacket, and that takes all of 15 seconds. Oh, I'm just so nervous. Why? Why? Do you know who's gonna be there tonight? Well, sure. The governor, the mayor, celebrities, the news media, the critics. Lucy, I'm impressed. After all, the showing of a new portrait by Otis Manley Carter has the same impact as a, a, the World Series or a Super Bowl or a heavyweight champion fight. Well, if you put brown <laughs> sugar in coffee, do you save calories? Do you realize, Bert, that we, that you and I... Are going to be sharing the spotlight with Otis? Well, you will, that's for sure. Oh, Bert. What does he see in oh, me? Oh, come on, honey. No, I mean it. Well, let's see. You're pretty. <laughs> well, I'm not beautiful. And you're smart. But I'm not brilliant. What can I tell you? He's an artist. All artists are crazy. But the most fascinating women in the world are ready to throw themselves at his feet. Sis, you're pretty fascinating yourself. <laughs> Thanks to you, Bert. Thanks to me? You sent me through college, and there were the trips to Europe. Well, I had to shape you up before I could marry you off. <laughs> and it looks like you got yourself a grand prize, the great Otis Manley Carter. Oh, Bert, I want you to like him. Oh, I like him, I like He's him. He's so sweet, so kind. Except? Except? What do you mean, except? Well, except every time he paints somebody's picture, it seems to me... That person dies. What are you talking about? Now, tonight's portrait, that actress, Lila Beaumont. She just died suddenly, didn't she? But what does that have to do and with... And in the last five years, he painted four other women. Not one of those women is alive today. Did you know that? No, I, I didn't know that. What, may I ask you how you knew that? I checked Mr. Otis Carter out. World famous artist or not, I ran him through the ringer. Do you mean you actually investigated Otis? Do you Otis? think I'd let you marry him if I didn't? Oh, honestly, I don't know anyone who lives his job 24 hours a day. You never forget you're a policeman. I'm supposed to be on duty 24 hours a day. Otherwise, I'm cheating the taxpayers. Well, well what are you trying to imply about Otis? Nothing. Nothing at all. Just an observation. 
idle observation. Oh, Otis, darling. <laughs> You're having a triumph. It's a fantastic success. Well, what did you think of the painting, Bert? It's a good picture. Oh, listen to him, a good picture. Is that all you can say? Well, it's certainly lifelike. I'll say that. Well, thank you, Bert. Good evening, Otis. Professor DeMarco. May I offer my congratulations? I'm honored, Professor. Honored. Uh, may I present my fiancé and my prospective brother-in-law, Miss Lucy Dennison, Detective Sergeant Dennison, Professor DeMarco of the Fine Arts Institute. How do you do? How do you Glad do? to meet you. Otis, once again, you force me to eat crow. Oh, come on, Professor, please. No, no, I was wrong about you, Otis, wrong, and I don't care who knows it. Yeah, but the truth is, Professor DeMarco, you taught me everything I know. The truth is, you didn't start to paint until after you left me. Congratulations, Otis, on a double triumph this evening. Your painting and your fiancé. Each is a magnificent work of art. Thank you, sir. Now, if you'll excuse me, Sergeant Dennison, Lucy. Yes, sir. Well, he never got over it. And I don't think he ever will. He said I'd never amount to anything. Oh, but you're not serious, darling. How could anyone who knows anything about art... Oh, there's Eric von Heiden. Oh, the one who's doing the new book about Come you? on, come on, darling. I'll introduce you. Uh, give me a rain check. I feel the need for a little refreshment. Oh, <laughs> Excuse me, sir. I, I hope I didn't spill that on... Oh, it's uh, Sergeant... Uh, uh, Dennison, sir. Of course. You know, Professor DeMarco, I've been watching you. What? That sounds ominous. <laughs> Why would a police detective be watching me? Because I'm curious. About what? About the look on your face. What about the look on my face? It's the only look of its kind in the house. How do you mean that? Well, analyze all the faces around you. What do you see? Excitement, boredom, happiness, anxiety. And what's my look? I would say, uh, puzzlement. Actually, you look completely confused. I suppose I am. I still can't understand what happened. Otis was my student at the Institute. And you said he'd never amount to anything. I did. And you can see how it's come back to haunt me. <laughs> Believe me, he had absolutely no concept whatever of the elementary principles of art. He had no feeling for line, for color, for form. I recommended he be dropped from the school. <laughs> you not only go out on a limb, you bring your own saw. Well, six months later, he astounded the entire world with his portrait of that alderman's wife. Mm -hmm. The first of the Otis Manley Carter famous portraits. How do you account for that? Oh, at first, I refused to believe he could paint like that. And maybe he doesn't. Maybe it's all done with mirrors. No, 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 no. There are no mirrors, no tricks. I went up to his studio. He paints. But where did he learn? How did he learn? From whom? There must be an answer. Naturally. But can you even speculate? He probably sold his soul to the devil. You realize that isn't an answer? Of course. But it's the only one I can think of at the moment. Come in. Hello there, Otis. Uh, Hope I'm not disturbing you. No, I was about to take a break. Uh, coffee? Oh, sure, sure. That was quite a bash last night, huh? A uh, necessary evil. Uh, you seem to enjoy it. Uh, but that's why it's an evil. It turns your head and wastes your time and keeps you from doing your job. Which, for me, is to paint. Where did you learn to paint, Otis? At the Fine Arts Institute. Uh, do you touch sugar? Yeah, one lump, thing. Okay. I don't think you learned how to paint at the Institute, Otis. Uh, milk? Yeah, sure. All righty. Professor DeMarco and I had a long talk about you last night. He thought you were a lost cause. Well, he did. And I suppose I was for a while. So? How did the ugly duckling turn into a swan? 
Well, some people are slow learners. DeMarco claims you just didn't have it. No, he was wrong. I always had it, but it was only in my mind. I was showing him nothing but meaningless blobs and dabs. They had to drop me from the school. Mm-hmm. Where did you study after that? Well, nowhere. I just went to the museum every day. That's all? That's all. And then... Oh, one morning I was looking at some of the old masters, just worshipping at the shrine, as it were, and wishing and hoping and praying that one day I, too, could... Well, the most remarkable thing happened. Yeah? Well, suddenly, everything that Professor DeMarco had ever tried to teach me just began to make sense. No, no, it, it, it was more than that. It, it all became a part of the way I feel and the way I think and the way I see. I... I was trembling all over. What did you do? I went home, picked up my brushes, and from that day on... I was a painter. Just like that. Well, in psychology, there is such a thing as the delayed reaction. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, Bert, Lucy and I want you to join us for dinner tonight, hmm? I never refuse an invitation to dinner. Oh. Otis, hmm? your latest portrait of Lila Beaumont. Uh, poor Lila. She never really saw it. She died the day it was finished. What, uh, what did she die of? I don't know, Bert. I don't think anybody does. Sergeant, I wasn't a regular physician. Who was, Doctor? I don't think she had one. She seemed to be one of those fortunate, healthy people who never needed medicine. Mm -hmm. Where did she die, Dr. Caswell? In Mr. Carter's studio. And since my office is just next door... Was she alive when you got there? Just barely. She seemed to show all the signs of utter exhaustion. So that's what I wrote on the death certificate. Afterward, I thought about it and... I asked for an autopsy. Why? I simply couldn't believe it. Well, what did the autopsy reveal? Nothing. I was right in the first place. But I still don't believe it. Again, why? Well, how could she change so radically in such a short time? What do you mean by change? Have you seen the portrait Carter painted of her? Yes, uh-huh. It's just brimming with robust good health. It's exactly how she looked. Just about two months before she died, I saw her get out of the cab that first time she came to Carter's studio. And? Two months later, I was shocked. Why? As I said, I'd never witnessed such a rapid decline. She was losing a lot of weight. Her color was gone. She looked so tired. What did you think was happening? I didn't know what to think. I decided to speak to Otis. After all, I knew him when he was just a starving young artist. One morning... I walked up to his studio. Well, what can I do for you, Doctor? Busy, Otis? Oh, well, Lila Beaumont will be here any minute. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about. Is she under medical care? Well, why? Well, why should she be? Can't you see why? <laughs> what are you talking about? Otis, she looks terrible. Oh, she looks great. She's becoming dangerously thin. She has no color. Doctor, she... are you serious? Are you serious, Otis? Well, I, I don't understand what you're trying to say. You mean you can't see anything wrong with Lila Beaumont? She looks better than ever. Ah, good morning, Lila. Hello, Otis. Well, you're looking just sensational, as usual. Uh, Lila, I'd like you to meet Dr. Caswell. How do you do? Oh, Otis, I, I'm, I'm so tired this morning. Could I have a cup of coffee? Well, coming up, I just have to heat it. Miss Beaumont, I hope you're seeing a doctor. Uh, why? Look in the mirror. Uh, you're very perceptive, Dr. Caswell. Perceptive? It's obvious. For one thing, you're losing your looks. Oh, uh, yes. Your looks are your livelihood. 
Shouldn't you want to do something about it? What can I do? There's a... a man, and he no longer loves me. But a doctor could prevent this ravaging. There's no way a doctor can help me. But you need special treatment. Oh. I would say, Miss Beaumont, that right now you should be in a hospital. Oh, you may be right, doctor. I don't care anymore. I just don't care anymore. Is that the reason she died, Dr. Caswell? Because some guy gave her the gate? They say you can die of a broken heart. What do you say? Well, I just can't see a vital and perfectly healthy woman like Lila Beaumont simply withering away in so short a time. But if her appearance had changed so drastically, how come Otis didn't see it? You'll have to ask Otis. You still haven't told me, Dr. Caswell. What did she die of? But I did tell you. I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> Well, what did she die of? And what, if anything, can it have to do with Otis Manley Carter? Detective Sergeant Dennison has a nagging, indefinable feeling. That's just the trouble. In most of the murder cases Bert has solved, the solution always began with a nagging, indefinable feeling. We'll see where this feeling leads when I return shortly with Act Two. And now another story of the ball and chain, as Kellogg's Special K presents Veronica and Jeff. Oh, Jeffrey, isn't this romantic? Out in a quiet lake at night with you rowing the boat. Yes, Veronica, it's really neat. Jeffrey, what was that? Uh, frogs. Frogs that go bong? Well, they're pretty weird frogs. Oh, Jeffrey, you're such a card. You have a ball and chain, like the ones they use in those Special K commercials. Yes, Veronica, it symbolizes my few pounds of extra weight, but I'm going to get rid of it. How? Uh, by exercising. You know, like rowing this boat and eating smart at every meal, starting with a Special K breakfast. You mean a one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, orange juice, and coffee? Uh, precisely. It's less than 240 calories, and it tastes delicious. It'll help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'll help too, Jeff. After all, we're all in the same boat. <gasps> you have a ball and chain, too. <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with a Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. The Veterans Administration helps people in little ways. A veteran, let's say, is trying to get an apartment. He is filed to go to school under the GI Bill. Uh, he's not getting any money, but he's entitled. Well, what's wrong with writing a letter saying that under the law, this man is entitled to receive $220 a month for attending school on a full-time basis? Believe it or not, he can take that letter with the little job Take it to the real estate people, and because he has an additional income of $220, although he isn't receiving it, it makes his chances of getting that apartment much better. And, and this is what I mean about the little things. Going beyond the duty every once in a while. Just go a little bit out of your way to help someone. All right, that's my philosophy. To me, these are little things, but big things to that person. Very a big thing to that person. At VA, we try a little harder to help. Sergeant Bert Dennison has always been an intuitive detective. He trusted his instincts. He played his hunches. He followed his theories wherever they led him, usually to the right answer. But this time, he has absolutely no idea of how to arrive at the answer. As a matter of fact, at this point, he can't even formulate the question. You really should skip dessert, Bert. I'll only have one uh, helping. Well, do you want to tell him, Lucy? No, darling, I think you should be the one. Somebody's supposed to tell me something? I hope the wedding hasn't been canceled. <laughs> oh, no, no, Bert. Sunday, right on schedule. Otis has something to say to you, Bert. Uh huh? We have a wedding gift for you, Bert. Me? Why? I'm not getting married. Well, that's why you need a gift. Now, on Sunday, Lucy is leaving your house forever. 
Hmm, that sounds kind of stuffy, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> Keep going, darling. You're doing fine. And so, therefore, to make sure you never forget what she looks How like... How can I forget what she Please, looks Bert, like? Please, Bert, don't interrupt. We decided that I would paint a portrait of Lucy and present it to you. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, Can you imagine that you're going to own an original Otis Manly car? Yeah, yeah, but, uh... Well, what is it? Well, these things are valuable. You just can't afford oh, a million dollars couldn't buy all the wonderful things you did for your sister, and I'm grateful. Bert, what's on your mind? Well, isn't it, uh... And bad luck for an artist to paint a picture of his own wife? Oh, now, where did you ever hear that? They all did it. But something is bothering you. Yeah, yeah, well, I, uh... I might as well say it. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I couldn't accept the gift. Bert! Why? I, uh, I just can't explain it. Uh, Otis, you want to give me a gift I'd really like? Well, of course. Well, just promise me you'll never paint a picture of Lucy. Never. Now, what kind of nonsense... I'm asking him, Lucy. What about it, Otis? Well, one of the reasons I'm marrying her is so that I can always have her near me, so that I can always capture those fantastic expressions and moods and... Oh, really? I thought you fell in love with my mind. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I did. It, it's your mind that gives animation and meaning. What about it, Otis? I wish you'd tell me why. I wish I could. But I don't think I can. How about it, Otis? Will you promise? All right, Bert. I promise. Homicide, Lieutenant Callahan. Oh, oh, nothing there. Just sitting around. Hmm? Nobody, just Bert Dennison. Oh, no. Oh, he used to be a million laughs. He isn't anymore. Just stares into space all day. That's so. all. All right, I'll tell him. You ought to get married, Bert. It's a little zing in your life. And now that your sister's gone, you've got no excuse. Why don't you get off my back? Jenny was downtown this morning. She told me she ran into your sister. I'll even buy your... What did you say? Jenny saw your sister Lucy in one of the stores. She couldn't have seen my sister. Lucy and Otis are on a trip to Mexico. See? You don't know everything. Maybe they came back. As a matter of fact, maybe that's why they came back. What are you talking about? Jenny said Lucy didn't look too good. She what? Hey, Bert, where are you going? Bert! Yes, it's Bert. You never told me you were back. Oh, we... We meant to. We, we just got in this morning and we haven't even unpacked. Of course not. How could you unpack when you never packed in the first place? Well, your clothes are in the closet. Bags are up on the shelf. You didn't go anywhere, did you? Oh, we... Uh, I want you to call a doctor. What? There's Dr. Caswell. He's just next door. Well, why do I need a doctor? You look terrible. Oh, well, You've it... lost about five pounds. There's no color in your face. Oh. Oh, it's absolutely true. I, I lost five pounds because I'm on a diet. And if there's no color in my face, it's because I don't have my makeup on. You sound tired. Well, we were up late last night. Why did you want me to think you were in Mexico? Bert, you and I, we've been very close. We've shared a home. You've practically raised Never me. Never mind all that. What are you leading up to? Well, we'd see each other every day and talk to each other and actually... Have no lives away from each other. I wasn't aware of that. So, I thought that since I'm a married woman now, we'd, we'd just have to get used to a, a different kind of relationship. Uh-huh. You can tell when I'm lying. I can tell when you're lying. Otis broke his promise, didn't he? What promise? His promise never to paint your picture. Well, how how can you say that? Why don't I ask you? You can't ask him. He isn't home. All right, I'll wait. But he, he may be gone all day. Who well, rang the bell just before? Oh. Hi, Bert. How are you? I'm oh, just fine. That's fine. You've been painting, I see. Anyone I know? Well, I haven't been painting exactly. I've been cleaning brushes, things like that. You know, chores. Why don't we go inside and see? Bert! Bert! If, if 
you walk into that studio, I, I'll never talk to you again as long as I live. If I don't walk into that studio, you'll be dead in a month. Bert! Oh, Bert, we, we wanted so much for you to have a portrait of me. Yeah, so I see. No, not yet, you don't see. It's nowhere near finished, but, but you can just sense what it's going to be like. Bert, it's going to be my finest work because it's for you. Oh, darling, don't be unreasonable. You can't finish that painting, Otis. Tell me why, why? Otis, Otis. For some reason, you kill the people you paint. What? Don't Bert. interrupt me. It's not easy to say this. And I can imagine what it must sound like, but... Otis, you've painted the portraits of five women... Every one of them is dead. But that has nothing to Each do with Each one my... died on the day you finished the portrait. Bert, have you any idea what you're I saying? I know what I'm saying. And it gets worse. But it's true. What's true? Otis, the truth is you're not a painter. How can you Please, say Please, this isn't easy, sis. Just thank God there were three people who love each other and can solve our problem together. Bert, how can you say I'm not an artist? DeMarco said you had absolutely no talent. DeMarco? He's a jealous old fraud. But he's right. He... When you came to him, you had absolutely no ability, no talent. How do you account for the fact that I you create don't... so many paint, Otis? Bert. Hear God, me out, a... please. Somehow, and I don't even think you're aware of it, you have the ability to drain the life out of your subject. And project it onto the canvas. Well? Uh, I, I, I just don't understand what you're saying. You're not aware of it. You didn't notice that Lila Beaumont was actually dying before your eyes. Just as the others did before her. Bert, tell me this is a joke. No, it isn't a joke. Look at Lucy Otis. She doesn't look ill. I honestly can't see anything wrong. Lucy, look in the mirror. Look. And then tell me there's nothing wrong with you. I don't have to look. I know. Then what I have been saying... It's just that... Uh, well, I, I've been worried. About what? About Otis. Darling, why? Oh, I'm afraid one day you'll get tired of me. Lucy. There's so many women who are after you. But and... you're the only woman I want. You know that. Yes, I know. But sometimes I can't sleep at night. And that's the reason that I'm not looking my best. No, no. The painting's the reason. And Otis, you must promise to destroy that painting. I can't do that. Then I will. Bert, put down that knife. Take your hand off me, Otis. Bert, Bert don't hit him. I won't let you destroy my painting. And I won't let you kill my sister. Otis. <laughs> Oh. Bert! Don't do that! Lucy, Lucy, stop him! <clears throat> that takes care of that. Bert, you're crazy. Get up, Otis. I didn't hit you that hard. Look at what you did to my painting. Do you know what you've done? Yes, I destroyed the canvas. And look. Look at your wife. Look at yourself, Lucy. Your color is back. Bert, you're a fool. If my color is back, it's because I'm, I'm furious. No, no, you've got your old vitality and strength. You'll be all right now, Lucy. Bert! There's really nothing we can talk about. I did what I had to do. And now let's... let's forget it. Except for one thing, Otis. Promise me... your word of honor... that you'll never try to paint Lucy's portrait again. But I can't promise... I'll put it this way, Otis. If you... ever try to paint her portrait... I'll kill you. <laughs> Bert. Callahan? Thought I'd find you down here in the range. Good cluster, except for that one shot off to the left. Probably a faulty cartridge. Sure, it's never the shooter, it's always the show. What is it you're getting out of your system tonight? Nothing, nothing at all. Want to sit down and talk for a minute? About what? About you and me. All right. What is there to say? We have to decide what I'm going to do about you. Why? Because Otis and Lucy were in my office this afternoon. They're two very scared kids. 
They've got nothing to be scared of. Not for themselves. For you. Why? Oh, come on, Bert. You know why they told me everything. Oh, that's nice. My own sister. She only did it because she loves you. Yeah, yeah. She told you how all of them die when he paints their portraits? Yeah. Well, what do you think? Here's what I think. I just put in this application. Application? For your leave of absence. But I'm not... Yes, the... you are. It'll all be done quietly, and when you're better, you can come back to duty as if nothing happened. Where am I supposed to go? There's a private sanitarium. Absolutely the top doctor. Callahan, I'm not crazy. Of course not. You just got this temporary little quirk. But... And it can be ironed out easily. Subconsciously, I guess you just miss not having Lucy around the house. Well, thanks for everything, but I'm not going. In, uh, in light of what happened in the studio this morning, I'm afraid your choices are limited. Callahan! Is it the quiet private sanitarium, or do we have to put you into the city hospital for observation? Callahan, what are you telling me? I'm telling you to hand over your revolver. <laughs> was it who wrote, Heaven keep me safe from my well-meaning friends? It's certainly a sentiment that's shared right now by Detective Sergeant Bert Dennison. All he wants to do is prevent a terrible tragedy. And who's trying to stop him? Those people who truly love him. We're going to meet more well-meaning people when I return shortly with Act Three. Oh, sure. You can talk about good-tasting diet drinks, but I know. I'm Goldilocks, and here at my taste-testing laboratory, I taste-test them all. And nobody's been drinking my diet drinks until I tested sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And then, kabloomy, every bear wanted some. Diet 7-Up is fresh, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. This one's just... Right. By the year 2000, our country will be guided by today's youth. Learning how our legal process works should start now through involvement, like working to register voters, helping to elect candidates, campaigning, and voting. Law Day, May 1st, urges young America to lead the way, help preserve good laws, help change bad laws, help make better laws. A public service announcement of the American Bar Association and your state and local bar associations. Young I may be, but still I'm a man. Just turn 18 and I'll do what I can. Find me a place where I can be me. Get ready for life. Success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll free 800 841 or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. The best mirror is the face of an old friend. Sergeant Dennison stares at Lieutenant Callahan. Stares at the look on Callahan's face. It's a strange look. A look that's a mixture of pity, concern, and fear. And suddenly Dennison realizes that this must be the same look that showed so often when he knew he had to arrest a suspect who might turn out to be criminally insane. I have to have your service revolver, Bert. You want to put the cuffs on me too, Callahan? Cut it out. Why not? It's a pinch, isn't it? It's nothing of the sort, and you know it. Now look, 
Let's go to your apartment, pick up some stuff, and I'll drive you to this place myself. Tell me something. Tell me something, Callahan. Don't you want to hear my side of it? Bert, you slugged your brother-in-law. You slashed the painting. Mm -hmm. So? That's violence. You and me, we never used violence in the line of duty? Justified force. Slice it anyway. Why am I wrong this time? Because what you say is crazy. Callahan, you and me, we're not the new breed of college cops who know everything. But still, we're very careful about that word crazy. You mean you really believe Otis kills people by painting their portraits? Yeah, yeah. Quit fighting me. Work with me. How? Oh. Let's go out and get some expert testimony. This is the doctor who attended Lila Beaumont just before she died. And he's completely stumped by the whole thing. Yes, I was dissatisfied with the cause of death. Dr. Caswell, you said you didn't believe she could change so radically in so short a time. I did say that. You also said you couldn't see how a splendid physical specimen like Lila Beaumont could just wither away. Yes, I remember. I did say that, too. And even though you signed a death certificate which listed exhaustion as the cause of death, nobody really knew what she did die of. Well, I've since... I've since come to believe that she really could have died of exhaustion. But you said... Exhaustion plus loss of the will to live. But you were convinced there was a mysterious cause. I didn't use that word. But, Doctor, you led me to believe... I was merely ventilating some doubts, some misgivings. But the other women who died... I wasn't there. I don't know. You told me, Professor DeMarco, that Otis had no concept of the basic principles of art. I did. No feeling for line, form, color. I think I said something like that. And since those things can't be learned, there was no way he could become a painter. Oof. It's a relative thing. Well, you even went so far as to say the only way he could have learned them was if he'd sold his soul to the devil. That was a figure of speech. He never did learn to be a painter. Something happened. He found a way. Or was given a way, who knows, to draw the vital essence from a living thing and put it on canvas. I don't think I could agree with... I can prove it. Look at everything he's done. He's never painted an inanimate object. Just the face, the body, but no clothes, no furniture, no jewels, no decorations. I'm sorry if I gave you the wrong impression. Maybe... Maybe I was jealous. Jealous of what? You said he had no talent. Maybe that was a lie I told myself. Maybe I resented his youth, his promise. After all, I never fulfilled mine. Yeah, sure. And besides, you really don't want to be remembered as the art teacher who flunked Otis Manley Carter. I guess that's the simple answer. I wish there were such a thing as a simple answer. Bert, you've got to admit it's really a comfortable room with a great view of the ocean. And you've even got a refrigerator. Yeah. What happens now, Callahan? Well, uh, starting tomorrow, the doctors will begin working with you. You'll be straightened out in no time. I see. I'm the one who has to be straightened out. That's how it is. Even if I happen to be right. Those are the rules of the game, Bert. But I'm not crazy, Callahan. You and I know what crazy is. Crazy is when most people don't agree with you. You're a big help. I'll come up and see you this week. I can hardly wait. I better ring for the guy to come let me out. What do you mean you got a ring? Well, uh, the door's locked from the outside. Huh? It doesn't mean anything, Bert. It's just routine. I mean... Yeah, I know what you mean. I might as well be in jail. You wanted something, Sergeant? Yeah, yeah, Jerry. How can I make a phone call? Well, you can't. What do you mean, I can't? 
Well, first couple of weeks you can. It's like you got to get your interviews and orientation. But I have to make a phone the call. The doctor says... Forget said... what the doctor says. Look, part of the treatment is to isolate you completely from your former environment. But I have to know if my sister is okay. She's okay. How do you know? Because if she wasn't, you'd be told about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, listen, uh, I know, I know I can't make a phone call. But if I could, where would I make it from? Well, there's a phone outside, at the end of the hall. There is, huh? Jerry, I want to show you something. What? <laughs> Answer it. Hello? Lucy. What? Lucy. Yes, I'm Lucy. Who is this? It's me, Bert. Who? Bert. No, Bert, is, Bert isn't here. Could you call back later? Lucy! Oh, my good Lord. Lucy. What? Who? He's painting your picture again. I've got to destroy that canvas. Don't move, Bert. Otis. Don't make me shoot, Bert. Now listen, Otis. You don't want to kill me. No. I'd only want to hit you in the foot, but I'm a bad shot. Now please, Bert, just stand still. What are you doing with the gun, Otis? That's not your style. Callahan called us. He said you'd broken out of the sanitarium. He wants me to phone him if you show up here. You're killing Lucy. Look at her. Bert, I... I don't know what's gotten into you. Is the painting almost finished? What business is that of yours? What more has to be done on the painting? Well, I just have to finish her mouth. Uh, and when you do, she's going to die. How can you believe... Do you love her, Otis? You know I love her. Destroy the painting. I can't. I can. I'm warning you, Bert. I'm going to walk into your studio... And I'm going to destroy that painting. You take one step and I'll shoot you. I'll just have to take the chance. I've still got five bullets in the gun. All of them can't miss. Otis, look at Lucy. Look at her. She's dying. That, that isn't true. You don't want to see it. If I could prove you're killing her, would you destroy the painting? How could you prove that? Would a... you destroy the painting? Yes. Let's go back into the studio, Otis. Oh, no, no, it, it's a trick. You've got the gun, Otis. What are you afraid of? Come on. All right, you just stand near the wall. You keep far away from my painting. It's beautiful. Then why do you want me to destroy it? Because it is Lucy. Why did you bring me in here to prove? That you kill a living thing when you paint it. On the windowsill, Otis, that flower, that geranium, paint it. Sure, I'll put the gun down and pick up the brush and you'll jump. You're afraid, you're scared. You're crazy, what you're saying is crazy. Here's your chance to prove it, Otis, paint that flower. And if nothing happens to it, I promise, I'll go away quietly. I... Well? I will. <laughs> quick sketch. How do you like it? It's beautiful. All right, now look at the windowsill. Look at the geranium. Go on, look at the... Ger oh. Oh, no, Bert, what... What, 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 what... what happened to it? You can see what happened. I, don't, I can't believe it. But it's true. The color is gone. It's wilted, withered. It's dead. No. They're all dead. Lila Beaumont. Those other women. And Lucy is dying. Before it's too late, Otis, you know what you have to do. No. Otis! You, you, you do it for me. No. You have to destroy that canvas yourself. Why? Because I can't keep watching you guarding my sister forever. You have to put an end to it yourself. I promise I won't paint Lucy. You must never paint anybody. Uh, I, I don't know if I can give it up. But you're not really a painter, Otis. Somehow you, you, you stumbled into some sort of mysterious power. And now you've got to give it up. Destroy the painting. I'll go back to Lucy. 
How do you know I just won't finish it? How, how can you trust me? I trust you. I trust you because you love Lucy. Lucy? Lucy. Mm-hmm. Who Lucy. is Lucy. Oh. Oh, Bert. Oh, I, I must have been napping. Oh, I feel so refreshed. Yes, you're looking better. Bert, what are you doing here? You're supposed to I be... I know, I know. I'm supposed to be crazy. I don't worry about it. Otis, Bert's here. Shouldn't we... No, no, no. The... No, I... everything's all right. I better go straighten everybody out. Especially Callahan. The painting? Is it my imagination or did... What happened to the painting? I, um... Decided to give it up. Otis, how could you? Will you... Will you love me even if I'm not a famous painter? But, darling, I... Sure she'll love you, Otis. She'll love you even more. She'll love you even more. There's a lot of truth to that, Otis. A woman in love with a famous man has a problem. She wants him all to herself. But she is forced to share him with the entire world. And you ladies in our audience might think about it, too. If you're married to a man who doesn't seem to be going anywhere special, look on the brighter side. Just think. You can have him all to yourself. I'll be back shortly. Hi, Ms. Goldilocks here. Professionally, taste-testing diet drinks can be very difficult, but I've just had to bear with it. Then I found sugar-free diet 7-Up. It doesn't taste like other diet drinks. It's fresh, light, natural, delicious. Sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that I've taste-tested it hundreds of times, and each time I've given it my seal of approval. Yes, this one's just Right. A March of Dimes message from a basketball great. Hi, I'm Bill Bradley. There are many things that go into making a professional athlete. But let's start at the beginning. Being fortunate enough to have been born healthy. A quarter of a million children are born each year with birth defects. The March of Dimes is a team of professional scientists, doctors, educators, working to prevent birth defects. Please help give tomorrow's children a good start. Give to the March of Dimes. What killed those women? A coincidence of real and fancied illness? Or can an artist really drain the life from a living creature and transform it to canvas? Certain primitive tribes agree. It's taboo to create a likeness. Maybe they know what they're talking about. Our cast included Nat Poland, Marion Seldes, Jack Grimes, Jackson Beck, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I told you I burned it. And you know that's a fairy tale that no one will believe. I don't care whether you believe it or not. Now, are you coming with me? Where? To talk to your Colonel Blake. He won't see you. Oh, 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 I think he will. Goodbye, Carol. It was nice knowing you. I think... You will kindly step back into your room, Monsieur Philly. Now, wait a minute. Move. I am Major Simonovich. Oh. Of the gay pay you or the NKVD? It does not really matter. What matters is that you and I have something to discuss. I warned you. Yeah, sure you did. I do so dislike dealing with amateurs. This is strictly a business. You mean you want to make a deal with me? Correction. I mean you would find it wise if you wanted to make a deal with us. For the paper? Exactly. Where is it? No, no, not so fast, not so fast. You spoke about a deal? You give us the paper, we give you your life. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The fear you can hear. Somebody said it, I believe, or if he didn't, he should have. The world is neither good nor bad. Tis wishing makes it so. Our story is about a fey, elfin young woman who made her own world and who had a disturbing and fateful capacity to make her dreams come true. Not always in exactly the fashion or the dimension she wished for. I'm warning you, you stop hanging on to me, Marge. I got to, Tom. You just can't do it to us anymore. Just lay off of me. Tom, you can't do this again. Then I got the luck tonight. I can feel it all going for me. The way you always feel. Please. Marge, let go. You want to put the whammy on me? I said... Tom, you let go. <laughs> I didn't mean to push. Oh, Lord. Ma? Ma? <gasps> Ma! Pa, you killed her, Pa! You killed her dead! mystery drama, The Wishing Stone, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Clarice Blackburn and William Prince. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by new sugar-free diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hello, Ms. Goldilocks here, and welcome to my professional taste-testing laboratory. Oh, Papa Bear, mm -hmm. could you bring that case of sugar-free Diet 7-Up over here? Another case? Ms. Goldilocks, you're drinking this sugar-free Diet 7-Up like there's no tomorrow. You can't still be taste-testing it. Oh, no, Papa Bear. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up has already earned my seal of approval. It's fresh, light, natural. Delicious. I drink it because I love its taste. Now hurry up. Okay, okay, here. Mm-hmm. This sugar-free diet 7-Up really tastes delicious. Ladies, if you're tired of switching from one diet drink to another, take some advice from Ms. Goldilocks. Try sugar-free diet 7-Up and you'll say, Yes, this one's just Right. I'll bear witness to that, Goldie. <laughs> Project Hope is reaching out, bringing hope to more countries around the world this year than ever before. Newest addition to Hope's international programs is Ethiopia, where Project Hope's doctors, nurses, and other medical specialists will be working side by side with Ethiopians, teaching while they treat. Since 1960, Hope has trained more than 7,000 physicians, dentists, nurses, and other health care personnel, has helped establish new schools of nursing, dentistry, and physical therapy in several countries, and assisted in the development of hospitals, teaching institutions, and public health services. Hope's work has been heralded by heads of many nations, its services requested by many, many more. Hope is training and sharing, hope is treating and caring, health is what hope's all about. Project Hope Reach Out. Help Hope Reach Out. Right. Project Hope, Room A, Washington, D.C. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. That quote is definitely Mr. Shakespeare's. But our little life is equally founded and sometimes confounded on dreams. Like the bad one Jenny Coulter had a few moments ago. And for which, fortunately, there is present comfort in the person of her mother 
and in turn, her brother Judd. Jenny, you all right? It's you, Ma. You. Oh, you all right? Well, I'm fine, honey. What, you have a bad dream? I suppose. Oh, now that I see you. Oh, Ma, it was so real. I saw you lying there at the bottom of the stairs, and and your head, oh, it was turned to the side like, oh, like... Well, now, oh. now, don't let it upset you. Here I am, right as rain, and it was only a dream. But it was just like I saw it happen. He pulled his arm away from you while you were hanging on, and you went tumbling down. Oh. He? Who's he? I... I don't want to talk about it. Oh, was it your father? Yes. Who else would it be? Judd, what... What are you doing up? I heard Jenny Lou cry out. Oh, it was just a bad dream is all. You woke cases? I'm just fine now. You go on back to bed now, son. What did you dream the old man did to Ma, Jenny? Ma was trying to stop him from going out gambling again. And he sort of pushed her off him like... And she tumbled all the way downstairs. Oh, that's enough fussing about nothing now. You get back to bed, Judd. Okay. Good night, Jenny. Good night, Judd. Uh, you, you want I should close the door, Ma? No, I'm coming back to bed myself, right away. You're not scared no more, are you, honey? No. As long as I know you and Judd are close by. But I sure was scared. Oh, my baby, you're just so sensitive. Everything touches you close like a little old butterfly sitting on a leaf with your feelers reaching out all a tremble. I like being butterfly. That's a pretty sort of thing to think on. So you just keep thinking on it and hustle yourself back to sleep. Good night, Jenny. Good night, Ma. I love you. And I love you. Sleep tight. Ma? <gasps> Sakes alive, Judd. You like to startle me out of my wits. Come away from Jenny's door. I thought I told you to go on back to bed. Was you and Pa having an argument again tonight? When? Well, right now. That, that she might have heard... Your father isn't even here. He went on out after you kids went to bed. Yeah, I bet he's over the stove is playing poker. Oh, Tom don't mean what he does. He's sick. Yeah, and so am I. I'm sick of him. I'm here in the kitchen, uh, Dr. Luther. How's Jenny? Jenny Lou's just fine, Marge. She's getting dressed, and I'm going to drop her off at school on my way into town. It ain't the encephalitis again. You got to stop worrying about that, Marge. It's not so easy. After last year, getting put back one grade after missing all her classes. It won't take her long to jump back where she belongs. That's a right smart little girl. She used to be before. Uh, that's what I want to talk to you about. If I've told you once, I've told you half a dozen times that Jenny was one of the lucky ones. She came through it without a scratch, physical or mental. But such a long time. It was a very mild case, even if it was stubborn and protracted. It's just I worry so that she... she was somehow held back. Now, I want you to get that clean out of your mind, once and for all. But sometimes she seems so... So young. Oh, Lord, what do you want her to be at 16? I don't know of anyone fresher and lovelier and more unspoiled than your little girl. She wants to cling to childhood a little longer. Leave her be. Well, just so you're sure last year didn't hurt her none. There's only one thing I worry about with Jenny. What? Your husband. Lord knows why, but she thinks the sun rises and sets in her father. When she settles for being a woman, she'll have to open her eyes as to what he really is. Oh, Tom doesn't mean to hurt anyone, Doctor. You told me yourself that he's sick. Yeah, I think it is a kind of sickness, but not one a doctor can treat. What am I going to do? I don't know, Marge. Oh, uh, one thing I do know is I've got to go. People waiting at the office, but... Tom is hurting all of you. Bad. Worse, maybe, than any of you realize. And in the end, Jenny Lou is the one he'll hurt most of all. <laughs> Oh, 
Judd, that you? Oh, yeah, Ma. Is Jenny with you? Oh, no, Ma. Oh, where you been? Baseball practice. Oh, why'd you think Jenny was with me? Because she didn't come home after school. Judd, it isn't like her to just take off. You don't suppose she... Well, she what, Ma? That dream shook her up. And Tom and me had another bad set to this morning. She wouldn't run away. Jenny? From us? Uh, no way. Well, she was sort of strange when she left this morning with Dr. Luther. Kind of, I don't know, excited as if she had some secret plan. You know how she gets. Uh, secret? Yeah. I bet I know where she is. Where? Well, I, I, I can't tell you. I mean, it's her own secret place. Only... Well, the only reason I know about it is I was out rabbit hunting one day and I stumbled across it. She goes there to bird watch and... Well, just to be alone, I guess. Now, she made me promise I, I'd never tell just where. I'll bring her home. Jenny? Jenny? Jenny, what, what are you doing hiding out here? I wasn't hiding. I just came here to... To say a little prayer. But for who? Pa. Oh? And the sun was shining in like a big splinter of light, the way it does through the hole in the tree up there. Remember how I always used to think when we was little kids that it was God stretching down his hand to touch us? <laughs> yeah. It was a long time ago. Don't say that. Because he is there. He was here today. Leastways, one of his angels was. What? I was kneeling and looking up into the sun. And all of a sudden, the birds was all still. And the whole hidey hole here filled up with golden light that sparkled and spun. And right over there, he was standing. Who? Him. The angel of the Lord. And I could feel him all around me, in me, warm and kind, so kind. And then he touched my hand and smiled and just faded away. And then I looked in my hand and I saw it. Oh, wait, I didn't lose it. Oh, no, here. This is what I found in my hand. Well, let's see. Well, what is it? It's a conjure stone. All gold and shiny. A stone I can wish on. The angel said that? He didn't have to. I heard the words inside me. You can wish on this, Jenny. You can have anything you want in the whole wide world. You just don't believe this is a wishing stone, Ma, do you? Jenny, right to the moment, I just got to say I'm so fussed and fumed about dinner being ready and you kids not and your father ain't home. I can hardly think straight about... Oh, Lordy, if my biscuits have risen, we're just going to have to sit and eat without Tom. Jenny, don't bother my right now. I just want to try my wishing stone. Wish something nice for her. Well, let's just hold up for a, a better time. I could wish Pa to hurry home. So we wouldn't have to wait. I don't want to wait none at all. I got a math test tomorrow. I just got to pass her. I don't make the ball team, and I need every minute to study. <laughs> Except who am I kidding? If I stayed up all night, I wouldn't be ready for tomorrow. If you had a few more days, could you make it? Well, even just one, I'd stand a chance. Okay, here goes. No, 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 hold up a minute. Too late. Shh. I just wished there'd be no school tomorrow. No school tomorrow? What nonsense is that? Jenny, go bring them biscuits. Judd, you sit down. Ain't we gonna wait for Pa? We ain't waiting for nothing. Not even wishes to come true. We're gonna eat our dinner before it spoils. Yes, Ma. I'll get the biscuits. You didn't have to be so rough on her, Ma. Play her game. I know, Judd. It's just I have no sense of humor left. Or fun. The way it is with us... If we had a wishing stone, we could use it for a lot better things than no school tomorrow. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? The two of you have had me half believing there is a power in that stone. Hi. 
Hi, March. Tom? Where are the kids? As if you care. Gone to bed. Where have you been? What was the action tonight? Bingo? Horses? <laughs> pool? Nope. Tonight I got a pretty fair excuse. The only thing I was gambling was my life. What's that supposed to mean? I've been a volunteer helper at a fire. <laughs> now it's finally out, I couldn't hardly wait to get home and tell the kids the good news. What good news? That the school burned down. Good news for the kids everywhere tonight. No school tomorrow. <laughs> Is there any other catastrophe in the world that carries with it an equal amount of joy than a school burning down? But this time, is it chance or is some supernatural force, sinister or benign, at play? We're going to find out that this simple phenomenon, or happenstance, is a great deal more than sheer coincidence when we return in a few moments with Act Two. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time Beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way because they still care about quality. Look at it this way. If the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say, well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Don't let anyone con you into thinking it's wrong to turn in a heroin pusher. You're not ratting. You're doing your part to wipe out one of the most insidious epidemics racking our country today. So don't let anyone kid you. If you really care about the quality of life, if you really care about improving society, you'll do everything you can to get the heroin pusher off the street and into jail where he belongs. If you have information about a drug pusher, use the heroin hotline. The number is 800-368-5363. That's toll free from anywhere in the country. The number again is 800-368-5363. A trained operator will answer your call, take your information, and pass it on to experienced federal agents who will investigate. You'll make your own special contribution toward helping us wipe out what President Nixon has called public enemy number one. Call 800-368-5363. So Jenny Liu... Our 16-year-old, who is determined to cling to childhood and all its happiest dreams, has made her first wish upon the conjure stone, the magic piece of shiny gold that came to her, she believes, at the hand of an angel. A wish that came true. Well, this one was a harmless enough request, although the manner of its granting has been destructive enough, if indeed it was actually granted. If this is a wishing stone, it is potentially as dangerous as a nuclear bomb. Did you say the school burned down, Pa? <laughs> it sure as Tucker did, Judd. Ain't that good news, Jenny? I reckon. I guess uh, I didn't mean to do it that way. Eh? You didn't mean to do what? To burn it down. I, I just didn't want it to be. That's all I wished on. Hey, what's she talking about, Mark? Oh, it's just Jenny found Don't a... you tell him, Mark. But don't, you, don't you tell me what? Oh, don't pay any mind to the young uns nonsense. Just tell us about the schoolhouse and what happened. <laughs> well, sir, I, I, I just about finished trimming up Mayor Saget's hedge, and I just started to get all my tools together to put back in a pickup. When the fire horn went off. I heard that old horn go just a couple of minutes after. Gosh, up, yeah, yeah, I run straight over to the firehouse, being being that close, and we took off. By the time we got there, she was past all saving. And it's funny, you know, you come to think of it, 
A brick building like that, you wouldn't figure it'd turn into a regular torch. Well, how'd the fire start, Pa? Yeah, yeah you wouldn't believe this. And neither does nobody else credit it. But according to old Sam Wallace, all of a sudden, a flaming arrow comes straight out of the sky and cut right through the brick walls and everything and hit the oil tank and blew her wide open. That drunken old no-good, some custodian. I'll bet he was drinking and dropped one of those foul old stogies he smokes and all that rubbish he's too lazy to clean out of the cellar. Yeah, it could be. It's, it's, it's what most everyone thinks. Still... Still what? Mm, it's hard to tell someone who wasn't there. But then if the way he told that story didn't make you stop at least once to sink on it... What do you mean? It was the first time I ever seen that old booze hound with his eyes put together like he really was seeing what he talked about. Anyways, uh, we talked enough. Hey, something to eat around here. I got it warm, and I'll serve it right away. Pa? Yes, sugar? That flame and lightning bolt, you said. How long before the fire horn sounded did it come? Oh, well, according to Sam's story, he, he lit out next door to the gas station. And call the fire department. Well, couldn't have been more than a couple of minutes. See, Judd? It did so work. Okay, if you want to believe it. What are you kids talking about? Well, forget it, Pa. Just kid talk. Oh, well, I'm too old to share. Oh, no. If you want to. Oh, sure I do. Well, Pa, it's, it, it's just for no mind. Uh, Jenny and me's got to be getting to bed. <laughs> With no school to worry about tomorrow? If there's no school, there's plenty of chores they can catch up on in the morning. Scoot now, both of you. I'm serving your pa dinner. Good night, pa. Uh, let's go, Jen. But I wanted to you tell... You get on upstairs. It's past your bedtime. Yes, ma. Good night, pa. Good night, kids. Did you have to chase them off to bed? Little enough chance I get to see them. It's little enough chance you make to see them. Oh, lay off, will you, Marge? I'm not even laying on. If you stuck a little closer to home than to the other woman, maybe you'd know what goes on around your own house. Now, what other woman? Now, dang well, I'm it. I'm talking about Lady Luck, or whatever name you want to call her. My rival. Oh, Lady Luck. Whatever makes you gamble, Tom, one way or another, it's going to be the end of us. You ever going to see that before it's too late? <laughs> Wouldn't you let me tell Pa about the wishing stone? Because. Because what? Because first thing you know, he'll take it off of you, that's why. Why would he? Because it's real gold? Jenny, that stone ain't gold. Then what is it? It's pyrite. What's pyrite? Oh, it's just what everybody calls... Well, it... Uh, it it's a sort of metal. Well, anyways, whatever it is, it's real precious to me. It's my lucky charm. Well, that's why you better not let Pa know what you think about it. Why? Well, you know what he's like. He, he cares about gambling more than he cares about anything, and all gamblers are real superstitious. Now, if he knew you had a lucky piece, especially if he heard the crazy story about you and the school burning down, he'd have it off of you so fast that it'd set your head to spinning. It isn't crazy. You heard me wish on the stone for no school, and now there is no school. That was just happenstance. You don't think it happened just because I wished it? Of course it didn't. Then I'm going to prove it to you. What do you want me to wish for? I don't want you to wish for nothing. i got to show you. Look here now. I'm going to wish... Jenny! What, Judd? Oh, you sound so funny. Well, maybe it's because I feel like that. I... What way? Well, I sort of... Well, you know, superstitious, like... It sort of gives you goosebumps if you think on it. What does? Well, now, look, Jenny, supposing... Now, 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 I'm not saying it did fall out this way, but... Supposing you did get what you wished for. You were the one yourself said you didn't mean to get it the way you did. No, that's for sure I didn't. I didn't want the schoolhouse to go on fire. <gasps> Gosh, Judd. Oh, supposing... Just supposing someone had been in there and got caught in the fire. Or a whole lot of folks. That's kind of what I'm saying. And my wish could have burned them all up. 
But the angel gave it to me. For sure, he couldn't have meant nothing bad to happen. I don't have to throw it away, do I, Judd? I can keep it. Well, that won't do no harm, so long as you don't wish on it. I guess I'll just put it away for my keepsakes. And, and I'll never use it unless... Unless what? Unless the angel comes and tells me to. Well, that's a right good idea, Jenny. And remember, don't let Pa get wind of that there stone. There wouldn't nothing hold him back from using it, even if he didn't believe in it. It's going to seem funny going to school in a courthouse. Mm, you think with only a Friday left in the week that I wait until Monday to start up again. I'm glad they did. I don't want to miss any more school ever. Then you better look out the things you go around wishing, Missy. Oh, she's took... I'm sorry, Ma. She's taken a pledge. What does that mean? I'm not going to wish on the stone anymore, because the wish you get might turn out bad for other folks. I think that's a very good pledge. Yes, only... <laughs> only what? I'll have to whisper. Well, no, don't mind me. I'm all finished. i got to get my books from upstairs. What's this you have to whisper? I was just going to say that with Judd's... With Judd's birthday tomorrow, I wanted to wish him a bicycle. He sure has his heart set on one. Well, you won't have to worry because he's already got one. Leastways, he will by later this morning. How? You see this flower tin? Yes. Watch this. Down under the flower, there in this old glass salt cellar, is the money I've been saving up for most a year to get your brother the bike he wants. How come you kept it there? Your father, what he is, it had to be some real safe place to keep his hands off it. Who's that? Oh, it's your Uncle Al. He's driving me to work this morning. Get the door, honey, will you? My hands are all flour. Sure thing, Ma. You sure are as pretty as a picture. Getting to look more like your mother every day. <laughs> and they don't come any prettier than that. Oh, you and your honey talk. You should have been on a TV instead of behind a cage. <laughs> Thank God the bank don't keep its tellers there anymore. You make me sound like an ape. Uh, me, Tarzan. You, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> no, me, Jenny. <laughs> well, some guy here laughing. I know you must be around, Uncle Al. Hi. Hi, right, Gabe. Give me some skin. Well, here's five. I'm at you. Ooh, ooh. Uh, say, that's some grip. You want an Indian wrestle? Oh, I'm going to be ready pretty soon to take you on. I think you're ready already. No, I got no time this morning. I got to catch a school bus. Come on, Jenny. We got to scoot. Goodbye, Ma. Oh, have a good day, son. Bye, Ma. And get a real swell you-know-what. I will. Be happy, Jenny. I am. Bye, Uncle Al. Hey, it's great to see you. We'll make it longer next time. Bye, Uncle Al. Bye, Bye. Jenny. Mm. Make next time soon. You can count on it real soon. Oh, yes, swell kids, Marge. I envy you. Yeah, they're what I live for these days. Uh, Tom left already? No, he's upstairs, dead to the world. He rolled in this morning around three, smelling like a brewery. That brother of mine, I'd like to knock his head off. The way he'll be feeling the time he gets up this morning, you won't have to. It'll fall off all by itself. I got to talk some business to him. Like what? Well, I don't want to get you involved in it, Mark. Well, if it's about money, I will be anyway. It is about money. And there's no use asking him... I I went through his pockets last night, and he doesn't have one red cent. But he's got to. What for, Al? Jim Kenny called me at home late last night. The insurance agent? Yeah. Last payment on Tom's life insurance hasn't been made, and tomorrow's the last day of the grace period. But I gave him the money for that a month ago. You gave him the money? I was a fool, I know, but things had been going well for a while, like they sometimes do, or anyways, I thought they were. And he asked me to trust him, and oh, Lord, what am I going to do now, Al? I don't know, Marge. This time, I... I just haven't got it. What do you mean, this time? 
Marge, Tom is hopeless. I've been carrying him for years, or thought I was. I gave him the $60 for that same payment. When I found out last night it hadn't been made, I was mad enough to kill him. One reason I waited till this morning is to cool off. I'd help you out, Marge, but I can't. I had to take out a new loan to raise the cash for Tom. I can't let the insurance go. You'd have a tough time getting a new policy written if this one lapses, but how? Nearly a year I've been saving it for a bike for Judd's birthday tomorrow. Instead... I'm going upstairs to beat the... No, no, take me downtown, Al. I just can't face Tom this morning. I'll have it out with him tonight. After what you made me have to do today, how could you steal money out of my purse and leave to go gambling again? All I want to do is run it up till it's enough to pay you back. You're sick. I'm not going to let you take the money I broke my back making today. I'll bring you back five times this. And, and you're not stopping me. Oh, yes, I will. I'm warning you. You, you. you stop hanging on to me. I got to, Tom. You just can't do this to us anymore. You just, just lay off of me. Tom, you can't do this to us again. I got the luck tonight. I can feel it all going for me. The way you always feel. Please. Let go of me. You want to put the whammy on me? I said, Tom. Let go. Oh! March. I didn't mean to push... Oh, my God. Ma, what happened? Ma! Oh, Judd, it's just like my dream. He killed her. Pa killed her dead. The terror of addiction. Step by step, it grows to envelop the addict till it becomes his whole world shutting out everything else. But the greater terror is the destruction of all who love him, dragged down with him, and eventually engulfed in a tragedy not of their making. I'll return in a moment with Act Three. And now another story of the ball and chain as Kellogg's Special K presents Veronica and Jeff. Oh, Jeffrey, isn't this romantic? Out in a quiet lake at night with you rowing the boat. Yes, Veronica, it's really neat. Jeffrey, what was that? Uh, frogs. Frogs that go bong? Uh, they're pretty weird frogs. Oh, Jeffrey, you're such a car. You have a ball and chain, like the ones they use in those Special K commercials. Yes, Veronica, it symbolizes my few pounds of extra weight. But I'm going to get rid of it. How? Uh, by exercising. You know, like rowing this boat and eating smart at every meal, starting with a Special K breakfast. You mean a one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, orange juice, and coffee? Uh, precisely. It's less than 240 calories, and it tastes delicious. It'll help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'll help too, Jeff. After all, we're all in the same boat. <gasps> you have a ball and chain, too. <laughs> Your happy ending could begin with a Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. Newman speaking. Ever been close to a family struck by cancer? Naturally, your feelings go out to them and you ask if there's anything you can do. And they say no thanks and you feel so helpless. Well, there is something you can do. You can tell someone in the family to get in touch with the American Cancer Society. Volunteers there are helping people every day with services, information, and counseling about local community resources. That can mean arranging transportation or homemaking help or informing them about existing rehabilitation programs. When your cancer crusader calls, join the people who care about people. Give generously. We want to wipe out cancer in your lifetime. moment in time. A few dreadful seconds ticked away, with every heart crying out to take them back again, to make this just a bad dream and not reality. Three people frozen in horror. The fourth sprawled at the bottom of the stairs, 
her neck bent at an impossible angle, frozen in what? Unconsciousness or death? Now, at last, the man brings himself to move. Marge. Marge. Don't you touch your power. I'll kill you dead. Oh, son. I'm not your son. I'm your enemy. Jenny, call the police. Emergency. We got to get him out of the hospital fast. <laughs> Okay, kid. Just take it easy. She's not gonna die. You're not gonna let her die, Doctor. Just hang in tough, kid. We'll do our best. I should have gone with the ambulance. Ah, oh, you're sticking right with me, brother. We see how your wife makes out. No, no, no. Look, officer, you... You don't think she's... Well, for the sake of your own skin, you better hope she isn't. But, but it was an accident. Well, the way that boy of yours reacted looked like he wasn't so sure. Now, we got to get moving. Now, what happened to your daughter? Hmm? Oh, oh, Jenny, uh... Oh, she went back to get something. Uh, where are you taking us? Well, the hospital. First, anyways. Now, oh, here she comes. Come on, shake her leg, kiddo. I... I had to get something very important. Okay, okay. Hop in the front with my buddy, Officer Franks. <laughs> Okay, Harry. Straight to X-ray. You, uh, you got a family doctor, kid? Uh, yeah, Dr. Luther. Oh, you, you know his number? No, but I can look it up. Okay. Tell your doctor to get here as fast as he can. It, it's that bad? I wouldn't want to fake you out, son. It's not good. And I phoned Dr. Luther. He's on his way here. Is Ma gonna die, Judd? I don't know. I'm, I, I'm scared, real scared. So am I. Judd? What? I'm going to break my pledge. You forgive me? What, what, what pledge? I brought the wishing stone. I'm going to wish on it. I'm going to wish that Ma's going to be all right, just like it never happened. If you want to, Jenny, go ahead. Can't do no harm. What well, can't do no harm? For me to use my wishing stone? Your what? Shh, quiet. I'm wishing right now. Are you the intern brought the cold case in? He is, officer. Oh, how is she? I'm waiting for x rays right now. I'd say she has one chance in a thousand. For certain, sure, her neck is broken. And the way it's broken and other signs indicate to me her spinal cord is badly damaged. If it isn't severed altogether. I just can't understand it, Dr. Luther. When I brought Mrs. Colder in, I'd have sworn she was in deep coma. I was sure her neck was broken, spinal cord severed. There's no indication of that for my examination of her. Not the slightest in these x-rays. I know, but not in this second set. Was there a first? Yes. And that's a funny thing. When we developed them, everyone was fogged. And we don't know why. Well, these are perfectly clear. So is my patient's condition. I see no reason why she shouldn't go home. <laughs> Cheer up, son. All interns make mistakes. I made a few buttes in my time... And I'll say this for you. If you have to make one, make it on the gloomy side. They're the ones that don't hurt anyone or anything. <laughs> Except maybe your pride. But I can't understand it. That cop said it flat out that Marge was a goner. Well, maybe he was just trying to put the fear of God into you. Well, if he was, he sure succeeded. If it'll do any good. Well, you think I made a stone, Judd? You think I don't blame myself for what might have happened? You think I wasn't ready to kill myself if anything happened to Marge? I, 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 I don't know, Pa. I... Pa wasn't trying to hurt Ma, Judd. It was an accident. An accident that wouldn't have happened if... Well, pa wasn't sick with gambling fever. Well, I've learned my lesson this time. I'll never gamble again. Oh, Pa. Oh, that makes me so happy. I'm glad, honey. 
And it means I won't have to use the stone again. Mm -hmm. I can save up what's maybe the last wish for something special for all of us, instead of having to use it to stop you from gambling. Well, well, what stone? A wishing stone. The one I used at the hospital to wish Ma well again. Oh, oh that's right. I forgot. Listen, Duchess. Let me see that stone. Don't show it to him. Why not? I don't know. It's just a sort of hunch that... Wait a minute. Here comes the doctor. How's, how's my eyes, Dr. Luther? She's fine, more as a wonder. Oh, a few scrapes and a bruise or two and a lump on the head. Nothing a good night's rest won't take care of. Thank God. You should. It's a miracle she didn't break her neck in a fall like that. That intern at the hospital was sure she did. But she didn't. No, Judd, I told you she'll be as right as rain. Well, can, can I go up and see her now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was asking for you. And the kids. She uh, wants to see you alone a moment first. I I'll go right up. Yeah, just to put your mind at rest, or maybe more hers, she doesn't want to prefer any charges against you. So you can tell her my report to the police will call it just an accident. She slipped and fell. I'll, I'll tell her, Doc. You got off mighty lucky this time, Tom. You better not tempt fate again. Well, I won't. No, I mean it, Marge. Just, just give me another chance. I didn't see how I could, Tom. I never meant to throw you down those stairs. Oh, not because of that. The last straw for me was taking a chance away from Judd to have something he wanted more than anything in the world, his bicycle. You should just have let the insurance go. How could I, Tom? With two kids to bring up, if anything happened to you, I... Not that I want anything to happen to you. You gonna take me back, Marsh? I don't know, Tom. It's hard for me to feel for you what what I once felt. But if you're going to promise me you'll quit the gambling for the children's sake, we'll try to make a go of it. You won't be sorry, Marge. I hope not. I just wish I knew how to make it up to Judd tomorrow. If there was something I could pawn. You haven't left anything in this house that you could. Except the one thing you could never get your hands on. Well, what's that? My wedding ring. Do you... Do you think I could get enough on that? Well, n not enough to pay for it all. But for a down payment... Then I'll take that night job cleaning sewers. You made me turn down to pay it off. I don't want you working in any sewers. Anyway, you can't work day and night. Well, I, I can't till, till I get Judd his bike. Well, we'll see. I'll take the ring down in the morning. No, no, no sir, no, sir. Dr. Lewis doesn't want you out of bed. I'll, I'll take it down. You? I, can't you trust me, Marge? Well, if you can't trust me now, then what hope do I have or any of us I, I can ever be trusted? Well, you got to. Or I swear to God, I'd just as soon be dead. All right, Tom. I'll trust you. Did what? You ran out of the money. Look, Benny. You've got to do an old customer a favor, huh? you got to cover me for the fifth. Headlonger. Now, Benny, Benny, you got to. That 15 I laid out on the first was money I got for pawning my wife's wedding ring. i got to get it back. And I got a hot tip. The headlongers are sure. Benny, for, for God's sake... Oh, just, just this once. Please. Benny. Benny. What am I going to do? I wish to God... Wish. Oh, that wishing stone. Yeah. Where's Jenny, Judd? Oh, I left her down by the pond. We were skipping stones. I just came up to see how you were feeling. Fine. I'm going to get up. Your pa didn't get back yet, did he? 
No, ma'am, I ain't seen him since early morning when he pulled out in the pickup. Well, you go on back down and keep Jenny company. I'm going to make me a cake so we can have a real birthday celebration. Oh, it's all right, Ma. I, I don't need a cake. You're going to get a lot more than you bargained for. Now, go on. I don't like Jenny down by that pond alone. You know she can't swim. What? Hi, Pa. Well, what are you doing up on top of the rock here? Oh, just sunning myself and listening to the birds. Jenny, hey, you, you know that wishing stone you talked about? Yes. Y is it gold? You want to see? Yeah, yeah. Here. Oh, damn. It's nothing but pyrite. Isn't that a kind of gold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. fool's gold and even worth as much as a piece of charcoal. No, Pa. No. Don't throw it away. It's still good for one wish. <laughs> you think this makes any wishes come true? It made the school burn down. And Ma got her neck unbroken. You're a Ma. Why don't you grow up and stop your daydreaming? Don't you know nobody ever got nothing by wishing? I've been doing a kind of wishing all my life. Look at where I end up now. Well, I'm going to wake up your little Miss Bright Eyes to show just how tough a world this is. Pa! Please, please don't get mad. If this was a wishing stone, well, nobody ever needed it more than me right this moment. So look at this. I'm going to make a wish. I need money. I need it bad. So I'm going to wish that old Nick himself comes climbing up out of the middle of this pond with a sack of gold on his back for me. And I ain't going to be greedy. And I ain't going to ask for much. Just just say like a, a ten. No, 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 make it twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Now, I'll rub the stone. And I wish. <laughs> you see? It ain't no wishing stone. It don't make dreams come true. It's a nothing. Ah! Ah! Oh, ah! Jimmy! I don't know how I'm going to tell the kids, Al. There. Not really children anymore, Marge. They know. I guess I do baby them. I won't anymore. In a lot of ways, they're better off. Tom... Well, Tom had a cancer that he just couldn't cut out. <laughs> Even my wedding ring, he... Oh, I didn't want him dead, though. Well... He is. And it was of his own making. Kind of queer, isn't it? What? Him trying to show Jenny Lou her wishing stone wasn't worth a darn, and he ended up having his wish come true? Not quite. The policy's only for 10000 There's double indemnity for accidental death, Marge. Tom got everything he wished for. The full 20,000. Three wishes, and they all came true. Whether by some supernatural force or sheer coincidence, it doesn't really matter. For in the end, everyone was better off except the one who didn't deserve to be. This was the gambler's last plunge. One he should never have taken with the odds so stacked against him. Like Jenny, Tom Coulter had never learned to swim either. I'll be back shortly. Mm. Hey, we're the Action Corps. See, we contribute more. Tease for the teamwork of our crew. Aye, our ideals are high. Oh, oughtn't you apply? Oh. Means it's now that we need you. Go on all day. Oh, here's why volunteers are needed right away. Action is Vista, the Peace Corps, RSVP, SCORE, 
and other volunteer programs that are helping people to help themselves. If you're trained at a skill or just have a little love to share, action needs you. Get into action. Oh, yeah. This is a public service of this station and the Advertising Council. As for the wishing stone itself, since it lies buried deep somewhere in the mud at the bottom of the pond, no one will ever know if it had the power to grant wishes. For Jenny, like all of us, had no escape from a common fate that soon befell her. She grew up and inherited a mantle that only Peter Pan seems to have escaped. She stopped believing in magic. Our cast included William Prince, Clarice Blackburn, Anne Costello, Jack Grimes, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Your husband? You dreamed? It was no dream. Oh, it was my husband. His ghost. Oh, for the love. Rory, Rory. Stood at the foot of my bed, and he begged my forgiveness for leaving me a pauper and breaking my heart. And he said, Jessica, I promise you'll live in Gormley House again. And then he, he vanished. The very next night, the Putnams crashed through the bridge over Gormley Gorge. Well, accidents do happen. It was no accident. Now, the real estate man didn't tell you the whole story. Mrs. Putnam lived long enough to tell just what had happened. The Putnams didn't go off the bridge by accident. They were driven off it. Forced to swerve off it by an oncoming car. A car driven by a skeleton. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>